please stand, if you will, and let us greet and meet Dr. Jose V. Pimento Bay. Brother Jose Pimento Bay. Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay. As always, it's, it's wonderful to be here, have a chance to speak with you all again, and I always begin by first saying, Islam or peace? Salam alaikum. Abaragani. And Hotep. It's been about two years since I've had a chance to come back here and speak again at the UAM. And every time I get an opportunity to come, I always feel a little bit nervous because I'm hoping that I have something of value to share. Um, I'm a historian, and my attempt is to try to bring as much of our legacy as African peoples back to the light. Because so much of what we represent is lost. So much of what we represent has been altered or obfuscated. The ancient Chemites said, know thyself. The Greeks co-opted it and said, know thyself. Jesus said, my people suffer for lack of knowledge. So I hope that at this turn again, coming here to speak, I have a chance to share what I hope is valuable knowledge. When I first spoke to Sister Karen Mason about what my topic was going to be, I said I wanted to do something a little different because what I'm starting to do now is look at the connections between Native Americans and the Moors. Now part of this comes from my having been mentored by someone who just passed away a few months ago, Dr. Sharcy Lawrence McIntyre who was one of my mentors when I was actually at Temple University doing my doctoral work. And what the sister tried to get us to do, when I say us, the graduate students, students who were part of the program at Temple, was to remain mindful of the connection between African and Native American peoples. Of course, we're supposed to be clear on our Africanity our connection to the African continent. But as Dr. Lawrence McIntyre say all the time, most of us are mindful in some way of our links to the indigenous peoples of these lands. And so what I wanted to do today was to show, was to go over some of these connections and have us take a different perspective on who we are as African people. Part of this also comes from a prophecy that I'm going to share with you. I've had the opportunity over the last four years to spend some time with the Lakota Sioux in South Dakota. And it's interesting that the brother was talking about Minister Farrakhan because when I was in South Dakota in 96, actually, 
I stayed with one of the chiefs in Wagner. And when I went to the school, after I had finished meeting with one of the chiefs, he told me, he said, you know, one of the people who was just here recently was Minister Farrakhan. And we as Lakota people have a great deal of respect for him because he speaks up for those of us who are of color, the red man and the black man. And I thought that was interesting because it reminded me of a Hopi prophecy. The Hopi are an indigenous people that live in the Southwest. They live in, in primarily in the state of Arizona. And the Hopi say that there will be a time after the close of this millennium when the black man will lead another revolution. And this revolution will be bloodier than the first. And after the revolution, according to this prophecy, the Native Americans will be empowered once again because of the efforts of the black man. Now that's not my prophecy, that's a Hopi, that's a Native American prophecy. Now the Hopi are a peaceful people. Actually so are we when we're unprovoked. But the idea of recognizing that there is this link, there is this connection in our fate is something that we have to remain mindful of. Part of my own understanding of this connection comes from a Moorish science perspective. The brother talked about me dropping some Moorish science on folk tonight. And part of that comes from a Moorish science perspective where the founder and prophet, Noble Drew Ali, in conveying something known as the Moorish Quran or the Circle 7 Quran, talked about the uniting of Asia Asia represents the whole. Asia represents all peoples of color. Asiatic, in fact, is a reference to the same, much as the nation of Islam will use the term in a similar fashion. They refer to the Asiatic black man. We as Moors talk about Moors being under the umbrella of being Asiatics. So you're talking about people of color. Native Americans are referred to as Canaanites in Moorish tradition. And let me read to you a section from the Moorish Quran that actually got me thinking about looking at this link so that when I then spoke with Dr. McIntyre before she returned to the ancestors, this was my frame of reference when I first met her back in 1989. It says, their dominion there meaning Moabite and Canaanite. Their dominion extended from Northwest and Southwest Africa, across the great Atlantis, even unto the present North, South, and Central America, and also Mexico and the Atlantis Islands. Before the great earthquake, which caused the great Atlantic Ocean. This reference is to an ancient period, pre-Columbian, before Columbus. This reference is to a period before a great shaking of the earth or a great earthquake, a great shaking which again the Hopi refer to as having occurred before and will occur again. The great Atlantis Islands is a reference to the Caribbean. But this idea of the dominion of the Moors the dominion of African peoples at one time having extended into the Americas is what is being presented. Now Moabite and Canaanite are both understood to be references to Asiatic and African peoples. When you use the term Moabite, you're talking about the ancient peoples of Moab. 
we have a tendency very often as African peoples to not recognize and not understand that African peoples didn't just reside on the continent known as Africa. African peoples are also in what we refer to as the Holy Lands. So when you talk about Jordan, and when you talk about ancient Israel, you're talking about African or Africoid peoples, black-skinned, woolly-haired peoples occupying those parts of the world as well. But we very often forget that, and we let Europeans essentially claim our home. And we have to remain mindful of that. Don't think that just because people were living outside of the African continent and were known by names such as Hebrews or Judeans, that they were not Africoid or Canaanites or Moabites. These were Africoid peoples. Canaan, of course, is a reference to if you look at it from a biblical perspective, one of the brothers of Misraim and Cush, all of which are sons of Ham. Sheikh Anta Diop, who you may know, who wrote the several, several books, but probably the, one of the most prominent is The African Origin of Civilization. Diop says that the Canaanites originally were Negroes. That's his term, of course. Originally were Negroes, who later intermarried with lighter-skinned nations of Asia. These people were related also to the Phoenicians. Canaanite is a reference to both a language and a people. The West African scholar and statesman, Sultan Mohammed Bello, who was actually writing at the end of the 18th and into the early 19th century, said that the Yoruba, said that the Yoruba were descendants of the Bani Canaan or the house of Canaan, as well as the kin of Nimrod. So again, you're talking about a West African people who are recognized in accordance with West African tradition to have links to Canaan, which is now part of Israel, Palestine, Jordan. Descendants of the Bani Canaan, he says, moved westward and eventually established themselves in West Africa. Now, some people, when they talk about the history of the Indians, will discuss Indians as having come across something known as the Bering Straits. And the assumption is that being Native American means that everybody came from the same exact place that came across the Bering Straits from Asia, and they all look like the customary dime store Indian. You have to have long, straight black hair. But this concept of an Indian is not true. Europeans themselves in the 19th, in the 18th, in the 16th and 17th centuries recognized that the Indians had diverse origins and they were pretty well convinced of two primary things. I'm talking about European scholars, European scholars in those periods. The first thing they were convinced of was that Indians or Native Americans were related to Africans. I'll say that again. They were convinced that Indians were related to Africans. The second thing they were convinced of was that African people and quote-unquote Semitic people had established themselves in the pre-Columbian Americas. Two very important points. A work from 1858 by a man named John McIntosh. The work was called The Origin of the North American Indians. He said that the Indians were Shem's descendants. Who is Shem? And Shem is also recognized. Who, who did you? Who did someone? Did you, did you say Noah's son? 
Shem is one of the sons of Noah. And Shem is the root word for the word Semitic. So when you hear the word Semitic, someone being Semitic, that idea of being Semitic comes from the reference of Shem. But understand, the Semitic peoples were also part African. So he refers to them as Shem's descendants. But he also says that at a remote period, North Africans from Carthage came to the Americas. Martin Delaney, who had been writing, if you're familiar, Martin Delaney, the prominent African American nationalist, major in the uh, U.S. Army, one of the chief proponents of a kind of back to Africa movement in the 19th century. Martin Delaney made the following statement. He said, the continent of America, an asylum for all the various nations of the earth, among the earliest and most numerous class who found their way to the new world were those of the African race. And it is now ascertained to our mind beyond a peradventure, a simple adventure, that when the continent was discovered, there was found in Central America a tribe of the black race, a fine looking people, having characteristics of color and hair, identifying them originally of the African race. No doubt being a remnant of the Africans who with the Carthaginian expedition were adventurously cast upon the continent in their memorable excursion to the great island. After sailing many miles distant to the west of the Pillars of Hercules. Do you know where the Pillars of Hercules are? Yes, sir. Gibraltar, the area right between Spain and Morocco, once part of the Moorish Empire. European writers such as Pedro Martir de Angliera, a trusted friend and a teacher of Ferdinand and Isabella's children, actually wrote in a 16th century text called Decade or Decados of Ethiopian tribes living in Panama. Ivan Van Sertima, who most of us are familiar with, who was responsible for really bringing this information and say out of the closet, the information about the pre-Columbian African presence. Other people have talked about it, but Van Sertima was the one who was bringing it back to the fore. Van Sertima talked about Chinese texts from the 12th century, the Song Dynasty. Chinese texts which spoke of Arab trading ships going beyond the Atlantic coast of West Africa. Abu Bakr II, of course, who was one of the, the rulers and empire of Mali, who was both a Malian and a Moor, because the area also fell within what was recognized as Moorish dominions had sailed for the Americas in 1311 with some 2,000 vessels. So we have in the 14th century a West African sailing for the Americas with 2,000 vessels. Obviously he must have known where he was going. The work of Barry Fell, Barry Fell who's a linguist, shows how the Pima Indians, the Pima Indians of the Southwest possessed a chant which they just passed down to their children. When this chant was first recorded in 1908 by the Smithsonian Institute, they called it gibberish. One of the earliest recordings that the Smithsonian would take, they called it gibberish. When they played it back in the 1950s, people started to recognize that this gibberish contained Arabic words. So then they listened to it again and realized they were listening to one of Aesop's fables in broken Arabic as part of a Pima Indian chant. As a result, Barry Fell, who was a, 
as I mentioned, a, a linguist and archaeologist, is European, concluded the Arabic-speaking Nevada people must have been well acquainted with the mathematics as taught in the Mediterranean Arabic universities, as well as other topics pertaining to navigation and astronomy. So he's finding evidence of these Arabic connections to indigenous peoples in the Southwest. Fell also found that several Algonquian words, Algonquian is one of the indigenous languages of, the, of North America. It's spoken basically from the North Atlantic coast. In fact, it's actually a, a series of languages all the way to the Rockies. And this was also found to possess terms with Arabic roots that were navigation, astronomy, meteorology, medicine, and anatomy. Now, those of you who may have heard me before or maybe read The Golden Age of the Moor and, and read my essay or anyone else's essay or heard me speak before, generally what I talk about is what? The profound impact of these African Muslims on these particular areas of science and how this is the foundation for so much of Europe's ascension in the medieval period. But what is also significant is now we have to address this issue. If you had Africans, African Muslims, who were able to travel across the water because of navigational skills, then obviously we have to begin to say, well, if they had the ability and if this information is, is there, we may have to reevaluate who we think some of these Indian people are. Or what is the ethnicity then of an Indian? And how far back should we go to really understand who we're dealing with when we talk about some of the various nations? There's a petroglyph, a glyph, a rock carving, in Inyo County, California, which contains the phrase, Yasus Ben Maria which translates simply as Jesus, the son of Mary, which is a phrase commonly found in the Quran al-Sharif, or the Quran of Mecca. Barry Fell also informs us of another pre-Columbian Arabic script found in Nevada. The script reads, Shaitan Mahamayan, which means Satan is the font of lies. These scripts, which are found again in the Southwest and in the West, are pointing to this connection to, a, to an, a Muslim or Arabic influence. The question is, who was bringing it? Were these people from Saudi Arabia or were these Muslims who were from Africa? The overwhelming evidence indicates these were African Muslims carrying this information from across the water. Some of you may be familiar with David McRitchie, Ancient and Modern Britons. Ancient and Modern Britons. David McRitchie was a Scottish historian writing in the late 19th century. And he wrote that the peoples of ancient America and ancient Egypt were both known to refer to themselves as the children of the sun. Where have we heard that before? The children of the sun. Michael Bradley talked about the children of the sun versus the children of the ice. David McRitchie's a European saying that even in his view, in his understanding of the historical record, the children of the sun was a reference to both peoples in the Americas and peoples in Egypt. An anthropologist named James Wright, Jr., who studied various indigenous peoples in the Americas, one of which being the Natchez, peoples of Mobile, Alabama, and Louisiana. The Natchez were known to build temples to the sun and burial temples for their dead. They also referred to their honored members 
as nobles. The Natchez priesthood also carried sacred brass and copper plates which contain what Wright refers to as strange characters and motifs. Strange characters and motifs. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with the Mormon Church or the Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints, but they believe that a man named Joseph Smith found some plates in upstate New York in the 1820s. And these plates were said to contain the ancient record of the Semitic and Egyptian presence in the ancient Americas. Now that's the Mormon church. And I'm always intrigued by the fact that the Mormon church has the name Mormon, because Mormon is Old English for more. I'm also intrigued that the angel who brought the books was the angel Moroni. And Moroni is another ancient reference to more. And I'm also intrigued by the fact that they believe in prophets. That's why they have Prophet Joseph Smith. And that they also say that something very significant occurred at the Colonia Morelos in Mexico, the colony of the Moors. What's going on here? <laughs> You have this constant reference, these constant allusions, alluding to this link to African Muslims, the Moors. Is it coincidence? But this idea of having these plates, the reason why I went into the discussion on the Mormons is, they say that in 600 BC, a man named Lehi, who was, a, who was Jewish, came from Jerusalem, came to the Americas, the ancient Americas, with his sons, Laman and Nephi. And they say that Laman became unruly, didn't follow his father's commandments. Nephi did. They say that Laman then was cursed with a skin of blackness because he refused to follow the laws of his father, Lehi. Now, I've had the opportunity to speak with some Mormons. They can be very nice people. But I also had a very clear debate, argument with them, and I had to remind them, you all are living in a fantasy land where you think that the ancient peoples of Egypt and the ancient Judaic peoples looked like Europeans. So as a consequence, in order to make anything fit your theology, you got to start cursing people dark in order to make it fit your world. That's right. It's like invasion of the body snatchers. You know, if your history doesn't go back very far, you grab somebody else's. And then you convince the other guy he don't have a history. You convince the other gal she don't have a history. And then you prescribe, essentially, amnesia. And you hope the person stays there. And for a long time, that's where we've been. So again, it's important, you know, some people are from, I don't want to make no waves, I don't want, they're so nice. Someone actually said that to me, well, you said that to them? Just look, I'm just telling the truth, brother. What, what am I supposed to do? If they don't like me because I'm telling the truth, that's, I didn't cuss them out. I just told the truth. <laughs> so it's very important for us to be mindful of what other people are thinking and saying so that we can critique them and come back with the truth. German art historian and collector Alexander von Futenau. Again, it's interesting because I have to say this. A lot of the work that has been done to uncover the truth about us very often is not done by us. And I have to say, sometimes it's lonely being in the library, traveling to Mexico, 
traveling to Morocco, traveling to Spain, traveling to South Carolina to do work on us and sitting in a room filled with Europeans and don't see nobody look like me trying to find out about ourselves. So I have to say, if, you know, encourage for those of you who have children, for those of you who are just looking for a career, study history, study our history. Get in there and do it professionally so that we can start to disseminate more of this information because it's lonely and it's tiring sometimes. But I know I have no other purpose on this earth but to do it, so I keep doing it. But I need some more troops. But von Putenau, German art historian, was saying back in the 40s he was convinced that there were African people in the ancient Americas. And he spoke of Moorish looking artifacts, statues, coming out of the area of Oaxaca, which is in Mexico, dating from 900 of the Common Era, and superb Moorish looking clay sculptures from Veracruz, also in Mexico, dating from between 300 and 900. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to some of these slides. Again, the focus is to really talk about the connection between Africans or Moors and indigenous peoples of the Americas. But this is just a page from one of the surgical texts that was written. This was actually not written by a Moor, but this was published by Moors in Andalusia. Its origin was actually in Persia. This again is just another indication of the legacy of the Moors in the families. Okay. In the families of, of Europe. The significance here is again, and I have to say this every time, we are accustomed now to thinking that Europeans think typically that we don't have any value, we're worthless. Europeans, now I can tell you stories of, of having given lectures and after I finished, every Caucasian in the audience was swearing they had Moorish ancestry. Now, before I came in, nobody said anything about being related to no African folk. But by the time I finished, oh yeah, well, my people come from southern France and we are Huguenots and my name is Calabria, we're Sicilian from Sicily, and you know, we're Moors too. See, when you know who you are and, and claim it, then folk will, you know, all of a sudden telling you all kinds of things. This is one family, German family, actually, the Zangermeisters, which means the masters of song. It was a Moorish family that taught music in Berlin in the 1500s. Moore, M-O-H-R, another German family. Put it in the middle. Okay, I'm going to have to kneel here in front of it because I don't have the re remote. Okay, these are just, it says Negroes and coats of arms, but we need to understand. Thank you, brother. Now, am I blocking people now who can't see it, right? Am I all right? All right. Oh. Fly. 
Okay. One of the problems that we customarily have is again, and I, I use this example all the time, think about this. You can sit in a history class or you can read a history text and you'll be reading about Phoenicians, Moors, Carthaginians, the Hamites, the Amorites, the Edomites. You're wondering who these people? As someone just said, they're all black folks all African people. But we're accustomed to looking for the terms black and Negro to find ourselves, right? So as a result, we, man, where are we? We're not in here turning past every page that talks about your folks because you didn't realize that those terms refer to us because we've been given new terms, Negroes, blacks, colored folk. So we're looking for those terms and of course, they always refer to people who are subjugated, enslaved, and devalued. So that's what we find, the history of subjugated, enslaved, and devalued folk. But them Amorites and them Moors, man, they were something else. I wish I was one. Again, just examples of Moors and European coats of arms. They're telling us that they want the world to know they descend from us. But most of us don't go to books of heraldry to find that out. All the royalty, the royal families of Europe, if you go and look at their coats of arms, you go back far enough, you're going to find someone look just like you. Including Queen Mother Elizabeth, who just turned 99 yesterday. This is um, the Moorish chief. This is actually from uh, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, painted by an Austrian in 1878. Uh, again, this actually is showing a, a Moorish knight who fought in the Norman invasion of England, 13th century. This is one of the rulers of Sicily. This is why when I was talking to a young woman uh, yesterday at the, at the gym and she said I, she asked me what I what I did and I told her I was a historian so what do you teach I said I, I teach primarily the history of the Moors and automatically here it comes she said oh I, I'm Sicilian and I said ah Calabria she said ah Calabres the area where the Moors were in Sicily so she was ready to acknowledge her Moorish ancestry. But you can believe that she probably wouldn't have told anybody that she was black. You understand what I'm saying? All right. This is one of the emperors of Morocco, Moulay Ishmael, owned 10,000 European slaves. Yeah, you can clap. Slavery was an equal opportunity oppressor at one time. <laughs> Saint Maurice or Saint Moritz, one of the patron saints of the Holy Roman Empire, worshipped in Germany. Can you imagine some, some Aryan nation folk worshipping him now? Right? Germans understood who we were at one time, and we understood who we were at one time, and who we still are. If we could just wake up. This is from a German Bible, the Queen of Sheba, 13th century. They knew who she was. This is one of Queen Mother Elizabeth's Ancestors, Charlotte Sophia von Mecklenburg, good Austrian name, good Austrian name and good Moorish ancestry. The wife of King George III, the same person responsible for losing the Americas during the American Revolution. 
good Austrian like Arnold Schwarzenegger, who got the name the Black African, and nobody on anybody's talk show ever asked the man to go into detail, how you get that name? But once, somebody asked him on the Letterman show, someone said back in 90, excuse me, uh, 86, nobody brought it up since. Duke of Florence, Alexandro de' Medici, of Moorish ancestry. The Medicis were patrons of learning in Europe. Just a map of Moorish controlled Spain known as Andalusia. Again, another page from a text written by a Catholic monk who was writing down notes from Moorish medical and mathematical texts. A Spanish historian by the name of Valacrosa found this in 1947 in a monastery in Spain, thereby establishing that the Catholic Church, Catholic Europe was heavily interested in finding out as much as they could about Moorish medical knowledge, mathematical knowledge, theological knowledge. They used the theology of the Moors as well to understand their own Catholic theology, to make sense, to make better sense of what they were arguing. Just an example of Moorish architecture. This is a, a, a palace in Fez, Morocco. Another page from one of the surgical texts. That was just a, a Berber group. Uh, brother in front of a, his store in Macne uh, I'm sorry, Marrakesh. This is a painting from the mid 19th century showing one of the rulers of Morocco. I forget which ruler this is, though. Coat of arms for the family name Moore. Another representation of Saint Maurice, or Saint Moritz, African patron saint of Germany. Obviously on the left. Okay. What I have behind me now, this really begins that section I was going to talk about. I'm going to get the dates right. Okay. This is from Alexander von Futenau's book, Unexpected Faces in Ancient America. Unexpected Faces in Ancient America. If you can get a copy, get it. It's a rare book. Excellent text because pictures, as they say, are worth a thousand words. This German art historian who also collected these artifacts has a studio in Mexico City. Everybody should take a trip there, if possible, to go see it. Von Futenau. He just passed away about three years ago. This old man with hat is pre-Columbian. It's found in, in Mexico, just outside of Veracruz. Pre-Columbian. What kind of hat does it look like he's got on? Looks like a tarbush or a fez. Now, when people start pulling up stuff like that, you know, shouldn't something should click inside the head and go, uh, hmm. That's odd. But somehow, we missed this stuff, and I'll talk later about why. Oh, excuse me. This kneeling man is from 300 BC, found in Guatemala. Looks like an African to me. I don't know, you know. I don't have my glasses on, but... Uh, right, so somebody said a blind man could see that.
This is from 2000 BC. And this is also from Mexico, from the place I spoke of before, Morelos. This is from Costa Rica. This is 1200 AD. This is from Mexico, 300 of the Common Era, 300. This is an Olmec head, and it's an Olmec head which was placed next to the profile of a Nuba, someone from Nubia, so it was to show the connection in the phenotype, the physical appearance. Now again, you know, what is amazing to me is when you come across this information and you ask yourself, how in the name of all that is holy could people not recognize the significance of this and completely change the way they think? If you are pulling up artifacts that are 3,000 and 4,000 years old of folk who are clearly Africoid in the Americas, how are you going to then turn around and say African people were not here African people didn't have the capability, they didn't have the knowledge, they didn't have the desire when these artifacts exist. Right. Talking about who controls the knowledge base, whose education, or, or as Woodson would say, whose miseducation are we getting? Another example of one of the Olmec heads. By the way, these Olmec heads are something like between 10 and 11 feet high and 9 tons. So you can imagine pulling something like this up out of the earth. That's why they're still there, because if, if it was little stuff, they might be able to hide it. But when they kept, you know, the Mexican brothers and sisters would be plowing right around it, you know. <laughs> and people come in and say, well, how? You know, how are we going to get rid of this? Well, we can't because it belongs to the Mexicans. And the Mexicans themselves, essentially, those who study their own history, know that we are related to them. It's no secret. But the problem is, again, you know, we're in a situation where we're often competing with one another instead of trying to understand the link that exists. And that's what it's supposed to be about. That's right. Brother said, go to Tijuana, you think you, you in Harlem. So you go to Cancun, you see some of those uh, Mayan brothers and sisters, and they look, in fact, even hair texture. People sometimes talk about, well, the hair is straight. Sometimes, sometimes it's curly. It's a Moroccan woman with her baby on her back from the southern part of Morocco. These are Seminole women. Cow Creek Seminole. All right. Seminole are known primarily for occupying what is now the state of Florida. Here's one of the misconceptions that we often deal with. People assume, and again, being in the field of history, when I would talk about this, people say, well, the reason why Native Americans can be found to have African phenotypes is because Africans were running away from the plantations and intermarried with Native Americans. Well, yeah, that's true too. But the problem is that in the face of all this other evidence, why is it you limit the intermarriage to the enslavement period. You assume that, well, obviously, the only way that these Africans could have interacted with Native Americans is because Europeans brought Africans over, 
They were enslaved, and then they intermarried with Africans. But if we've already looked at a whole ocean of, of statues in books like von Wutenau, he's not an African, this is a German. People say a good Aryan. And he's telling folk, these Africans were here in the US before, the Americas before the Europeans came. So if he's say, you know, come on, this is your own, so to speak, he's part of the West, what's going on? But the idea is, again, most of us don't take the time because we don't think there's anything to find because we're always couched within the category of slavery. And we're tired of hearing about slavery, right? At least our own slavery. And we said, brother said, we don't believe in ourselves because we don't feel as much to believe in, right? Limited knowledge of self. <laughs> well, some of us are already crazy, so it couldn't get much worse. This is an Osage, brother who's an Osage Indian, one of the Plains Indians. Again, you know, when you look at images like this and you consider the period in antiquity by which Africans and indigenous peoples came into contact, you really have to reevaluate a lot of things. Okay, I'm going to leave it on these these three sisters as I as I continue. Okay. One of the things that von Wutenau said is that there was a cover-up. We used to cover up. So you hear a lot about cover-ups. That's how a system maintains its power. It basically covers up as much of the truth as it can. And he basically said that there were cover-ups involving people who were directors of the Smithsonian, people who were directors of the Museum of, of Natural History, to basically hide any and all artifacts which showed the African presence in the Americas. All right? Still goes on. And this is part of what has put us in this, in this situation. But what other evidence is there to be found that exists among the various people? Sometimes you can read between the lines and find information. The Navajo, the Navajo Indians, who are actually properly called the Diné, because Navajo means thief. That's a term that the Europeans, specifically the Spaniards, placed upon those people. They're called the Diné. The Diné or Diné possess a symbol, the crescent moon, which they call the Naha. Now the Smithsonian's own text, the Smithsonian's, Smithsonian's own text called the Native Americans, says that this symbol spread from Muslim North Africa to Spain then to Mexico, and then to the Navajo. But what I say is that, why did the Spanish have to bring it? If the symbol is an African Muslim symbol, and if there's evidence of an African Muslim presence already in the Southwest, it's obvious that they didn't have to bring it, meaning the Catholics. And why would they bring such a symbol? It's an Islamic symbol. They had a crucifix doesn't make much sense. Leo Wiener, who was a, again, it's interesting, you have all these Germans, German names. Leo Wiener wrote, most likely the Mandingos first reached America in the middle of the 15th century. He says, with the Portuguese explorers. He continues, in either case, one must consider the nature and significance of this Mandinga portuguese partnership in the exploration of the Americas. Now, the Moors controlled Spain and Portugal. The Moors are the ones who had created a storehouse of maps. A man named Al-Adrisi had written a book in the 12th 
a late 12th, early 13th century, which is known as the Book of Roger, which already had in the text and in the accompanying globe the American continent. This particular book ends up being used by Catholic European powers to be able to spread into other parts of the world. So this connection to the Portuguese is, sadly, it's implying that the Portuguese were the ones that had to get the Africans here, when in fact the evidence suggests otherwise. Von Wutenau makes the following point. He says, one fact is absolutely sure. Pre-Columbian artists, pre-Columbian artists continue to portray individuals of purely Negroid stock. They might have been late descendants of the powerful first wave of Nubian rulers, whose genes undoubtedly were slowly absorbed in the racial pool of America's early population. Von Wutenau's basic contention is that more than two millennia before Columbus, African and Asian, or Asiatic peoples, were present in the New World. Now again, as I said before about this lack of awareness of this African presence, it has a lot to do with this cover-up that exists. Most of us, for example, tend to focus again, if we're conscious at all, we talk about our African connections. Uh, African connections to the African continent. But we don't very often claim other parts of the world where African people were. Jack Weatherford wrote in a book called Indian Givers, he said, we know more about the building of the pyramids of Egypt than we know about the pyramid builders of the Mississippi. Now did you know there were pyramids built in the Mississippi Valley? The history and culture of America, he says, remains a mystery, still terra incognito, okay, the hidden land, after 500 years. And I'm going to come back to why this is. What is it, essentially, that has required a certain oligarchy, a certain group of people, to hide that information? Why is it that we as, as African peoples, why is it we as Moors, if you will, don't typically know about this legacy. The presence of Negro or Negroid artifacts from the pre-classic, 2000 BC, 2000 BC, the pre-classic period had been found in all parts of the Americas, but in particular in large sections of Mexico and Mesoamerica. Significantly, the countries that a lot of these artifacts have been found in were once part of what was called the Vice Royalty of New Granada. Do you know what Granada was? Granada was in Spain. It was the last Moorish stronghold in Iberia, in Spain. The Spanish, when they took over Panama, Colombia, Ecuador, Venezuela, those areas they designated as New Granada. Now, what I'm getting at is this area is known to possess the largest amount of African artifacts and a very strong African presence in those areas. What I'm actually suggesting is maybe they didn't bring those African people over. They just conquered them where they stood. Think about that we put a great deal of emphasis upon the enslavement trade, which did take place. But what I'm saying is, think about defeating people on their own ground, as well as transporting people across the water. As you think a little differently about the situation. A French scholar by the name of M. Brazor de Borborg, who was identified as the most prominent diffusionist of the 19th century. Let me tell you something. Those people who were arguing that there was a pre-Columbian African presence in the Americas were referred to as diffusionists. Most of them, or many of them, were Germans and 
French. The Bourbourg was one of them. He actually said that the ancient high priests of Egypt also possessed knowledge of the existence of America. And this was based upon his own research back in the 19th century. He also conducted a study of what is now Panama and Colombia. And he found that several of the rulers of in the Indian rulers, the indigenous rulers, had names like Dobaida, Abibaiba, Aben Amici, Abraiba, which are all recognized as having been, as he says, a completely Moorish or biblical form. These names, these titles. You're also talking about African Muslims known as Al-Mamis, Al-Mamis who resided in Honduras and were found there when the Spanish arrived. Now let's also look at this Judaic or Semitic connection. Someone no less than William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania, who lived between 1644 and 1718, actually commented that the American Indians, which he saw reminded him of the Israelites or the Jews. Quoting from Penn's own work, he said the following about the Indians of what is now Pennsylvania. He said, for their origin, I am ready to believe them of the Jewish race. I mean of the stock of the 10 tribes. I find them of, of like countenance and their children of so lively resemblance that a man would think himself in Duke's place or Berry Street in London. And the American Indians. Significantly, even tobacco, which is traditionally associated with the American Indians, was once associated with Africa's Moors. Again, this is, is powerful because if we think about images. When most of us think of tobacco, we think of a particular, or people say that the, the dime store Indian, we think of a specific type of appearance. He's got to have long, straight hair, you know, and essentially, look what we would consider to be a classic Native American look. But in the 16th century, 17th century, Europeans also used moors to sell tobacco. The symbolism of a moor, the same, the same image, a moor holding tobacco, gives us some food for thought, particularly since people like Wiener, again, this German who taught at Harvard in the 1920s. Wiener thought that Europeans were actually first introduced to the medicinal uses of tobacco via Moorish Spain. But Wiener also thought that wampum belts, the wampum belts, had an African origin. He said, it can be shown that the Canadian and New York wampum belts are related to the Brazilian wampum belt, which itself is of African origin. Robert Beverly II, who was one of Virginia's best known historians, writing in the early 18th century, spoke of, se oh, I just lost the, Hello, okay, Robert Beverly, spoke of several cultural connections and similarities between Africa, Near Asia, and the Americas. As a student of classical and modern writers, Beverly held a special interest in Indian society. Well-traveled, well-read in geography and history, Beverly said in 1720 that the Indian foods of Virginia were strange and reminded him of the same foods sold in the markets of Fez, and of the diet of the Arabians, Libyans, 
Parthians and Ethiopians. Van Sotoma's works, also which have played such a primary role in bringing much of this information out, have also established that various West African peoples have similar names and naming methods that are used by American Indians. Tribal groups are also designated very often by the same titles, differing only in the aspects, he says, of an occasional prefix or suffix. In the 1930s, a French linguist by the name of Jules Covey found that the Moors of Northwest Africa, this would include both Morocco and Mauritania, had names which were shared by Indians, American Indians. The names were Atlantis. These are the common names between Africans and Native Americans. Atlantis, Baquetas, Bukoyas, Guiznais, Gualas, Chorti, Guamares, Guanchas, and Juarez. He then said that other names, such as Antis, Atoris, Geis, Lipis, Paraisis, Saracas, which sounds like Saracens, Saracas, Tames, Zamoras, and Dorans also appeared to be African in origin, but had been Europeanized. Also a Sudanese ethnic tribal name, Marabitine, was also found to compare with the Marabitinas and Maravitinas of Portuguese Guyana, which is now Brazil. The Marabios of Nicaragua and the Maravigine of Venezuela. It's highly significant that such ethnic names and national designations like Marabitine, Marabitinis, Marabios, Marabitinas would appear among American Indian names even though they are all variations on an African name, Marabut and Murabit. The Marabuts, which were Moorish Muslims, who had defended the African frontier against Catholic European invasion. The Marabuts or Murabits are also referred to as holy men of the Maghreb, which is northwest Africa. Some of you may have heard of the Seneca, which is one of the indigenous peoples that was said to occupy what is now New York State, the Seneca Indians. The national name of one of the Iroquois League's nations bears a phonetic synonymity with the Senega people and region of Western Africa, as in Senegal. Senega is even referred to in Peter or Pedro Martir's work, Decades. Decades, I mentioned earlier, from 1503. The text indicated that Senega was one of the regions, and I quote, of the Kingdom of Guinea, Guinea being a reference to Africa, which is occupied, and I quote again, by the Black Moors, also called Ethiopians or Negros. Brunson and Rashidi, and Renoko Rashidi, who is coming here, right, next, next week, Brunson and Rashidi contend that the African ethnic name Zenega is Kushito Hamitic in origin, meaning its origins are in Ethiopia and Egypt, the Nile Valley region. So think about that. The word Seneca or Senega, which is equated with Senegal, but also has its, this link to the Seneca Indians, has an origin in the eastern part of Africa. In the presence of so much evidence suggesting parallels between the continents and peoples of America, Asia, and Africa, it is logical to consider this as indicative of ancient and pre-Columbian contacts. Consequently, let's now take another look at the word Indian. 
J.A. Rogers had actually told a lot of us who were reading his books back in the 1920s and 30s that the word Indian comes from the Latin term Indi, which meant a very dark complexioned person. That's why the people of the Indus Valley, India, are also linguistically, I don't know if you read, well, two things I should point out, referred to as niggers. If you go to the International Webs the International Dictionary, Dictionary, Webster's International Dictionary, the term nigger, believe it or not, actually includes the Indians of India. It was understood that they also are related to African and all peoples who are dark in complexion, all peoples of color. So this term Indian, which means very dark complexion, a reference in a 16th century text implies that the Portuguese viewed the Indies, that was the term that was used for the Caribbean islands or the Atlantis islands as I referred to it earlier. The Portuguese viewed the Indies as an extension of Africa. Consequently, we must reconsider again the significance of Europeans calling inhabitants of the Americas Indian. All right, I'm going to back up and just try to clarify something here. What I'm actually saying is, when we read accounts given by Europeans of coming into contact with Indians, don't automatically assume that the person has to look like Chief Joseph. Yes, some people, many people look like Chief Joseph, but others may have looked like Lou Gossett. and all those in between. In Hernán López de Lastenara's book, it's a long title, The First Book of the History of the Discovery and Conquest of the East Indies, published in London in 1582, Hernán López cites the presence of Moors in the East Indies as well. Now that's in the East Indies as well. And let us not forget that the Portuguese certainly knew what a Moor was, because the Moors had ruled there for several hundred years. But a Moor revealing book published in 1822, which you can actually find right here at the Schomburg, 1822, book called The Negro, a sketch of the birth and education of an African Indian is an account of a young African man from Gambia, yet he's referred to as an African Indian. And the book is dedicated to his life story. The book continuously uses the terms Indian and African interchangeably. Since the Gambian man's biography was written in English, it should be clear that he was writing for an English-speaking audience whose sensibilities would have to be taken into account. If sub-Saharan Africans could not be referred to as Indians, quote unquote, then the book would not have clearly implied such synonymity. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can't use the terms interchangeably to an audience who would not have accepted that the terms could be used interchangeably. So what they're telling us in this 1822 work is that Europeans still saw a connection between the two peoples. In the Dublin Gazette of 1730, there's an important descriptive of a group of American Indians who visited England. It stated, and I quote, on Monday, when the Indian king and the prince and five of the chiefs of his court, all blacks, were introduced to his majesty at Windsor. So now what did you just call the Indians? Blacks. Blacks. And these were Indians, because then it goes on to talk about how they wore horses' tails, which were down their back, 
Their faces and shoulders were painted with green and red and blue and painted feathers on their heads. All from the Americas, all blacks, all Indians. Many works, many works from the 19th century and earlier indicate that several educated Europeans were convinced that quote unquote blacks or African peoples or Moors and Indians had a shared heritage. And again, when J.A. Rogers, who I really came to appreciate more after actually looking at some of this work, J. A. Rogers did a I mean a great service and in fact was brilliant for someone who had no doctorate. J. A. Rogers had no professional degree in history and he did better work than a lot of people I know who have PhDs. And so that's why I say again, if anyone has an interest, you know, you, there is a certain technique and approach to analyzing information, but it doesn't take uh, letters behind your name to have sense. J. A. Rogers said, in certain parts of the Southwest and in the Middle Atlantic, an Indian is more mulatto and Negro than anything else. In certain states, as with Virginia, an Indian is only one, meaning only an Indian, while on the reservation. Away from it, he is a Negro. End of quote. What he essentially was saying is, Europeans couldn't essentially tell the difference between someone who was recognized as an Indian and someone who was recognized as black, because there was so much of a synonymity between the two. But you know what begins to happen, and this is my hypothesis about where the confusion comes. I just talked earlier about how in the 1820s people knew that you could use the term African and Indian interchangeably. In the 18th century people were using the term black and Indian interchangeably. But Europeans understood by the middle and end of the 19th century they needed to give one image of what an Indian was which didn't look like quote unquote black folks so as to disconnect people from the land. Okay? Because if people were saying, well, wait a minute, you, know, you keep talking about you brought us over here in slave ships. How do I know many of my ancestors weren't already here when you arrived? It now shifts the, the concept of power and who has a right to connect themselves to the land. It's not a negation of the connection to Africa, but it's a recognition that that connection is both American and African. And that someone who is Seneca, or someone who is, is Natchez, or someone who is Cherokee, who greet each other with Salim Alikum, the Cherokee, are related to African people and there is an African-Muslim connection. But even more, the African connection is pre-Islamic. And when I mean pre-Islamic, the religion of Islam. It's before the religion of Islam that's introduced in the sixth century. The late 19th century Scottish historian McRitchie makes a rather matter-of-fact statement. This is where I'm going to close this out. He makes a rather matter-of-fact statement, like, you know, who doesn't know this, about Moors being in North America. While discussing the practice of various peoples who would darken or blacken their, their skin or their faces, Mick Ritchie writes, and I quote, many brown-skinned races have blackened their faces artificially such as certain Fijians of the present day and the Moors of North America in the days of William Penn. He refers specifically to Moors in North America in the days 
of William Penn. Of course, one could ask the question, what was it that had people engaging in the practice of also darkening their skin? It goes back to the reasons that people like Abdal Rahman III darkened his skin because his mother was Frankish. She was part European. And he thought he was too light. And during the time of the Moorish control of Spain, people wanted to be darker. And so they would darken their skin. That's another thing that David McRitchie talks about in his book, the custom of Europeans darkening their skin to look like Europeans. I mean, to look like, like Moors or Africans. It wasn't a minstrel show. This was a recognition that these people have power and value. I want to look like them. And that's why I'm putting you all in my coat of arms. So even if I look like Roger Moore today, you can see that my great, 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 great grandmother or grandfather looked like Lou Gossett. So the recognition of this connection between Native Americans and African peoples, I think, needs to be given more attention. And I say this because I do believe, when I listen to that Hopi prophecy about the connection, I do believe that something like that could come to pass. I don't know if you ever heard of the Ansara Set. I think the leader is called the Shechem of Shechem. I believe he said back in like 90, his prophecy was that the civil war in the U.S. would actually be started by disgruntled Europeans who were upset because they feel they're losing ground. He left it there. I thought it was interesting that the Hopi prophecy then picked up on this idea of saying, yeah, but African peoples, African men and women are going to lead another revolution to establish justice and harmony on the earth and specifically to do so in the Americas and that Native Americans would benefit from that. I believe it was last summer, the Million Youth March, was that what was here in Harlem? And one of the sisters that spoke was a Native American sister, warrior, warrior woman, who got up and if there was a roof, she blew it off by the time she finished, in terms of talking about the connection between the struggles of African and Indian peoples. So we need to think about that. Okay? It's very important. We need to recognize that we do need to unite, whether you want to look at it from the perspective of, a, of the Moorish science movement, the uniting of Asia, or whether you want to look at it from the perspective of peoples of color needing to act like we are the majority, which we are, which we often forget. I can't tell you how many students I have who come to me and say, well, you know, white people you know, the, are the majority of the world, so how could we ever get control? Again, you're talking about miseducation. You're talking about people being convinced that when they hear about the Moors, the Phoenicians, even the Native Americans, some people think that some of the Native Americans were Europeans. And although there's evidence that there were some Europeans in the Americas, the Native Americans were largely an Asiatic people with connections between East Africa and Near Asia. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Brothers and sisters, please be seated.
Do we have any specific questions for our brother? Just a few. They have to be brief. One. Brother? Okay, the question that I was just asked was to explain the Moorish Constitution as it explains to both Britain and the United States. I don't know if I understand the question unless we're talking about the treaty. You're talking about the treaty between Morocco? Oh, yeah, okay. If I, if I understand the question, we're talking about treaties, agreements between nations that existed, uh, in fact, even earlier than the 18th century. But one of the most prominent treaties and referred to as part of Moorish, Con Moorish Constitution is from 1786. The significance of that treaty was that, and actually it's a very good question, I, I didn't get a chance to go into all this. There is evidence everywhere. It's just that people say, you know, it, it's in front of you, but you can't, you can't see it. You can't make sense of it. You had Moors. You had people who were recognized as Moorish nationals living in the Americas, both when it was controlled by the British and then when it was controlled by the United States. And such people had the power and the political rights of any other citizen or any other subject of the British Empire. But they needed to identify themselves as Moors. The reason was simple. The European powers had set up a trade in the enslavement of peoples. They had also engaged in what might be considered legal uh, somersaults to recreate people as Negro, black, and colored so as to justify their enslavement and to label them as not being human. International treaties recognize nations, peoples. To be a recognized national, you have to identify yourself as such. Okay? In other words, if somebody is living in South Carolina in 1790, and there's something on the books in the South Carolina Legislative House which says, Negroes do not have the same rights as the citizenry of this state. Negroes are to be restricted from owning guns. Negroes are to be restricted from voting. If these laws which are in place are specifically saying this is what it is to be a Negro, you don't want to be a Negro in South Carolina in 1790. Right, you want to, well, some of us, I think, still want to be Negroes, though. No matter, regardless of what we say, and that's a question that only each of us individually can answer. But in 1790, just to continue this, there was a group of Moors who went to the State House in South Carolina with a petition and said, look, we are Moors. We do not want to be categorized and covered under the Negro Act, which existed in the state. We are part of a nation. This nation of Morocco, Imperial Morocco, has a treaty, an agreement with the US government. We also had a treaty with Britain. We're to be recognized as nationals and therefore recognized as citizens. And as a result, that group, the petition was filed, it was passed, and that is just one example of a group of African people having this power. But here's the problem. There's something in law, and I know you're probably familiar with it because of Brother Maddox, there's de jure and de facto. There is how things manifest in fact and what the law says. The problem was that as African peoples, as the Moors lost more and more power in the 18th and through the 19th century, it's very difficult to have people protect your rights. But there are all kinds of legal cases where people are saying, look, I'm not a Negro, I'm a Moor, which exists, was people are trying to argue, I don't want to be under that designation. 
and typically they were correct and they got justice but it was a very difficult situation to be in because what the vast majority of people of African ancestry were enslaved so people automatically said it was, it was say guilt by association most people who look like you are enslaved therefore you must be a slave so you got to keep proving yourself you have to keep defending yourself but that was in the 18th and 19th centuries one of the things that Drew Ali sought to do in the 20th century was to bring that knowledge back to the general population of if you will Moorish Americans to get people to recognize that now people say it's not a fix-all cure-all but it's the beginning of a great change in your own condition spiritually as well as politically I often say and we sometimes underestimate this you know words have power words have power if we use words for ourselves which Europeans developed for negative purposes what sort of resonance what sort of spiritual resonance are we given off by identifying ourselves by such terms right so I think it's important for us to to become more informed about this I'm actually finishing uh, a book finally um, <laughs> I need, I need to clap myself. Um, I have two weeks to get it done. Uh, it'll be coming out Karnak House uh, out of London. So hopefully by January. But I've got two more weeks to get it done. I'm writing the, the, the conclusion now of that. So the, the title is Othello's Children in the New World. Okay, Othello is in the, the tragic figure because much of our lack of historical knowledge is tragic. And new world is in quotes because this is not new because we have been here for millennia. Okay. Any other? Is there one other question? The, sovereignty if you are a sovereign nation it means that you have the right to your own self-determination sovereignty is usually determined by your political power your land and culture or, or language most nations try to establish that they have a land a culture uh, very often a language which gives them a right to declare themselves as autonomous. They are a sovereign or independent nation. One of the things that, that exists when you look at the legacy of the Moors in this issue of, of, of sovereignty is the Moorish Empire at one time extended from what is now Morocco as far south as Senegal and all the way out to the eastern, I mean, excuse me, to the western border of Egypt. That's a huge portion of Africa. And then if you include Moorish control of areas of the Mediterranean, Europe, at one time it included, his brother was saying, portions of what is now Italy and Rome at one time during the Moorish conquest known as the Saracens. All those areas at one time were under Moorish domination. And then, after I just talked to you about the Americas, there is evidence that the dominions extended into the Americas as well. Now, establishing that this was something that the European world recognized is something I have not yet been able to do with a, a clear document. That would be the proverbial, people say, the smoking gun. To find clear evidence, here's a, uh, something written by the British, or something written by some European source or some source in Arabic which indicates that these lands were also recognized as being under Moorish dominion but the idea of, of sovereignty means that you are an autonomous nation which has a right to govern itself and you may or may not choose to be part of a larger nation 
You may or may not choose to be part of a larger nation. Native Americans, essentially, if they are recognized nations under the, the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, are recognized as what? Sovereign nations, meaning they're supposed to be recognized as autonomous. They can conduct their own political affairs, yet they choose to remain within the domain of what is now called the United States. So their sovereignty is recognized, and they choose to still interact within this society. Of course, it's kind of hard not to if you're surrounded by, you know, a structure, political structure that's more powerful than you are and set up around you. But that essentially, I don't know if that answered the question, talked about the issue of sovereignty. Um, that's what I would say on, the, on that topic of sovereignty. Brother Mann. Do I have a Moorish connection to Hammurabi? Hammurabi is part of the old, what was actually what's often referred to as Mesopotamia, which again is customarily said to be part of Europe's history. Because when you hear Europeans or Westerners talk about Mesopotamia, they generally claim it as an extension of Europe. But in fact, as Diop and others have pointed out, that part of the world, when you talk about the region between the Tigris and Euphrates, the Chaldeans, Ur, um, you're talking about places occupied by people of color. Hamo, right, Semites. Semites and Hamites. Hammurabi is responsible for developing one of the first legal codes and it says a code, a code of laws. Uh, his name, certainly, Ham, H-A-M, etymologically, Ham, is a reference to Africoid people. So automatically, we should take notice of that. Names can tell you a lot. That's why I talk about, I'm you know, interested in names. Schwarzenegger and Hammurabi, too. Ham. In terms of the Washita, the Washita Nation, which is down in Louisiana, there's a sister who's the emp well, I know she's referred to as the Empress, who recently got land back from the federal government that she said belonged to her Washita ancestors. The federal government obviously agreed and returned the land to her. The Washita are also, uh, and this is this is where it gets to me what, why I remember and why it's interesting. The Washita name is also the same name that was anglicized as Washington, as in George Washington. Now that's a fact. Now the question when people often talk about you know, old George's European or English ancestry, yes, he had English ancestry as well. He was, as they say, mixed, or so it would seem, based upon his name. But the Washita Indian people, the, the Washita word, the name itself, is the origin of the word Washington, which again should have people beginning to look again at this person referred to, referred to as the first President of the United States. But uh, I don't know a whole lot about what the Empress of uh, the Washita Nation is doing now, so I really can't speak to that beyond that. Okay. Okay. Islam. Well, I actually, uh, that is an, that's an interesting question, but I, I would actually just say 
I'm not so concerned about whether the Civil Rights Act you know, is, is reinstated so much because your point is that that would affect certainly those who go under those categories. Legally, that's, that would be true. But whether or not I think people would stand for it uh, is something else. So I, but I think you're right. You're, you're making the point that legally, of course, right, people under those designations would, would be legally limited. They would have limited themselves by allowing themselves to be designated under those categories. As Drew Ali said, a granted privilege, which existed not only in terms of the right to, to vote with the um, uh, 15th Amendment, but also in terms of what you're saying with the Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, um, those acts in the 1960s, because those acts were designed presumably to cover Negroes. Hmm. Right. Right. Well, legally, that's right. Right, you're, you're making a, a good legal point. Legally, those folk would be able to be treated in any way that the legal system chooses. Right. Okay, all right. All right, Could we just let this, can I let the sister just ask? All right, I, let the sister ask one question. The idea of separating Europe from Asia really begins around the time of the Greek and the Roman uh, civilizations. And it was designed to indicate their separation in values, in cultural values, as well as the conflict that they were having with peoples to the, to the east. So to my knowledge, to my understanding, it, it comes out of that period of Greece and, and Rome. Um, what Diop would, would probably also say is it's really based upon the separation in, like I said, the value system. In the African origin civilization, for example, he talks about Europeans emphasizing a nomadic lifestyle where strength and theft become part of their value system because they came from an area that was resource poor. And those peoples who occupied areas of Asia and Africa who were resource rich had a value system which was much more sharing and open. And so the idea of the separation of, of those known as Europeans from those known as Asiatics or Asians really begins with the value system. Because the fact of the matter is if Europeans began to act as Asiatics in their values, then they become Asiatic. If we recognize, as the sister just pointed out, that that whole area was part of what was called the Asiatic world. So the separation is based largely upon how they act, the value system that emerged in the face of limited resources, the value system that emerged when they started to worship themselves when they decided to put up an image and say, this is God and he looks like me. And that focus upon the worship of self and the justification of taking from others is what separates them from the rest of the Hugh man family. So that's an excellent point, very, very important point, because people often get into the idea of how do you identify the enemy? We can't necessarily identify the enemy all the time on the basis of them not looking like us. If it was that easy, we would be, probably have gotten out from under this condition a long time ago. Thank you very much for your kind attention, and I say peace. Brothers and sisters, Dr. Jose V. Pimenta Bay, a round of applause, please. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Jose V. Pimenta Bay.
Thank you, brothers. Thank you so much. All right. Once again, brothers and sisters, Dr. Jose B. Pimenta Bay. Okay, brothers and sisters, we need just a little more of your time. Please hold on, just be seated a few more minutes. We want to bring up some young people who are going to assist us in the raffle that one of you may be a part of in terms of winnings. And we're going to have Sister Leola Maddox come up and do that right about now. I'm sorry. Correction. Sister Brenda Aline will do the honors, and Sister Leola Maddox will assist. Here we are. I thank my brothers and sisters. On behalf of the Education Committee, I would like to thank each and every one of you for supporting us with our raffle. The proceeds of this raffle will support our summer freedom retreat, which we just completed at one month, for the whole month of July, at um, Buncton Valley Resort. So thank you very much for supporting us, and now we will proceed to the drawing. We have three children here who are going to help us. And this is Glaudette. Glaudette took part in the summer retreat, and she had a wonderful time. So let's give her a round of applause for that. <laughs> and this is Glaudette's sister, and I know her uh, mother and father will be sending her as soon as she comes of age. So let's give her a little round of applause too. Uh, this is Jeffrey, and I'm sure Jeffrey is going to be joining us when he comes of age also. So let's give Jeffrey a round of applause also. We had a great time at the summer retreat this year. It really was great. The children enjoyed it. They really had fun. And we want to thank all of the parents for really having confidence in us and sending the children with us. And we look forward to our next summer retreat and also a Kwanzaa festival where you will see some of the results of our hard work. So once again, on behalf of the Education Committee, thank you very much for supporting us. Now Sister Leola will proceed with the drawing. Okay, uh, Jeffrey has volunteered to do, to pull uh, the third prize, which is a web TV. The African image favorably. So, I know that Reynald and Dassel and Otto Freising were considered to be great thinkers. Now, obviously, what they were thinking about is of great interest also. <laughs> Yeah. to have them, you know, view African people favorably. Um, so. I want to um, kind of shift directions a little and begin to look at, um, well, before I go into that, the, uh, the Inquisition, um, just in terms of what it, what it was, and we know it was the, um, the, 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 um, defeat of the Moors, but mm. it was the church. Just kind of give a synopsis, a close out on that, and then I want to look at what that meant to Africa, the rest of Africa. I want to talk about for a while, the defeat of the Moors. The Inquisition was set up by the Catholic Church um, in Catholic kingdoms. It's most often remembered for having had the greatest power in Spain, the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, Torquemada, who was in charge. The Spanish Inquisition's purpose was to oversee the conversos, the convert those who had converted to Catholicism. Its purpose was to eliminate heresies, those who opposed the Catholic Church's teachings, those who were seen as opposing the Catholic Church's teachings. Um, the Inquisition uh, had extraordinary power and is sometimes referred to as having had um, limitless power. Anything it did was fine. Um, they had some interesting practices such as uh, taking someone's property 
after accusing them and keeping it, whether they were found guilty or not, under the contention that it would defray the court costs. So the room for corruption was great, because you could accuse someone just to take their property. And if they were found not guilty, you still had their property. Um, the Inquisition has a reputation for, of course, torture. Um, they would torture people to force confessions. There's been some recent scholarship by some Spanish historians that says that the level of torture that has been um, uh, argued by many historians has been an over-exaggeration, has been an exaggeration. Um, but the bottom line is, is that the, the Inquisition was definitely more concerned about uh, maintaining the power of the church and securing power than it was maintaining human rights. Mm -hmm. So as a result, we can only, you know, assume, you know, hy rationally hypothesize that there were significant abuses in order to, to get people to conform to the, the church's system. It's also true that um, the Inquisition went after not only the Moors who were Muslims, but went after the Jewish population. They also went after Protestants. Once the Protestant faith starts to emerge in different parts of, of Europe, and they again resorted to whatever means necessary to subdue uh, those who they saw as a threat, those who they saw as, as heretics, those who they saw as a danger to the, to the maintaining the, the power of the church. Um, that's the Spanish Inquisition, basically. And it, it functions um, from about the 15th through the 17th century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like the mop-up after the Spanish, right. after the Moors have been driven out right. of Spain, it goes after the remnant. And the reason is because the final, what's can sometimes considered the final expulsion, the final mass expulsion of the Moors, doesn't occur until 1609 under Philip III, where more than a million Moors, Moriscos, are forced to leave. 1609 is, is uh, 100 and, 120 years, something like that, after the expulsion from Granada in 1492. So you still have large numbers of Moors who are still living in the country even after that expulsion, even after the, the um, conquest of Granada. So 1609, when Philip III removes more than a million Moors, that's telling you that there are still large numbers of Moors living in the country. And they, that's, those are the ones who, again, find themselves going over into um, northwest Africa or going up into other territories of Europe that was welcoming the Moors because the Moors are bringing very often um, skills in uh, shipbuilding, skills in medicine, skills in, in clothes making, especially working with silks, because they wore a lot of silk. So clothes making? Uh, what was the impact of clothes on? What, what kind well, of clothes the Europe um, Well, Europe had, you know, cotton that had been introduced by the Moors. I, have to, I didn't get a chance to mention that. The Moors had introduced the use of cotton fabrics centuries earlier. The word itself, cotton, is Arabic uh, in origin. Um, and silk, which was very popular, the Moors were known for wearing silk, so much so that one of the restrictions on the Moors was to not allow them to wear silk because it was an indicator of their culture. Right? They were seen as tantamount to you know, telling a Scotsman he can't wear his kilt. Uh, uh, in order to subdue 
the expression of Scottish nationalism or Scottish uh, um, culture. So you have the Moors being um, masters of, ta I said master tailors, okay? And those skills they would then carry into other parts of Europe. Shipbuilding, of course, which is very important. Uh, medicine, which is, of course, very, very important because those who were considered to be the best physicians were typically those who were trained in Moorish medicine. And, of course, those who were Moorish physicians, period. Um, uh, the Moors also are going into other countries which are Protestant because they're seen as allies. That's why I mentioned the, the, the Huguenots. The Huguenots were oppressed by the Catholic Church. The old saying, my enemy's enemy is my friend. So the Huguenots now are welcoming or aligning themselves with Moors because they both despise the Catholic authorities. And the same is true to a large extent then with England because when Henry VIII breaks away from the Catholic Church and then one of his, his uh, descendants, uh, you know, uh, Elizabeth, takes over after her father and she is a Protestant and you find large numbers of Moors living in London during her reign. So many, in fact, that there is a uh, request uh, and it's passed, but it's not followed. There's a request to try to contain the number of Moors who are living in London. That's in 1599. Um, many also were there because of arrangements or agreements between um, the English mer merchants and Moorish merchants, something called the Barbary Company, which is set up with, with agreements between Morocco, the Empire of Morocco, and the English. So these alliances exist, and the shared um, attitude is a contempt for the Catholic Church, which was known for being very oppressive and manifest that oppression in the form of the Inquisition. And the Inquisition, as I say, uh, holds power for quite a few years. Um, and uh, it leaves a bad taste in the mouth, of course, of a lot of um, descendants of the Moors who then commit themselves to attacking Spain. And it results in piracy. It results in Barbary Wars, the taking of Catholic Spanish captives who were then ransomed in markets all along the, the coast of the Maghreb, the no, coast of North Africa. Um, millions of Europeans are enslaved, which is never talked about customarily. Um, thousands over the course of time are ransomed. They're bought back by uh, different Catholic orders or brotherhoods or bought back or ransomed by uh, different royal houses, you know, because they were family members or, you know, people who were associated with them um, uh, who were trying to get them back. The, um, the Man of La Mancha uh, we talk about, and I forgot, uh, his name just jumped, I knew that was going to happen. His name jumps, jumps right out of my head. Cervantes. Cervantes is a Spanish Catholic who finds himself captured and enslaved for a while within the Moorish Empire, within Africa, and is bought out of captivity uh, by a Catholic Brotherhood. Um, so this is something which Again, it's, it's an example of Catholic Europe having the wisdom to consolidate its power and to protect its own and putting its money up to do that by saying, you know, if you take a Catholic, we're going to get a Catholic back. We'll buy him back. Something that is not done as universally as is done, um, you know, universally among the, the Moors or other peoples as it is among Europeans. And maybe it's because the Europeans understood they were truly in the minority. 
So they had to consolidate themselves, you know. Uh, whereas the tendency tended to, the tendency was, uh, again, people just looked out for their immediate own. Uh, you know, you from my village? Are you from my town? Are you from my particular nation? Whereas everybody beginning to consolidate under the flag of Catholicism becomes more and more of a concern, and that's why the Spanish have the reputation of being the most fanatical, the most serious about Catholicism of all the European peoples. I'm going to come back to that, but because we're fixing to move into Africa and the enslavement of African people, you mentioned Europeans are having been slaves by the thousand. Maybe we can give a backdrop so uh, the viewing audience will have a perception or an idea that Africa was not the first enslaved. Matter of fact, this may have been the period of the most enslaved Africans in history. But before that, it was not. I mean, the Arabs enslaved Africans, and we're going to talk about that. But looking at European enslavement of uh, of themselves, of of uh, selling themselves, even the Children's War. But but look at uh, explain the uh, the European uh, enslaved period. Well, slavery has been going on for thousands and thousands of years. It's nothing new. The idea of Europeans being enslaved is again as old as, is as old as Europe. In the case of Europeans finding themselves enslaved in the medieval period during the same time of the Moors, that was also quite common. It was The Moors and other Asiatic and African peoples would capture Europeans off the coasts of places like Denmark, Britain, France, Spain, Italy, Greece, and they would sell them in the markets of Africa and the Near East. They sold them ultimately not by the thousands, they sold them by the millions. The difference is that the emphasis in the historical tradition of the West is now on focusing on the last great enslavement, which was the enslavement of African peoples. The Arabs also, of course, coming from Saudi Arabia, sold Africans, sold Europeans, and sold each other. Every people have engaged in the enslavement of other people for the purpose of profit. Greed goes across ethnic and cultural lines. Insensitivity goes against, goes across ethnic and cultural lines. It didn't make any difference. If you were, what is, even the Bible talks about somebody's brother being sold into Joseph. Joseph, right? So the idea of slavery being, we seem to assume this was something new. Slavery is as old as dirt. <laughs> in terms of, oh, she's old, as old as man probably in terms of someone deciding that they're going to snatch someone else up and make them work for free, or snatch someone up and force them to give up labor that they would otherwise not have given if they had their own free will. And custom has often produced slavery after war. You take your captive and then you put them to work. Now, how people treat the captive is more revealing, I think, than just the idea of having slavery at all. People have often said, and I've had students who will say, well, you know, slavery existed, all, everybody's been enslaved, which is true. No nation on the earth has escaped the enslavement of at least some of its people. And I agree and say, well, yes. I said, the only thing that I maintain is that the difference in the system of slavery is what needs to be noted. Africans, for example, traditionally enslaved people who were prisoners of war, criminals, debtors, orphans, or wards. And the idea of being a slave meant that I owned your labor. I didn't own you physically. I could make you work, 
but I could not argue your non-humanity, nor could I tell you you can't wear the clothes that you're accustomed to wearing in your culture, nor could I really justifiably tell you you can't wear, I mean, you can't speak your language. Diop talks about the custom among the, um, the Moro Nava in Burkina Faso, I think it was the, some of the old kingdom of Kayor, where he says that even the slaves had a representative in the council. So if you have a situation in, in traditional Africa which has slavery, where the individual who was enslaved has a representative in the political body, that's tantamount to sending a slave to Washington, D.C. in the 1850s to discuss the conditions of slaves in Mississippi or Virginia. That's unheard of. In the Western mind, a slave, you're a slave, you have no rights. John Blassingame, historian, talks about the enslavement of Europeans and how, again, it was done by angry Muslims who were remembering what happened to them under Catholic domination. He talks about how the Spanish, the Italians, the Portuguese were the primary victims. He talks about how, ironically, he says Africans treated the enslaved Europeans better than the Arab Muslims did. Uh, which speaks again about the humanity and maybe is an issue again of resources in terms of outlook and, a, and clearly an issue of, of, of anger, excuse me, in terms of who you had recently engaged. I just finished fighting you a couple of months ago on the coast of Africa. I just finished looting you. I, I was formerly a resident of Andalus. We lost our property. We were thrown out of Spain. So the resentment for the Catholic authorities of Spain would certainly have been great. And the desire to go and to um, fight and to enslave and hurt those who hurt you would be a lot, make a lot more sense under those conditions. And there are many references to Europeans being sold in the markets uh, in Sali, in Ceuta, in Tangier, uh, Tripoli and various other parts of, of the coastal regions of Africa. And also sold somewhat in the interior. Africans, though, and African Muslims tended not to purchase slaves for purposes of um, setting up a uh, system, economic system, predicated on slave labor. Slaves were customarily taken as symbols of power and done for reasons of honor. They were not used, as, as Walter Rodney says in How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, they were not used as the primary mode of production. So even as millions over the course of, of years and years, even as millions, perhaps 10 million, over the course of five or six centuries, millions of Europeans being enslaved didn't result in them being the primary mode of production so that this, the whole social, political, and economic structure had to be predicated upon the maintenance of slave labor. We've got to keep capturing and bringing people in here to, to run this system. And it was not, it was more difficult, of course, to do also with the Europeans as Europeans sought to improve their own power base. Because as I said earlier, what did they focus on? Military technology. They were creating a condition by which fewer and fewer Europeans could fall victim to slavery. And what was the unifying factor? Catholicism. Christianity, essentially, becomes a, a great unifying factor. It was true for a while also in the Islamic world, and will be true again later, at certain, and certainly it's a periodic thing. But the Catholic um, agenda of protecting Catholic lives uh, being pushed by so-called fanatic clerics is actually a benefit to a considerable degree to those average Catholic, Spanish, or Portuguese sailors 
who would find themselves snatched up and sold in slavery. Again, these little brotherhoods, Catholic brotherhoods, which had, uh, how do you say, uh, patrons who would provide money to buy people out of slavery. Because that's what the Africans, that's what the Moors and the Arabs wanted. You pay the ransom and we'll pan them back over. They didn't want them for the purpose of putting them on a plantation forever as a primary, primary mode of production. They didn't, look, they didn't look at it that way. The European world looks at slavery as we capture you, we need you as part of this system because you are the system. The whole foundation of the American economy up until the middle of the 19th century is predicated on slavery. Now, as a backdrop, and that's a wonderful backdrop for us to begin to look at um, the European um, in entrance into Africa. Mm -hmm. um, the Moors have just been destroyed, uh, not destroyed, but defeated. Mm -hmm. And what, how did that then open the door for the ultimate uh, enslavement of African people? And looking at the church as a unifying factor and what um, Europe had going for itself, mm -hmm. and then coming around after the sailing and the guns and the whole mass, mass of um, uh, military power and being on a war footing. I want you to, to go into that and talk about that, how they then come around to the west coast of Africa and essentially mm -hmm. set up trading, but they weren't just setting up trading, even though the Africans on the coast might have only looked at them as, as traders. traders and to do trade, but the European may have had from the very outset an entirely different motive. Uh, and so I want you to talk about the clash of these two cultures and how the African, because of this, uh, a coast along the coast was at such a disadvantage because he didn't have that military structure, even though they had, they could, they could fight and everything. They weren't on a war. Well, as you said, the Moorish presence resulted in giving Europe the technology to get there. I won't go all. I won't go over all that again. Yes. Right. Um, they get, had the technology to get there. They had the knowledge to get there because they had the, the cartographical information. Uh, in fact, they had it as early as the 12th century with al Adrisi, who actually produced a silver globe and a book known as the Book of Roger, which had seven zones of the world and gave all the trade routes and what was to be traded. So Europe had that information, and those who had, had it first became wealthy first. The Venetians, the Genoese again, the Venetians... Uh, having had access to this. The result is that these Spanish uh, merchants, particularly after the so-called discovery of the Americas, now need to find a labor force to develop the Americas. The labor force at first is the Indians, but for reasons that involve uh, disease, lack of immunity to certain diseases, reasons that involve the logistical problems of trying to maintain slavery of a people who know their way around in the land that they live in, they can run away, for reasons that even involve some theological issues of some people saying that the Indians have better uh, souls than the Africans uh, and a few other things that people might have thrown in in terms of saying that you know a Africa now represented uh, a wounded tiger or a wounded lion that was more easily subdued so the focus on that has people now bringing Africans from the coast to the Americas. The ability to do it is because the European world focused upon long-range ships that had massive firepower. They took that to the coast 
and then established a foothold among different African nations who were at odds with the larger African nations. So you had vassal states, for example, um, fighting to subdue the larger kingdoms. When people talk about a larger uh, uh, rulers of particular, or ruling groups in particular kingdoms, the Malian Empire, of course, had as its, you know, the primary peoples control the Mandinka. Um, the Ghanaian Empire had primary peoples like the Akan. Um, these individual nations, though, were not necessarily on the best footing with some of the smaller groups that lived there. So the custom among Europeans was to align themselves with one of the smaller vassal states that had a problem with them and fight against the larger nation. Uh, that's why people like um, Queen uh, Nzinga fell, ultimately. Uh, you have also European powers who are bypassing the old trade routes that had once dominated by trading along the coast. The Trans-Saharan trade routes that used to go right through the Moorish Empire from Morocco all the way down through different parts of West Africa, Senegal, the Senegambia region, on up to the east and up into places like Chad and up into Egypt. Those trade routes were the key to wealth. And those who controlled the trade routes could control uh, their own fate, politically, culturally. Europeans bypassed the old trade routes by trading along the coast and eliminating the need for the trade routes. So now Africans could just go to the coast, pick up goods, trade goods, and then go in to the coast and then disseminate whatever they needed to. The trade routes then were bypassed altogether by the sea power, by creating ports and forts along the coastal regions. That was a way of then eliminating the power of the, of the various uh, kingdoms. So the salt trade could now be conducted on the coast. You didn't need to do it at trading centers along the trade routes. Um, the cowrie shell trade that was so important is taken over by the Portuguese. The salt trade is taken over by the Portuguese. The, where are they bringing it? Where are the Portuguese getting the salt? They're getting it from other vassals who are, who are vassal states, vassal kingdoms, who are just bringing it in from the interior right to the coast and giving it to the Portuguese. And then the Portuguese take it to another part of the port, I mean, another port, and sell it to other, Af to other Africans. Okay. Now I begin to see. Which means that they're bypassing this, the existing system because economic system. Because what you have happening is tantamount to countries coming into the coast, coastal United States, and saying, we'll sell you cars that normally, normally cost you $10,000 for $4,000. And so you go to the coast and buy the car, and all what happens to the whole structure that was already in place that had been maintained for however long to keep people employed and to keep the economy strong. So it begins to whittle away at the economy. It begins to whittle away then at the political structure, because now people are raising hell around what's going on. But if you can't do anything about it, if every time you try to go to the coast to stop it, the people take off or they're fighting or whatever, they're firing on you, you, you're increasingly helpless to prevent it. And so it continues until you lose power. So the Europeans will fire these cannons and they got guns and they are stable. Yes. Well, the Europeans are, are, are emphasizing military might to allow them to maintain control of, the, of whatever they want to trade by bringing it to the coastal areas. And there are always Africans who are willing to get a bargain. Mm -hmm. It's a so lot of economics. They come to the coast and trade with the Europeans mm -hmm. who set up trading routes along the coast, 
pick up all the goods and trade along the course and collapse the economy from, right. the, in, from the inside. Right. And so then you get more chaos exactly. in the interior mm -hmm. of Africa. Okay, please continue mm -hmm. because I hadn't quite saw that. Yeah. And then what also, of course, happens is as it, the chaos increases, what are Europeans increasingly requesting? Because they need labor. They're requesting captives. You want certain goods? Give us some people. So now Africans are increasingly turning to taking African captives to bring them to the coast to sell to Europeans, which means they're draining their population. And the, the, mode, the means to survival is now increasingly based upon who owns guns. Interior Africans are not producing guns. Moors in the northern parts of the country do, and this is one of the things that I say is that the Moors are able to withstand the encroachment of Europeans longer because they did begin to emphasize a little bit more military technology because they saw what was coming. But of course, who would know better how to fight a European than Moors who had lived among Europeans for how many centuries? So they knew this is what they had to do. Africans in the interior didn't know what they were up against. So the Moors are saying, we need to, to make more guns, more arquebuses. We need to develop a more militant, a militant society so that we can protect ourselves. The Marabouts, or the, the uh, uh, Marabouts, are the frontiersmen. These are Moorish soldiers who sought to protect the frontier from Catholic encroachment because the Portuguese and the Spanish and, and others were invading Africa to try to secure control and these, if you can call them elite groups of Moorish soldiers who were also like Moorish soldier priests are there to try to defend and not try, were there to defend as much as they could the area of the Moorish Empire from being over, overrun. But further south and in the interior those African kingdoms are not as successful because they don't know, and I just, I just put it that way, they don't know what they're up against. The Moors knew because they had been engaging Europeans for centuries, the Catholic Europeans for centuries. They knew what they were facing. They knew increasingly that they couldn't necessarily trust certain folk, whereas many Africans in the interior, again, did. Greater degree of naivete because of a different value system, different worldview. They did not know who they were engaging. I wish you would talk about that value system for a moment so we'll get a uh, perspective on the value and the culture and just to propose that to the European in the, in the Americas mm. needing land and did he actually set up a planned system? Did he really know what he was doing when he began to collapse? Was this a part of the plan? Talk about that. That is... Uh a good question, <laughs> um, and I'm not sure I can answer it. I don't know if the ultimate end was no. I would even say what I would say is no because it took centuries, and unless there's some European who's 600 years old who was directing traffic, so to speak, the I idea of that, you know, like the the emperor or something in uh, Star Wars, you know, um, I would say that. It was just a manifestation of the value system that had been passed on generation after generation and the need to consolidate power because of a, an awareness of being in the minority. Kind of Cress Wellstein concepts there. We know we're in the minority, so we know we better unify. We know that we are outnumbered, so we know we have to be a little bit better organized in subduing these folk who outnumber us. We know that we have limited resources, so we have to, if we're going to thrive, get somebody else's. We know that if we're going to maintain someone else's resources, we have to be really insidious and slick and create a structure that will be able to maintain itself over time, even after I'm gone, so that even I may be the administrator, but after I'm gone, I want to make sure something's in, pl in place 
that those who come after me will still have something in place that will allow them to maintain domination because they'll still be in the minority. So that value system, which is among Europeans, is juxtaposed or contrasted with Africans who look around them and see nothing but resources and who look and take the resources to some degree for granted. If you don't like a situation, you pick up and you leave. Go further in the interior. The, the richness of the resources affects the attitude towards themselves and towards others. And the result, I would say, and this is Diopian, is that the European world becomes more materialistic. The African world becomes or is less materialistic. And when the two clash, you have someone who's naive in terms of so-called you know, business arrangements and someone who is real slick in acquiring what you have because they have to. I have more to, you have more to lose, I have more to gain. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think in that fashion. And I may take greater risks to get it, too, because I need to, because I, I got to survive. So I would say that that clash of values is what uh, results in this. Africans who did not understand that when they were handing over captives, it was draining um, their ability to prevent the uh, uh, usurpation or the usurping of their own territory over time. Um, and again, it has to be said, Africans were thinking on a much more provincial level. I'm concerned about my village. I'm not concerned about this kingdom. I'm concerned about my family. I'm not concerned about this village. Or town, I should say, if I live within a town. There might be a greater concern for the village. But what I'm saying is my priorities first are to those who are members of my own individual group. I am Hausa. I am not Yoruba. I am Ibu. I am not Hausa. Those sorts of divisions allow for the, for the conflict to continue. Whereas Europeans were breaking down those barriers at the same time. I am Catholic. You may be from Braganza, and I may be from Lisbon, but we're both Catholics, and we're both Portuguese. So the establishment of a, of a nation state, right? The establishment of a nation state mentality allows for the, the greater ability of the European world to operate cohesively while the African world is fragmented. The African world that's, that fares the best of the Africans who are unified by a singular religion. Hence, the Muslims, hence the Moors, are able to prevent greater incursions for a greater period of time. Because many African traditions are very provincial. Religious traditions are provincial. We have our own unique gods and concepts that's right here. Your viewpoint is not mine exactly. There may be a commonality in ancestor veneration, but I don't know your ancestors. I'm worshiping my ancestors. You worshiping your ancestors. The link spiritually is not as great as if there was something tying us together. I'm a Muslim. You're a Muslim. You believe in one God, in Allah. I believe it. We pray the same. We share a common worldview. That essentially exists while at the same time I probably still venerate my ancestors. But that's secondary. So I venerate my ancestors, but I'm still praying to Allah. You venerate your ancestors, but you're still praying to Allah. So I'm a little bit, there's a little bit more in common. We may even speak Arabic or a dialect that has been infused with Arabic. That mindset exists in the Muslim circles more, the old Moorish dominions. And those are the places that fare better in preventing the European incursion for longer. Europe doesn't finally get a hold of controlling the Moorish Empire in Morocco until the end of the 19th century. And then, if you talk about officially, it's with the, when Morocco becomes a French protectorate 
in 1911. So prior to that time, there was still autonomy. But the Moorish Empire begins to suffer the same problems as well over time. It was just a matter of time. But they held on a little bit longer than a lot of these other regions. Um, the old Ghanaian kingdom and empire, Mali and, and Songhai. Um, but, you know, the Muslim world, people often say too, the Muslims played a role in the enslavement of Africans. Yes, they did. But Africans played the larger role in the enslavement of Africans. Well, let's talk about the Muslim enslavement of Africa because Dr. Clark often says that had it not been for the Muslim slave trade, Africa would have had a better chance and perhaps would not have, uh, would have been able maybe to uh, uh, defend themselves better with the European slave trade. That the encroachment of the Muslims in terms of doing pretty much the same thing that, that Christianity did, changing names, I mean, you know, mm. the gods, I mean, changing the whole concept and breaking down the uh, worldview of the African um, and converting him to. The, the spreading of the religion of Islam in Africa is largely done through trade and then it's largely done through appealing to the rulers of, of African kingdoms. That's the same way that Christianity also comes into Africa to a large degree. The rulers become practitioners of, of Islam and as a result they forge an alliance with a larger Muslim world. The problem that I think we face and like when I hear um, and I've heard, of course, Dr. Clark talk about that before, is we're assuming again that Africa had no tradition of slavery prior to the religion of Islam. And that's not true. So slavery existed before there was someone called a Muslim. What Islam does do is it does create a kind of third party, so to speak, whose agenda is now to look out for the third party interests. The same can be true or is true of um, any group which gets power. The Ashanti are involved in the enslavement of other Africans. The Kingdom of Dahomey is pro probably one of the greatest enslavers of all African kingdoms. These are people who did enslave others because they didn't see any connection between themselves and the other group. It didn't have to do with the religion of Islam. It had to do with them not seeing a connection, period. Islam's presence represents, as I said, a kind of third party which tries to consolidate people around this notion of you know, one God and God sends prophets. That's really not different from a lot of other traditional African faiths. The Yoruba talk about Alodumari as one one God, and yet there are different Orishas or gods, mini gods, if you will, that exist within it. The problem is that most people were not looking at the uh, cosmological links or the um, parallels. They were simply manifesting a very simplistic understanding of their faith, and they did it at a time that was very difficult to get. A, you know, to, to get away with uh, because the European world was on the march and the European world was consolidating itself while the African world um, was increasingly becoming more uh, of a cow to be milked by an ascending Europe. And what I mean by that is if you remember um, Mansa Musa. Yeah. Mansa Musa begins to really get what might be considered undue attention by displaying the wealth of West Africa. Rex Melli, as he's called. Yeah, talk about that and how he brought that. Right. 
Mansa Musa goes to Cairo on his Hajj, brings something like 80 to 100 camel loads of gold, distributes the gold throughout the journey. And when he gets to Cairo, Egypt distributes more gold. People from Southern Europe, people from near Asia, and of course Africans are all conscious now of the great gold wealth that this kingdom possesses. And it puts him now at the forefront. And remember I said before about King of the Hill. All of a sudden everybody now knows now that you're the one with all the goodies. People don't have it and now pursuing you. So now you've got all this attention. It's like the guy who comes out of the bar with the check saying, I just won the lottery. And he's walking up the street waving it in the air. Now that isn't to say, and doing this as he walks past brigands and thieves. Obviously he's going to get a whole lot of undue attention. And that isn't to say that Mansa Musa should be condemned. I'm not condemning him for his generosity. As for his, for his, that, that's the African, that's the African way. Distribute the wealth. But what I'm saying is that it was just bad timing, okay? Because it was at the same time that the European world was on the move. It was ascending, and it was at the same time that the European world had acquired the ability to extend itself as a result of their tutelage under African Muslims, under the Moors. So the, the timing resulted now in them saying, this is where we got to go. We got to go in here and get this stuff, get these goodies. And the chaos that ensued is more complicated than just saying that it was the, the fault of the Muslims who were part of the enslavement trade. The Muslims were part of the enslavement trade just as traditional African faiths were part of the enslavement trade. It's, it's, to me, it's ridiculous, and with all due respect, you know, and I'm not saying Dr. Clark was ridiculous, but I think it's ridiculous if we think that it's, simp it's very simple to just say this was the result of the Muslim presence. Did the Muslims contribute? Yes, they did. Did other individual African um, peoples contribute because they had, a very, they had their own provincial interests? Yes, they did. So it, it's not a case of saying that the Muslims did something that others hadn't already done. The only difference is because Islam was a religion that crosses ethnic lines, it, it becomes, I mean, it's bigger. You generally didn't have a Hausa becoming Yoruba, right? You didn't, generally didn't have Igbo becoming Hausa or Ashanti be, you know, uh, becoming Kikuyu. What I'm saying is those were your ethnic roots with your own culture, your own spiritual practice. Islam is different because it's unifying different ethnicities under the banner of one faith, which then means that this faith is going to act out its own interests as a faith. Mm -hmm. But it's not that, you know, Muslims said we're out to get, the, let's face it, the vast majority of Muslims in Africa are Africans. So Africans were doing what Africans had, already, had, had always done, serve their own interests. Unless what? Unless they were more conscientious about what the result was of their actions. So Self-interest. It goes on. It, Europeans do it. Europeans didn't, at one point, Europeans didn't care if another European was enslaved. I'm a Spaniard. What do I care about you as an Englishman being enslaved? In fact, you're an English dog as far as I'm concerned, right? And the English are saying the Spanish were, you know, low lifes or pompous or whatever the case may be. So they didn't care about the Spanish. So if they could, you had English privateers selling Spaniards into slavery to Africans. You had, if they could, Spaniards, and they did it often, handing over English captives to be sold in the markets of Africa because they were looking out for their own self-interest. But what was happening was that Christian authorities, Catholic powers, were working more and more to eliminate such practices and saying, look, we're all Christians, we gotta, we gotta stop this. We're all Catholics, we gotta stop this. They did that and they were able to do it because their structure required it. They were also smaller. Africa's vast. It was harder to establish that kind of a unity. The Moors tried, and you find examples of that at different points. 
meaning you uh, find examples of, of um, envoys, agents, representatives of Moorish imperial power, trying to tell people, look, we need to serve the interests of the state. You can't simply just do whatever you want. Do you realize that the Catholics, as they say, or the Christians, Europeans, that was another, those two terms were synonymous, are right on the coast. They're destroying the infrastructure here. You're going to lose all this. We're losing control. I, I, look, pff, I'm going back to my village. I don't need to worry about this. So the idea of not being able to see the big picture was more apparent, as I understand it, in the case of Africans who didn't know. That's why people can talk about slavery. Did Africans know what was happening to those who were being sold into chattel slavery in the Americas? No. They didn't know. They assumed that slavery was going to manifest wherever they were sent the way that it manifests there. Yeah, you know, we only we'll talk about that because that's important for people to get a concept of why they were um, kind of nonchalant or blind. Or right. They, Africans who would hand over other African captives did not know, for the most part, what was happening to the people that they handed over. Now, in other cases, they simply didn't care. <laughs> Because you're not part of my ethnicity. I'm Yoruba or I'm Igbo or Hausa. I don't care what happens to you. But beyond that, they assume that, well, it's not that bad. Look, yeah, I, part of my family was the slave to this person. We got out of the slave. In fact, this person was a slave, married daughter of his master, so to speak. They didn't know you couldn't do that in the Americas. They didn't know they were going to the Americas in most cases. If you knew that, you know, the ones who were at Goree Island and saw the ships going off the coast knew they were sailing out into something, but what exactly that something was, most didn't know. So they had no idea what the ramifications were of them handing over captives. All they knew was when they traded that captive for that gun, that it meant that they could protect their village. If I hand over five captives and I get a gun, with that gun I can defend my village, my family. I'm sorry, buddy, but you're not from my you're not from my village. You're not from my region, my kingdom. You don't speak my language. And that had nothing to do with Islam. <laughs> had everything to do with just differences among ethnicities. But it wasn't Islam. Like I said, one can argue that Islam created, like I said, a third party or a third force which helped to destabilize what was already unstable. But the reality is the seeds of the division were already there. And the problem was that as African peoples, folk didn't realize the need to consolidate because they could not customarily, they could not see the big picture. Europeans saw the big picture. European rulers did. But they're dealing with a smaller region. They're dealing with a legacy of being willing to, you know, kick butt in order to make you conform because I had to. My territory is smaller. You can't live next door to me and not like me. All right. And if you don't like me live next door, I'm going to put, in, put things in place to make sure you get out of the line. I'm going to hit you hard. In an African setting with a larger kingdom, it's hard to govern a larger kingdom without the resources. You cannot like me. You just move. And I'm not as concerned about you because I know that the territory is vast. Different mindset, different, different reality related to something, again, geographers would discuss that as a resource and, and, and spatial issue. I got more space. I can put more distance between me and you. I don't have to worry about whether you like me or not. You crowd me together. Now we got to sit down and talk because we, you know, this, this people say this town ain't big enough for the both of us. That kind of mindset is what is in play here. And again, I just say, to the credit of the Moors, the African Muslim populations that had engaged Europeans over the course of centuries, we knew the need to consolidate better. We knew that you better put aside your, distance, your differences, buddy, because do you know what's waiting on the coast? Do you know that the objective is to take over the three? We can't be fighting over petty stuff. Still goes on today.
You know, I went to uh, Ghana. I did a documentary on uh, Elmina, Gloria Allen, mm -hmm. etc. But when I was in uh, working on uh, Elmina, I ran into a brother who was a prince, and I told him what I was doing. He says, oh, my brother, if you want to understand slavery, you have to go up country. You have to go mm -hmm. into the hinterlands. And there were no Europeans there. But that's where you must go to go to slavery. So he took me up, mm -hmm. introduced me to um, his family and everything. And the chief was, of course, uh, his father. And I, I sit down and interview the chief, and I said, what I must know, what happened? What happened that would, would essentially get one African to sell his brother into slavery? And uh, after continuing to try to get him to answer the question, because he never... He couldn't really answer. The only thing he could say to me, and he said it with tears, was they made us. They collapsed the economy. They made us. He kept saying they made us, but he could never, and it was the most frustrating thing I've, I've encountered. He couldn't Express articulate right. how they did it, how they made them sell each other into slavery. But you were beginning to, but I want you to expand on that collapse of the economy, the collapse of the system, because now for the first time I'm beginning to really see it. Mm -hmm. what he was trying to say. Right. Right. say. I'm a chief of a village or a chief of a region. We've maintained our autonomy, we've had everything we've needed because for, for centuries, for generations, we've successfully traded in salt, gold, palm cloth, whatever. All of a sudden the trade is drying up because we were told that you can get it cheaper on the coast. So us bringing it to you now and our cost in transferring this to the larger populace has now been challenged. Now we're told that we no longer have a means to sustain ourselves. We've got to figure out some other way of trading and maintaining. And then we also already have a long-standing dispute with another ethnic group who we don't hate but we don't particularly like. That group we see as being more favored by the king or the ruler. And we then come into contact with these strangers who show up and say that, you know, we have something that you might want to trade. We, you know, you can trade this pewter or this brass or these glass beads. And that's different. And so we we give what we have to get those things and we start getting pulled into the European economy. Then this chief realizes that the situation is getting a lot worse. Now he's hearing that some people from the village have been snatched up and sold off. Don't know where they are, don't know where they went, but we can't find them. They may in fact be in Africa because people sold first in different parts of Africa and then ultimately may end up being sold across the Atlantic. And we're taught, and the chief is then asked by the people in the village, the elders, what are you going to do about this? Well, what are our options? Well, we have to figure out a way how to defend ourselves because now this other ethnic group that we were at odds with or had a difference of opinion with, they're now raiding us. And some of them have these fire sticks, these guns. So now we have to get guns. So now I then find myself having, well, how do we get guns? We get guns by handing over captives. They, want, they said that these Europeans, these Christians, want uh, captives. Well, we may not initially have captives. So what do we first do? We start handing over our own. Prisoner. Right. We may hand over, well, so-and-so, you know, your, your son or daughter is a debtor. Um, maybe you can pay off that debt by giving them, a, so it's done. So they hand them over. They get what they need. They get the guns. They get the gunpowder. They get the 
the shot, and they used this to then protect the village. But now the problem is, you, they don't make their own bullets, they don't make their own gunpowder. Europeans show up again and say, well, you need guns, I mean, you need bullets now, you need gunpowder. Where are you going to get it from? Well, what do you want? You know what we want. We want more captives. So you say, well, what are you going to do? So you hand over more captives. Now you're caught in the vicious cycle. And you're doing it to protect the village, but what you're doing is you're either giving up your own directly, right? Or you are inciting more division between yourself and the surrounding ethnicities because you're snatching up other folk. And now tempers flare because now you have created an even greater rift between yourself and your neighbors as you have struggled to survive. That's what I hear him saying when he see they made us do it. They made us do it. Our existing economies collapsed because they took over the, the various uh, goods that were traded by force or by um, people say uh, 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 business you know practices business intrigues and what's the motivation At the same time this is going on the Europeans are living by not a Christian creed what's the most popular work for rulers and merchants the prince by Machiavelli the prince who says the ends justify the means you do whatever is necessary to get what you want. Do whatever is necessary to get what you need. And what we need and what we want is wealth. The various um, acts, the navigation acts, the various naval acts that are passed in Europe are placing the emphasis upon building up a navy for the purpose of securing control of the seas so that you can go into other territory and bring back wealth to the home country. That becomes the agenda. It's initiated first by saying we need to first get gold wealth so we have the gold to buy what we need. After we get the gold, we then buy what we need, we then emphasize the military, not like Karenga talks about in, in his book Introduction to Black Studies. Emphasis upon long distance ships with guns, with, net, with cannons. So you can go into territory, subdue your uh, enemy, even if it's not your enemy, subdue the person you're trying to get the goods from so that you can increase the wealth at home. And this is what is done gunboat diplomacy, which is then done later when, when what was it, Perry sails into, uh, what is it, Tokyo Bay and tells the Japanese, you want to trade? Well, they've got the guns fixed on the shogunate, as if it's a question. First, they launch a barrage to show them what they can do. Then they send the emissary across to the, to the shore and say, you want to trade? And the Japanese say, you're damn right we want to trade. What, what choice? We just saw what you did. Now, to the credit of the Japanese, they then said, okay, now we're going to learn all we can and use that to subdue you. And they did it quite effectively for a long time until they were, as they say, put in their place, so-called, put in their place by the European powers in World War II, headed up by the United States. But what I'm saying is that that approach to dealing with non-Europeans has been going on for centuries. Europeans understood that the greater focus for them had to be on developing a military and then figuring out what the economic structure was in place that they could usurp and what political structure was in place that they could destroy. Fragment. The old Roman, old Roman approach, was it the Roman um, said, uh, Divide and conquer, divide and rule. So that's, that's essentially what, what takes place. And again, they sought to have the big picture. 
whereas Africans did not. Most Africans. I'm not saying, I, I say that as if, that isn't to say that many Africans did not see the big picture. Many Africans did. I think Queen Nzinga was among them. Shaka. Shaka, right. Um, and certainly a number of the Moorish rulers, Muli Ishmael um, is one. Even to some degree, Al-Mansur, who unfortunately, though, does a, makes a major mistake by attacking Timbuktu in 1591 and uses mercenaries who were Spanish Catholics. So here's a Moorish ruler using Spanish Catholics to attack an African Muslim city. The reason? There were long-standing feuds around who owned the salt mines. That was one. Number two, he needed, he felt, to get control of the territory so he could get the wealth to fund his war effort to keep the Europeans from attack, attacking the coastal areas of the Moorish Empire, see? So it's now you start feeding on your children in order to keep, you know, yourself and the grandparents alive. Now, the Ashanti, you mentioned that they were also among the those of people who, who engaged in, 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 that's right. in, in slavery. That's Can right. You speak about that, the Ashanti, the Fonti, the um, uh, Europeans who set up that uh, huge Elmina slave trade. How did that work? Because I'm familiar with that area. I'm not familiar with all the particulars of how um, it worked in terms of where they, exactly where they took them from and where they uh, all were sent. I only know that the Ashanti were part of the trade because they were one of the most powerful ethnic groups and nations in the region. And again, they had no great love for a number of the other ethnic groups, I think including the Akan, and their attitude was we are doing this for our own preservation. And so they were willing to, to capture Africans and hand them over to European slavers. They were willing to capture Africans and hand them over to African slavers, who would then sell them to European slavers. Their concern was in maintaining their power. And again, it has to do with not really being fully aware of what the larger ramifications were on the whole African continent. But I couldn't tell you um, in, in intimate detail all the particulars of where people were, were sent. Um, Perhaps in, in winding down, we can look at um, how Africa built Europe. Look at Europe, the need of Europe, and how that need was fulfilled. Uh, the cities that grew up, the power that grew, uh, the plantation that mm -hmm. supplied the cotton or whatever. I mean, but but we often say the blood, the, the wealth of Europe is built on the blood of Africa. And, um, and if we can look at that, um, we can begin to close up uh, on, that, uh, on that perspective. But another thing, if, if you know, though, I had heard that there was at all times uh, about a thousand ships on the seas that were involved in one way or another hmm. uh, in the African slave trade, either from uh, hmm. America to the Caribbean, from the Caribbean to Europe, from Europe to Africa. But the countries that were involved in that slave trade, from shipbuilding to whatever, but the, the number, the, the wealth that ensued in so many dimensions was awesome. That's true. And the English are the ones that take the enslavement trade to new heights. The English are the ones that pour a great deal of, of um, effort into maintaining um, the enslavement trade. The Spanish, of course, and the Portuguese are the European powers that initiate this contracting in slaves for bringing them to the Americas. The English pour considerable resources into the process and make it more productive, more productive than the Spanish. In fact, the Spanish actually get greater revenue. 
and so let me put it this way: the Spanish sought to make the um, the fees for engaging in slavery the greater source of the revenue than the sale of the slaves themselves. In other words, the way that it was set up, the asiento was set up so that you would have to pay the Spanish for the right to engage in the enslavement, in the enslavement of Africans and the sale of the Africans in various ports. So you were paying a fee, this revenue to the Spanish for the for the um, ability to do it. It's like getting a license or something. And then the English see the greater value in the actual system of slavery and making the agricultural the, the agriculture that they're engaged in more productive through through the slave labor. So they're saying we're going to get our wealth by having the, the maximum number of slaves in a particular area produce the maximum amount of crops to increase our wealth and keep our overhead low by giving them just enough to survive. See, So the focus in, with the English is on making the business of slavery, the actual production aspect, more fruitful, more productive. Um, that's different like I said, than what the, the, the Spanish focus had been initially. And that's why the Spanish actually get a little bit of a reputation for not being as, as effective in their system of enslavement as the English. The English are, are much more better organized in terms of making, it, making slavery productive. You, have you done any research on um, the number of ships that may have been involved. And the reason for mm -hmm. that is that you can look at the ships and estimate the number of Africans. Right, uh, that would be... A ship held right. approximately 250. Right. They made approximately two voyages a year. So if there was a thousand ships on the shore, on the sea, uh, at, at during, the, during the period of, you know, because when, when, they didn't do it all year round because right. of the hurricane season. They right. didn't, but if you if you multiply mm -hmm. uh, a, a thousand uh, two hundred two voyages a thousand ships right over three hundred years you come out with almost three hundred million people uh, that's why it's important to kind to kind of get a handle yeah. on how many ships really were involved and their ship records that on, on that them. estimate sounds about right. I was going to ask you where you heard that from, if that is something you heard I've from. I've heard black historians throw it around, but I haven't seen them come up with any hard data to prove it. I, I don't know of any source that I've read that's actually said the number of ships that were on the sea. They estimate. At, right. At any, you said that was a thousand ships a day? No, a thousand ships. Yeah, a thousand right. ships. That any one day you would have found a thousand ships yeah. engaged in that. I'm trying to remember the number of ships that the English had in the 18th century, which in and of itself would help. Well, that's possible because the English alone, I think, had utilized greater than 300 ships. They added 300 ships to the Spanish 54. So they had 246 more ships that were being used for the enslavement trade. Now that's more. So they, they added that. So you figure if that's, you know, 54 ships that the Spanish had, how many hundreds of ships did the Portuguese have? The English had some 300 ships. Right there, you're getting in the five, six hundred ships. If you add other countries, what other countries would have been enslaved, would have been involved in enslavement trade? The Dutch, um, the Fre well, the French, and we would even have to add African ships, more specifically, Muslim and Arab ships, which would have been also carrying captives along the coastal regions. Um, German, well, right. G Germany was not. 
Well, Germany didn't exist as we know it today. There was no Germany. There were Germanic kingdoms. But you would have had some Germanic kingdoms involved in the enslavement trade. Some of the Swedes and the Swiss were involved in it. Um, but like I said, the lion's share was the English and the Portuguese, right? So I would, I would say that that's a reasonable estimate. Then I'd never actually thought about it the way you just put it when you mentioned the thousand ships, but that makes perfect sense to me. Now we we added that up, <laughs> and that at two two voyages a year, at an average of two hundred. Some ships sail more, mm -hmm. but we took the low figure: two hundred and fifty uh, people, Africans per ship, five hundred per ship mm -hmm. per year. Uh, times a thousand, and then multiply that times three of uh, two fifty, say two hundred fifty years. You come out with over two hundred million people. We cross reference mm. that with the slave dungeons. Right. And down on along, there are forty something slave dungeons along the coast. Mm -hmm. At the larger slave dungeons, uh, they it was um, oh the figure is slipping my mind now, but I think. They could hold at maximum about a thousand people, El Mina. And the ships came approximately six uh, to two months. But you could average it out, say, every eight weeks, you would have a ship. Mm. So if you begin to add the dungeons and average them out with every eight weeks, you'll come out to approximately the same number of people 200 million. Right. And um, that is an astounding number of people because that's the ones that got on the ship. That's not the ones that were killed in battle and lost. Right. So when they say that whole population, whole area of Africa would be populated, then you can see that that is highly possible. Yeah. That Africa is in the condition that it is in now because it lost its people. It lost mm -hmm. the youth, the productivity, and the best of its people. I heard somebody say one time that for every one who made it, five people were lost in the process. So that includes the ones who were lost on the continent during the fights, the fighting took place, as well as the ones that didn't make it because they died during the Middle Passage. Again, so you have to multiply the number by five whatever it is. So if you had 200 million over the course of how many centuries, you're talking about a billion people. And, you know, Africa's a huge continent, so of course it can, you know, do you figure ch what China has? How many? Five, four, five. Well, no, China, a billion and a half. Oh. A billion and a half people, right. Right, right. China. I'm giving China all the people. Right, that's right. That's right. <laughs> China has a, has a billion and a half people, I think. So you figured a billion and a half people. A billion people were lost, presumably, over the course of that, those number of years as a result of the enslavement trade. Not at once. You know, people said, why would you go to be kidding? Over the course of centuries. That's amazing. And see, what, what people get confused at, they say, well, you know, it couldn't be because after emancipation, during the time of emancipation, there was only um, four or five million slaves in America. Mm -hmm. But that's how many was in America at that one particular time. But you had 300 years or 200 exactly. years of people dying every day. Exactly. Of every day. So you, <laughs> you can't just look at this. And that four or five million was actually only in the United States. I'm not even talking about Central and South America. And it was only 4%, I think, came to America. 38% was in Caribbean. Car uh, no, in Brazil alone. I oh, oh no. Out. I was going to Well, yeah. 38%, you're saying the majority were in Brazil or in South America, right? Because that's where the largest population of African people are outside of the African continent. Yeah, 30, the majority of all of them went there. But they were dispersed throughout all right. of the islands. So right. they had 4 million here. Mm. Uh, if you add them up, you had a hundred million Africans mm -hmm. in America at that time, That's right. throughout the Americas. Uh, Brother Bay, 
this has been a marvelous and wonderful <laughs> interview, and I, uh, I we cannot uh, thank you enough. Um, your your information, I think, has been extremely clarifying, uh, and um, we just thank you. Thank you. We, we thank you more than you ever know. I think people around the world. Um, who get a chance to view this program um, will mm. will be blessed and enriched by your work, your research. Uh, and again, we want to mm. want to thank you very much. There's almost too much, and I say this, you know, that they have a saying that uh, speaking of the devil, well, that's not really a correct saying, but let's give them one round. insight uh, into mm -hmm. the impact that the Moors had on Europe. Uh, Dr. Bay, if you would begin by giving us some background of both uh, the Moors and the Europeans uh, and kind of a time frame that we may begin and progress through uh, this dramatic period of history. Well, generally when, when we talk about the Moors, and I should say that I appreciate your um, introduction referring to me as a world authority. Um, I can only say that I've spent a little bit of time, uh, about 12 years, researching the legacy of the Moors, the history of the Moors. The Moors are a somewhat difficult topic because there's so much confusion around the identity issue. And the reason for that has a lot to do with the presence of these people in Europe, and they play such a profound role in the history of Europe that to allow them to be recognized as an African people would result in the alteration of the West's image of itself. The Moors are recognized by most historians as having been a predominantly Africoid, African people who entered into the Iberian Peninsula of what is now Spain and Portugal in the 8th century from Northwest Africa. And these peoples spoke Arabic, various Berber dialects from the continent of Africa. They brought into Europe not only their own cultural uh, attributes of being Africans, coming from various parts of the African continent, parts of what's called the Maghreb or Maghreb, Northwest Africa, West Africa. But they also brought much culture from areas of Asia, because as a Muslim people, they were carrying the accoutrements of ancient Persia, China. India, um, parts of the Asian world that had either been Islamicized or had been in extensive contact with the Islamic world through trade and or conflict. So the Moors represent an African people who have a very international link to other parts of the world because of the, the religion of Islam which is established uh, about a century or, or more earlier than the Moorish invasion into Spain uh, and Portugal, what becomes Spain and Portugal. Um, their reasons for coming into the Iberian Peninsula have to do with an interest in expanding the territory of the Islamic world. It also has to do with actually seeking um, to assist uh, those persons who were of African ancestry uh, and Semitic peoples who were in Spain and Portugal. In fact, one of the um, accounts that's also given about this Moorish invasion, this African Muslim invasion into Spain, involves the Sephardic community, the Jewish community, having sent emissaries 
uh, and information coming out into the uh, area of North West Africa under various rulers um, who had heard essentially about um, the Iberian Peninsula, which at that time was under the control of the Church of, A well, it's called the Arian Church, but Arian as in under Arius, A-R-I-U-S. Arius, who was remembered as a, as a somewhat of a Christian heretic for his unique interpretation of the gospel. And the followers of Arius included people like a Roderick, who was a Visigothic ruler in uh, the Iberian Peninsula, who uh, also had opposition uh, from uh, Greek uh, Orthodox groups that had settled in the, in the Iberian Peninsula. And then you, of course, had the remnants of the Roman presence, the Roman elites, um, uh, Hispani Visigoths, who were in the region. Now, the region had always been occupied by Africans. There had always been African people coming up into the Iberian Peninsula long before 711 of the Common Era. But the Moors coming in at that time signals the arrival of an African Muslim populace that secures control of much of the region for the purpose of conquest and exploitation of, of the, the territory. Um, in terms of the level of culture that existed, um, the Moors as Muslims, of course, uh, having links to nations like Egypt and Syria and Persia uh, and what uh, is other parts of the Maghreb in Northwest Africa, what is now places like Tunisia and Libya, and of course Morocco, already had a culture which emphasized such things as uh, hygiene and cleanliness. I just use that as a major example of one of the drastic changes that occurs as a result of this presence, because the Moors would acquire a reputation for putting so much of an emphasis upon hygiene and cleanliness that you had Catholic rulers in the medieval period who would complain about that and would actually destroy public baths um, after the reconquista, the reconquest of the territory. The level of culture among most medieval Christian Europeans, as one medievalist referred to it as cold, hard, and brutish. Um, it was a very uh, difficult existence. People relied upon charms and amulets for health, um, maintenance of health. People would not see the, the difficulty or problem with, say, eating from the same bowl that was used perhaps to carry manure um, or human feces from the home. There was not a recognition of the importance of cleanliness among the vast majority of Europeans. The Moors, uh, as a Muslim populace in particular would introduce um, knowledge of chemistry, uh, such things as alcohol, which obviously was used as an antiseptic and the origin of the word itself, alcohol, is of course Arabic in origin. Um, Ibn Khaldun and Ibn Khatima, uh, later on in the 14th century, would be recognized as having concluded that unseen contagion or unseen uh, items existed on the garments and the vessels of the afflicted. So people who understood that in the Moorish world, the Islamic world, knew to avoid, for example, the items that the sick had used. And this did a lot to cut back on plague or problems with um, you know, health. Um, those are two examples um, that I think are rather profound. Even the custom of bathing um, which uh, would catch on among certain Western Europeans who were Christian, uh, would create quite a stir. Um, Frederick II of Sicily, Roger II of Sicily, who was his grandfather, both were actually Germanic and Christian, but they recognized the legacy of Moorish and Muslim, or as they would often use the term, Saracen, Saracen knowledge, and bathed themselves and became known as the two baptized sultans uh, of the West, uh, essentially saying that these individuals were Christians, but they had picked up on what was seen as a Muslim practice of, um, of bathing. 
and it caused quite a stir among the Catholic uh, authorities, the Catholic elite. But it was understood over time that these things were prolonging life. Um, it was not uncommon for people to seek out, of course, individuals who were trained in Moorish medicine um, in order to be treated. Um, the European world, of course, heard about this legacy. Um, you have in the 8th century, as I say, this wave of African Muslims settling in the Iberian Peninsula in what they would call uh, Andalus or Al-Andalus, um, and would secure control and then begin to Africanize, as many historians have said, Africanize the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, inevitably, great intermarriage then occurred between the African peoples of North and West Africa and the European peoples who occupied the Iberian Peninsula. Actually, the first dynasty, however, that's established in Andalusia is um, the Umayyad dynasty, which is actually uh, from Syria. Um, coming in from Damascus, this is set up um, with this then Asian or Asiatic link uh, as well to this African wave of Muslims that comes in. The two peoples, so to speak, come together. But the rank and file, the vast majority of those who invade into the Iberian Peninsula are Africans. Um, and one of the problems that we sometimes have if we look at the legacy of the Moors is people assume that because they were Muslims, they were Arabs. And this can't be uh, any further from the truth. The vast majority of the people who went into the Iberian Peninsula were African Muslims. They spoke Arabic, but they were not Arabs. Um, but the reason also for that confusion has a lot to do with, again, a lot of Western historians um, consciously not wanting to recognize that this introduction of culture, um, I should say introduction of, introduction of a higher culture, to be more accurate, introduction of a higher culture in terms of the knowledge base uh, of the, the people in areas of science, in areas of, of uh, technology, in areas of even religion and philosophy, was much greater among these African and Asian newcomers to Europe than those who occupied the European world itself. Um, you had asked also about the um, economic political. or political <laughs> reasons. Um, because the Moors were Muslim, the structure was essentially governed by Islamic law uh, or Sharia. Uh, but the African Muslim interpretation of Sharia or, or the religion itself was much more eclectic. And Diop would often would say, would often write about how Islam in Africa typically has represented a, a living religion, something that is not static and that has become, it's dynamic, it's changed, it's adapted. <clears throat> and so even though you had a structure where you had an independent Umayyad uh, emirate at first, an emirate after Emir who was one of the rulers, and then there's the Caliph or the Caliphate who was both a political and a uh, religious leader, um, you have this dynastic control, the Umayyad structure, replacing the old Catholic Arian, as in Arius, and Greek Orthodox structure that had been in place prior to that time. And one of the things that people said during this, this era who occupied the Iberian Peninsula from the medieval sources that we have. Um, one source is Christians and Moors, um, which is a primary source uh, collection from the 8th century through the uh, 15th century. And it's edited by Colin Smith. And it talks about how most of the Christians, the Catholic uh, occupants of the country, saw themselves as being oppressed by the, uh, the lords or the burgesses, those who were in positions of power. Um, 
who were coming out of the Catholic Church, who are linked to the, to the structure that was left in place after Rome fell and after the Roman domination of, of Spain and Portugal, or the Iberian Peninsula had collapsed. You had something called the um, Ayus Mala Tractandi, the evil usages. And this was something that was put in place by the Catholic structure, the Christian structure, to really take advantage of those who were poor, the peasants. Um, it basically said that crimes could be overlooked by paying a certain fee. So there were literally um, crimes that had a certain cost attached to them. So if someone committed a certain crime, they would simply be required to go to the royal authorities and pay the fee for what that was, whether it was theft, rape, murder, or what have you. And it meant that the greater power it politically was, of course, not only just in the hands of those who were uh, royalty, but those who were very, very wealthy, those who held the wealth. Um, the abuses that were seen to be taking place also against the Jewish population, the Sephardim, the Sephardim, the Sephardic population, had a lot to do with encouraging people um, in the Iberian Peninsula to actually go along with the invasion. So that when the Moors invaded under um, Tariq, uh, Gibraltar, which is named after Tariq, and uh, Tarif, who was actually the, the primary commander. Um, and when they entered into the Iberian Peninsula, many of the locals, many of the people who were the quote-unquote natives, went along with the invasion because they themselves had been so badly treated by the Catholic uh, or Christian structure that had been uh, in place, the remnants of the Romans and, and even to some degree the remnants of the Greek Orthodox uh, uh, church residents who lived in different parts of the country as well. Um, in fact, Rodrigo or Roderick, uh, who was the ruler, the Catholic ruler, part of the, the Aryan church, is, uh, and this I have to say, Arius is not to be confused with Aryan, as in Aryan nations or uh, the concept of Aryans who come off the Eurasian plains. Arius is this person's name, um, who actually was from, um, from Hellenistic uh, 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 Europe. Um, but Rodrigo had alleged, allegedly, according to the tradition, taken advantage of the daughter of one of the Greek rulers. Uh, and as a result, this Greek ruler is said to have then not only invited the Moors, the African Muslim invasion, but assisted it so that it would be more successful because of his contempt, again, for the injustices that were taking place within the social and political structure. Um, the Moors replaced this with a greater degree of, of equality, a greater degree of equity, that is not uncommon for a religion which is new. The kind of zealot, uh, or zealous outlook, the kind of fanaticism that people may associate with Islam, at this time, was for the most part positive and that people were trying to set a new and better example um, for what was supposed to be, eliminating the injustices, that freshness of saying we're going to bring justice, we're going to eliminate the poverty if we can, we're going to eliminate the corruption if we can, that becomes a priority and it manifests. And so it's not a shock then that within um, two centuries uh, you have the vast majority of the people in the country now as Muslims, um, uh, particularly in the southern region of, of Spain. Um, and this then has an influence on other parts of, uh, of Europe, because now you have an African Muslim Eastern population on Western soil, on European soil, which is now allowing this information to filter into other parts of Europe. 
Now, if you have a situation in Europe where the primary focus is on, excuse me, is on the church, the Catholic Church controls, um, for the most part, the social and political and economic structure of Western Europe. This is challenged by this African Muslim presence. And as a result, um, people in Western Europe, in places such as uh, Saxony, and of course in Great Britain, are hearing about this presence. And people travel from all over Western Europe to take advantage of the, uh, the fruits of new, this new civilization that is now on European soil. So you have people like Michael Scottis, who comes from Scotland. You have people like Adelaide of Bath, who comes in from, from England. You have people like Roger Bacon, who also studies among the uh, quote-unquote Arabs, as uh, it's referred to in some of, some of the writings, uh, who are essentially Moors, African Muslims. Um, you have people like um, uh, Edmond Aliman, which is just Herman the German in translation, who comes from the areas of, uh, area of what is now Germany, who are moving into this Africanized European region, kingdom, known as Andalus or Al-Andalus, Andalusia, in order to partake of the fruits of civilization. You have a system where the Moors set up uh, a health, literally a health system, where they have hospitals known as Baimaristans. And these hospitals have separate wings, and there are people who specialize in different areas. There are people who specialize in pediatrics, people who specialize in ophthalmolo ophthalmology. Um, all this information is being filtered out as if in whispers in some cases, and in other cases coming out with great um, pomp as people hear about this in remote places in different parts of Christian Europe. And as a consequence, um, the reputation of the country draws more immigrants to the region and also creates among those more thoughtful, those more insightful European rulers, Christian rulers, who understand they need to study what the Moors are bringing, even if they see them as infidels and the enemy. Because these people have a culture that is so profoundly in advance of what exists among the vast majority of Europeans at that time in Western Europe, that they have to in order to be able to compete. Um, what, would, what would be, if I may interrupt, um, what would be kind of some of the lifestyle and the political structure in terms of the dukes and so forth that we talked about, and how the church in many ways uh, denied the scientific uh, expansion of intellectual pursuit in certain areas, like numbers. Right. Right. So if you could kind of give an overview well, of what Europe... Pope Sylvester II um, is remembered for um, having introduced what's referred to as Arabic numerals. And this is after he had studied among the Moors, after, before he was pope. As a young cleric, he went into the schools, the madrasas, in places like Cordova, um, and studied among the Moors and acquired this information. Now, I'm just giving an example now. I'll move then from Spain then into Italy, which also is very significant here, too. But um, he's one example. Uh, another is actually um, the king, uh, Alfonso X, uh, who was a king of Castile. He's a Castilian king who in the 12th and 13th century, uh, and he's not the first, there were others, there was an, an archbishop, um, Michael, 
um, who actually about a century earlier had done the same thing, and that was to secure as many manuscripts that were in Arabic in every topic you can imagine, biology, astronomy, mathematics, um, theology, uh, even what people would, would consider later as psychology, um, uh, different areas of science and the humanities, in order to translate those texts into the developing Spanish vernacular language, as well as into Latin, and ultimately into the different languages of Europe. He did this and was criticized customarily by papal authorities or, or church authorities, the Pope, of course, the different popes, because they saw this as inviting trouble. They were afraid that the more that the Catholic rank and file engaged this information, the more likely they would then not only accept the science and the benefits of the technology, but they would then become Muslims, which often happened. And you do have people complaining as early as the ninth century about how um, Catholic authorities, about how you can't find a young Catholic man anymore who can even write a decent greeting in Latin. Anwar Cheni, who was a, a historian of Moorish Spain, uh, talks about that in one of his, his texts uh, called Muslim Spain. This recognition that they were such a threat um, to the Catholic power base, to the European Catholic power base. So that's an example. Like I said, Alfonso X even sets up a school of translators at Toledo in Spain to uh, improve uh, the speed with which the information could be translated and to improve the dissemination and the accuracy of that. And has at uh, Toledo uh, many scholars who are, of course, um, multilingual, a lot of uh, Jewish uh, uh, scholars who act as middlemen to translate works, as well as, of course, uh, Muslims, African Muslims and Moors themselves, who are translating the material as well, because people were multilingual in this society, not surprisingly. You have people who were speaking Latin, you have people who were speaking Arabic, you have people who were speaking various Berber or African dialects, you have people who are speaking um, the various languages of, of, of Europe, uh, the French vernacular, um, and of course, Hebrew. So all of this is being spoken, and uh, what actually is manifesting over the course of centuries is what we know as Spanish, um, which, is an, which is then an aggregate of all those languages. Um, but again, someone like Alfonso X sees the value of that, and he's attacked typically by the church for doing it. There's a whole cultural group that emerges called the Mozarabs, which are known for maintaining their Catholicism or their Christianity, but they learn Arabic, they start wearing Moorish or Islamic style attire, and they are then known as middlemen with their own interests, but they are then seen as a threat by the Catholic authorities because they are speaking Arabic, they wear the attire, and they are seen as sending mixed messages to, again, the average Catholic um, citizen, if you will. Um, it's seen as a great danger by those in power. Um, if you then go over to, to Italy, you have schools like the University of uh, Bologna and the medical school at Salerno, which um, emphasize a great deal of the, the, the scholarship of the Moors, specifically the University of of Naples uh, and Bologna were both established to focus on that. That was their purpose. This is a shift from what were formerly referred to as cathedral schools, which basically just taught people how to be clerics. Uh, you would learn the Bible. You, of course, would then have to learn Latin. You would learn um, something called hagiography, which is the uh, biography of the saints. 
to be able to do that was seen as being highly educated in uh, Catholic Europe at that time, in the medieval period. For the Moors to be highly educated was, or to be educated, was to be able to know botany, astronomy, uh, sharia, which is the law, um, mathematics, such as algebra, which of course is, is Arabic, uh, the word, and is in, its origins are in the Arabic world, Muslim world. Um, uh, others would expand their knowledge by studying geography and geology. Uh, you had people who also were then studying various areas of medical science. Um, to have a f holistic education was seen as a mandate. To simply know a little bit about one area. If you only knew the Bible, you weren't seen as being as effective in functioning in the society because you also would need someone who knew something about agriculture. You would also need something, someone who knew something about mathematics if you're going to set up any kind of structure and building and everything else. All those things are necessary. So from a Moorish perspective, to be highly educated meant that not only did you know scripture, but you had to know the various areas of what we call the liberal arts or the, the, the sciences. This really is a shift from the old cathedral school style um, that had dominated Western Europe that, uh, up to that point. And this is why the Moors, again, is seen as such a threat, because of that. To the credit of the Moors, also to say this, the Moors encouraged discourse and the polemic the argumentative and, and didactic debates and engagement with people so that you could improve upon your knowledge base. They liked the idea of having Christians, Jews, and Muslims living together and engaging one another on different topics. So they encouraged, essentially, people to maintain uh, um, their right to express themselves intellectually. This is why um, Musa... Ben Maimonides, who was a famous Jewish philosopher, perhaps the most famous of all Jewish philosophers, is a product of Moorish-dominated Spain. That's no accident. He maintained his Judaism. This is why Thomas Aquinas, who was not um, living in uh, Moorish Spain, but who studies Moorish texts and documents in theology, um, partially, it's said in Catholic tradition to be able to debate and argue against the Muslim position, but also because he saw great value in the writings of um, uh, Abu al-Walid ibn Muhammad ibn Rushdi, known as Averroes, and was really relying more upon Averroes for his own theological interpretation of Catholicism than his own interpretation. And Averroes, uh, who also was interpreting earlier Greek texts, uh, which were preserved by the Muslims, preserved by the Moors, is also being conveyed. So the Moors have really fostered a very universal environment academically, intellectually. And this is one of the greatest, this is why it's one of the greatest flowerings in Western Europe. The legacy of, of this is something which will reverberate for centuries. Uh, and it's often been said that one of the worst things that the Spanish Catholic powers did after the Reconquista was to suppress the Moorish population and to um, remove them. Because as a result, Spain's golden age is very short-lived. It's like they were given all the gold and the wealth, so to speak, of the Moorish presence, but then quickly spent it up because they had removed the people who had really allowed for that growth. And the, the ramifications of that are reflected later in conflicts uh, involving piracy and the Barbary Wars and everything else. Before, while we're on the subject of Europe and the difference between the uh, educational uh, institutions and the two cultures, I'd like you to go a little bit more in the educational institutions to paint an even broader picture of it we talk about the um, uh, uh, women were being burned at the stake, so people were being burned uh, for being considered heretics. Which is heretics. Right. How did that play into 
the confines of the outlook of the church and the limitations of people in the exploration of science in the century? Well, it's, it's the reason why people still are under the false impression that everybody thought the world was flat until Christopher Columbus sails in 1492. It's the reason why people um, thought that uh, sickness had nothing to do with um, disease as a result of unclean conditions and the concept of antiseptics was a non-issue because um, the church essentially at that time pretty much prescribed it. I refer to it sometimes as a kind of prescribed ignorance to the masses. Um, the Moors knew the world was round and in fact many people knew the church pretty much prescribed it. Members of the church, the clerics, the Catholic structure, did not typically see it as favorable to inform the average person about whatever knowledge they were acquiring by reading, say, Moorish treatises, Moorish manuscripts and texts. That information was kind of like a for your eyes only uh, uh, thing, similar to in many governments of the world today, we have a recognition that there are things that the higher-ups do not feel is in the best interest of the rank and file, the average citizen. Judgments are made for us as to what we can handle and what we can't handle, and a lot of times things are just withheld because knowledge is power. If they told the masses essentially about these things, and the masses would have the power to govern their own fate uh, more effectively. So what I'm essentially saying is it was understood by many of those who took the time to study the Moors and the Moorish culture that the Moors were leaps and bounds ahead of the Catholic European world. If you had people going to the Moors with all kinds of diseases and the Moors use a, a, some liquid uh, which seems to be like water on a wound and the wound heals and it seems like magic to someone who doesn't know anything about alcohol, or someone who is suffering from cataracts or kidney stones, and the Moors are engaged in surgery to remove these things. The Catholic Church had clergymen who certainly knew about this. They lived all around them. But they had to contain the information from as many of the rank and file as possible who were beyond certain borders to prevent a kind of mad rush to acquire what the Moors had to offer, and most importantly, to alter how the Moors would be seen by the Catholic European populace. In other words, you have to make these people seem like they are the enemy. They're the worst thing you could ever engage. You don't want to create a condition when people see them as presenting something of value so that the people then are seen as valuable. That's why you had people who were converting. That's why people like the Mozadabs had emerged. That's why the Jewish population, excuse me, as well, had been so, uh, so much more comfortable with the Moorish Muslim populace because they were there, and as an ancient people also, they were there witnessing this, and they saw the value of it. And seeing the value of it meant it was very hard for them to then see the Moors as their enemies. So they customarily worked together. And in fact, when the, um, the Moors are expelled, so were the Jews in 1492, both groups. And when, you, when one reads the um, uh, uh, surrender agreement, it's right in the surrender agreement that these people, Jews and the Moors, are, are required to leave. Now, many Moors still end up staying. And some Jews end up also staying, but they now have to work in the service of the Catholic Church, or they become what's known as conversos, or converts, even though many of them would, would um, secretly practice their own faith, but they would openly assert Catholicism. But the idea of needing to suppress the Moorish, M Muslim, Eastern, whatever terms, whatever, those three cultures which are now merged in this area, those non-European elements, 
it was necessary to suppress that information to deny the Moors access to power. You have to devalue the people before you can get your own group to work with you in suppressing, oppressing, and exterminating, as they say, or you know, killing off the, the opposition and the enemy. That, that's what I was going to ask you. Was there a penalty for people who insisted on trying to acquire uh, this knowledge? Was there a penalty? What was the penalty? And was it broad scale? Uh, what was the reaction? You have a situation, and there's no singular answer or no singular example of something that held in every case. If you look at different parts of what is Spain and Portugal um, and different parts of France, um, Britain, Germany, you see different manifestations at different times. Um, it depended upon the ruler. It depended upon the proximity uh, to the borders of the regions controlled by the Moors. Um, for example, in the northernmost areas of Spain, it was easier to maintain uh, a greater oppressive condition against the Muslim population and those who might have been sympathetic to it because they had established a Catholic stronghold separate from the Moorish regions. Um, at the same time, though, I mentioned Alfonso X, um, I mentioned Roger II in Sicily, and uh, Frederick II in Sicily. All three men are known for having promoted a greater freedom of religious expression in their Catholic kingdoms. Why? Because they first saw the value of what was presented. They saw the value of having the scientific elite in the form of these Muslims living amongst them. The only concern was order and maintaining order. They didn't want their power to be overthrown, but they put the emphasis upon this idea of saying, you have something of value, we can use it. Um, it's for the greater good, ultimately, of the entire uh, 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 Catholic and European world from their perspective, and they went, they went with it. Um, the idea of... Uh, resisting um, the church, the Catholic church, uh, of course, occurs in many instances. And in fact, um, again, referring to Colin Smith's you know, uh, collection of uh, primary source documents, both in Latin and in Arabic, he points to people in authority in the Catholic church complaining about their own young clerics often taking on the bishops of a particular region. When I say taking on, challenging them for not being honest, if you will, with the people, for suppressing information that they had learned themselves. Uh, and as a result, are sometimes seen uh, in the role of almost being martyrs against um, uh, you know, the Catholic Church, the prescribed ignorance that was typically the case at that time. Now, you also find examples of Catholics who would martyr themselves for the Church. Um, and this occurs later and later and during the Reconquista, and with people who are more and more zealous in trying to remove these, these heretics, less concerned about the scientific value of the culture, more concerned about the spiritual aspect of needing to believe in uh, Jesus Christ as prescribed by Catholicism. Okay. I need to say this about the difference, too, between the, the two worlds. Catholic Church, as Christians, of course, don't acknowledge or recognize the Arab prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him and all the prophets. As a result of that, that outlook of not seeing a common ground with the Muslims creates a difficult condition 
because it means the Catholic Church, the Christians at that time, for the most part, do not value theologically what the, what the Muslim world has to offer. On the other hand, you have in the Muslim world the recognition that Abraham is the common father of all the Judeo, when you talk about the Judeo-Christian or monotheistic tradition that dominates. And in Arabic, al al-kitab, or the people of the book, is what's emphasized. The idea that Christians, Jews, and Muslims are all of the same book. They are all the people of the book, the Old Testament. But they also recognize Jesus. Okay? The Muslims don't deny Jesus. The Muslims say that Jesus is a messenger, a divine messenger of God, of Allah. As a result, they're able to get along with Christians theologically because it's part of They say, well, you're wrong for seeing him as God, but they at least acknowledge him. Whereas the Catholic population customarily does not even acknowledge any other prophets of having significance, and certainly not Muhammad, after uh, Jesus. And so it creates a problem. Um, and that problem is manifest then in uh, the church's need to, again, uh, suppress and deny um, and hide what the Muslim, the Moorish population is, is, is offering um, to Europe. And you have, like I said, a few examples of people in different parts of the country of, of Andalusia and in different parts of Spain, uh, excuse me, of Italy and France, who will risk, in some cases, it's a risk, studying what the Moors, the Muslim population has to offer, in spite of what the church says, and finds himself persona non grata among many of the church authorities and, and many of the popes. But again, the period... The, in other words, the century and the region determines how that's played out. Sometimes things are more, uh, so say, uh, some, sometimes things are less oppressive, sometimes things are more oppressive. It depends upon time and space. What I was trying to do was get an insight to you of study into the burnings that happen at the state with uh, so like the Queen of uh, the Joan of Arc mm -hmm. story. Uh, with so many, um, I've read yeah. that there were three million European women burned at the stake over mm -hmm. a period of 300 years. Wow. I wanted to get some insight into that in terms of why why that was done. Did it happen and how it happened? You know? Well, it it was done because they were seen as a threat to the existing spiritual knowledge. It was done because they were seen as a threat because their their uh, world view differed from that of those men who were in power. Um, you know, if I'm a, a, a cleric, if I'm a bishop, if I'm a cardinal, if I'm a pope, um, and I want to maintain my domination, and, and my primary worldview is very, very patriarchal and very, very xenophobic, um, I'm going to try to maintain that because it's suiting me. It's suiting my, the system that's in place. Anything which challenges that, I'm going to try to suppress. Let me give an example of a group which faces this, and they're not Muslims. The Cathars, or the Albigensians, as they're called, who, live in the southern, who lived in the southern part of France, had a different interpretation of Christianity. They still believed in Christ, but they had a different interpretation of Christianity. They saw Christ as more, more, of, more like a prophet, but they still saw themselves as Christians. When I say more like a prophet, meaning they said he was divine, they believed he was divine, but they believed that his divinity was not the... Their conception of divinity was not the conception that the Catholic Church had. They talked about the need to have a greater emphasis upon um, a kind of open-air expression of one's faith. You don't need a church. We can go out in the field and pray to God. And we shouldn't be expected to give necessarily then tithes to a structure because now what we have is a bureaucracy that's in place. And they're trying to avoid the bureaucracy. They're trying to emphasize God as a more personal experience. They um, uh, also had women who were 
uh, religious leaders known as parfaits. This, of course, is against the Catholic Church because a woman can't be a priest. Essentially, these women were priestesses in, in the Catholic tradition. Um, as a result of them being seen as a threat, Pope Innocent, in the uh, 13th century, initiates a um, crusade against them and has several thousand of them annihilated. Um, part of it was political. big part of it was political because he was trying to take control of the, of the territory. The justification was religious because they didn't believe as, as the Catholic authorities believed. Um, this is where the saying, if you've ever heard it, comes from um, one of the uh, envoys, or one of the, the agents of the Pope came in and told him, you know, we've initiated this attack against the Cathars, but, you know, some of the people are innocent. Mm -hmm. Meaning, we're, we launched this attack but we don't know who is who when we burn and raise these cities, these villages. And the Pope is reported to have said, kill them all. God knows his own. Which essentially doesn't make a whole lot of sense because then it's innocent people who were being slain in the process. But that kind of fervor, that kind of zealous, justifiable fervor of saying, look, just kill them all. I ain't got time. You, we, we don't have time nor an interest in figuring out who's innocent and who's not innocent. Just kill them all and let God deal with it. That attack, which occurs against followers of Christ, not Muslims, is seen, I think, in history as a classic example of the greater interest in preserving the power you know, that these individual rulers had than in perpetuating a real spiritual understanding among their, um, their uh, populace, among their the people's the subjects in their kingdoms. Um, so that would, that would be, I think, a good, you know, a good example. It was not uncommon for people to be vivisected. What is that? Vivisected was a custom of taking an individual out in front of the, uh, the crowd in the court square uh, the market square, I should say, the market square, and cutting them open uh, while they were conscious and alive um, so people could see their, in, their inners, as they would say, um, and sometimes even pulling their entrails out, um, drawing and quartering people, uh, where you would tie each limb to a horse, and then you would hit all four horses, and they would run in four different directions, and they would just literally tear the person, uh, as they say, from limb to limb. Um, it was not of common to break people on the wheel, which meant you would strap someone to a wheel and strap them so that you would break their bones around the wheel, because you strapped them, of course, backwards. Um, burning people alive was, uh, was popular torturing people um, uh, before the crowd was very popular. It was seen as entertainment. This was something that was not customary among the Moors by any way, shape, or form. People were executed in public squares for crimes, but generally they were swift. Executioner came out with a sword, took the head off, and everybody went home. The idea of doing these kind of things before, as Joseph McCabe says, another historian, before delighted crowds um, was quite um, brutal. And this was done for, again, attacks, uh, whether they were imagined or otherwise, on theology, theological issues. Someone would disagree with a cleric and could find themselves being tortured alive. Um, that was not the custom among the Muslim rulers of Spain. People had differences of opinion all the time, theologically. But to be tortured and vivisected in a market square was not um, uh, an acceptable practice 
among those in authority. You did have situations at times where, for political reasons, there were some Moors who were um, uh, exiled, forced to leave, because their politics differed. So they'd be told, look, you know, we don't want you here. You've got to go move to another kingdom, or you have to go into Africa. That even happened to um, Averroes, to Ibn, Ibn Rushdi, for a while. So that could happen. You know, I don't mean to paint a picture of the Moors as not having a society which had its problems, but compared to Christian Europe, it was paradise. Now, while we own it, I think it, it's uh, uh, important for one to kind of understand the political structure of Europe at the time, where these kinds of, of laws or punishment for laws mm -hmm. were. Um, were possible um, in terms of how the common people live, the social structure uh, that okay, rendered I think I, life in these well, it, stratas, the, feudalism, stuff like that. The structure was, was based upon strength, military strength, power. And it goes back to the issue of resources being limited. Limited resources meant that one had to be strong and have enough military capability to protect the few resources that they had. So you have a system that develops, serfdom, the knights, the lords, um, all nations, probably I think it's safe to say, or the vast majority of nations, has some sort of regal element, some sort of royalty in its structure. It was true then even of, of Catholic Europe. The idea of having a serf on the land, and a serf was someone who was a peasant who was required to remain on the land. He or she could not leave the land without some real special conditions and circumstances. The person who owned the land, the lord of the manor, or the duke, or the count, or whomever. How did that structure go, lord, duke, count? What made well, the, what made the structure was, again, the need to partition the land uh, and the kingdoms. And it came down to who was most closely related to the king, uh, or who was most closely connected to the initial power that had secured control of the territory. Um, you know, dukes and, and duchesses controlled um, duchies, which was a particular parcel of, king, of the kingdom and land. Um, counts as well, or countesses, controlled a particular portion of the land. The thing is that we, we also need to be mindful that the structure, how much land, how little land, um, differed, again, depending upon what kingdom, what country it was. The territories that the Moors would take control of um, had large numbers of peasants or serfs whose treatment was very poor, whose life was very brutish, whose access to power was limited by their birth, right? You could not escape, so to speak, being a serf. You weren't going to go from a serf to a duke. You weren't going to go from a serf to a king. You would not go to the higher levels of power if you were born into that caste, so to speak. This is why when the Moors come in, when the Muslim population arrives, the Moors, who also come from a large number of common folk, common folk who also are related to royalty, royalty chooses from among the common folk individuals who will be um, uh, courtiers or wives. And as a result, the royalty and the common man have merged 
and if you, if you will, the power is being spread around. So you always had access, or the, the, I should say always, there was always the possibility of one having access to the upper levels of power because the emphasis was on your um, value spiritually, your value intellectually. What did you have to offer? And this is something which will occur later in Europe. Right? When we see the rise of the mercantile class and the rise of the, you know, the, the, the academics then moving into upper echelons of power. Right? But this also happens to occur after Moorish presence. So it is a reasonable assumption to say that this structure of beginning to give people access to power on the basis of their skills is something that appears to have a lot to do with this contact with the, with the Moorish world. With the, with the Eastern world. Um, to be able to uh, be a slave and then be chosen as the wife of the emir or the wife of the caliph or the wife of the day or the wife of the bey and then the child ends up being royalty and it then elevates the status of the mother who was enslaved is pretty profound. And even when... when the, we look even at the names that people have, um, you know, Abdul Walid, the slave of Walid, um, you know, Abu al Walid ibn Muhammad ibn Rushdi. The names are actually telling you that the person is descendant of someone who was a servant or a slave. So, in other words, there was not the stigma attached to somebody being descendant of a servant or a slave because it was just part of the process. Because you're also descendant of someone who is not. Holistic. It's much more holistic. It's overall, it's like, this was the entirety of who I am. And that access appealed to the European Catholic communities, typically, who saw this as a way of elevating their status. That's why many of them converted to uh, Islam because it resulted in improving their condition, um, uh, not only among you know, Muslims, but ultimately among their own. Because now they had access to things they didn't have access to before, whether it was education, or um, whether it was a trade, um, or a combination of, of both. That then benefited them, and they didn't customarily have access to that under the, the feudal, feudal system the serfdom that existed. And I mentioned before the, uh, the evil usages that had dominated and abused them. Where, you know, a peasant couldn't pay a fee to be, or a serf couldn't pay a financial fee uh, to be exonerated because they had no wealth, they had no money. So they could be taken advantage of by those who were in positions of power. Um, there was something called, um, well, it's referred to as first night. I don't know if you've heard of this custom, but um, it was understood that uh, the lord of a manor actually had the right to the wife of a serf or a peasant on the land before he did. So situations like that which indicate the level of disrespect for the humanity of the people who occupy the territory it's very different from the Moors setup. There was nothing in Islamic tradition, no way, no, no way, no how, that would have justified that sort of action. And this was the credo, or the creed that had dominated. There's nothing within Christian tradition that justified it either. But the corruption of the Christian tradition had gotten so bad that it had degenerated into people thinking that that was their right. Because what dominated was not the teachings of Christ, what dominated was the strength of one's arm and the swiftness of one's broadsword. That's what governed, really, Western Europe. Why? Because of limited resources. Again, the issue of needing, this, seemingly thinking that this needed to be in place in order to survive. Now, in terms of understanding this political and religious structure, what was the role of the church then, and what was the role of the political structure, the king, the duke, etc. How did they interact? Well, the church and the king or queen were married, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, the authority of the 
various rulers, whether they were kings, queens, princes, princesses, duchesses, Dutch, uh, dukes, duchesses, what have you, was hinged uh, on the church, the Catholic Church. Because the greater, the greater power in Europe was, of course, the church. The central power of Christian, the Christian West was the Catholic Church. And it had to do with the fact that the church had the greatest military power in terms of being able to muster military might and support. The Catholic Church, um, because it had so much military power associated with it, could govern areas. That's how, as I, when I mentioned the Albigensian or Cather uh, crusades against them, that was initiated by a Catholic pope whose military was greater than the military of his opposition. Um, and of course, Catholicism's, at the time, its agenda was to, of course, increase its power as it moved into other parts of the, the kingdoms of Europe. That um, success is what allowed it to subdue its enemies and its opposition and to consolidate its power as it went. So when you say what was the, the relationship, the political structure for the most part was the church. The political structure of, of Western Europe was the church. That was the central power. And those who opposed it or who tried to oppose it would customarily find themselves in, in trouble, such as the Albigensians, uh, such as um, uh, Alfonso X at certain points when he opted to go against the wishes of the, the church authority, the pope's authority, in order to benefit his own individual Catholic Castilian kingdom. They didn't want him to do that. They said, you're threatening our power by allowing these Muslims to exist and allowing your subjects to study them, to study amongst, I should say, study amongst them, this is a threat. That's why the Mozarabs were a threat. That group that had maintained its Catholicism, its Christianity, but was aligning itself culturally with the Muslim African population of the Moors. So was there one king, did the, the did the Pope appoint the king, uh, uh, or were there many kings? How did, I'm just trying to get a deeper There were many kings, there many kings. Many. Are you talking about for, for Europe overall? Yeah, but all of them felt under the control of the church? The vast majority of the kings of Western Europe, historically, in the medieval period, would have had or would have done better to have secured the support of the Catholic Church, which was centered in the Vatican, okay, in Rome. So if you were a Christian and you were a ruler, you would do well to have gotten the sanction of Rome. If you did not, then your status was very shaky. You had a very precarious position um, because you were in territory, the Holy Roman Empire, which was what emerged after the old Roman Empire fell. And its borders extended through to about the border of what we consider now Eastern Europe then Eastern Europe fell under the Byzantine Empire, the Greek Orthodox Church. Believe it or not, both, even though they were Christians, fought crusades against each other. Now, let me, be more, let me phrase that better. The Catholic Church launched a crusade against the Greek Orthodox Church and stole many of the artifacts and carried them back to Rome. Mm -hmm. um, now the Greek Orthodox Church was in what area? Is in what is now, well, the Byzantine Empire, Constantinople, which is now Istanbul in Turkey. Mm -hmm. um, 
that territory prior to Islam's establishment um, was part of the old Greek Orthodox, the Byzantine Church. And, excuse me, it would later fall to um, the Ottoman Turks uh, some centuries later. But the presence of the Greek, or I should say the interest in the Roman Catholic Church taking control of the Greek Orthodox territory had to do again with resources and power. So the bottom line very often was political um, driven by economic interests. What we're doing this because we want that territory to increase our wealth. We want that territory to increase our, our financial power so that we can then expand our territory even more to acquire more resources to improve our condition here in, in Europe. Um, now why, you know, there's a, the, some people have asked the question, um, I know Diop has raised it as well, Michael Bradley has raised it. This idea of needing to consume territory and really control it, lock, stock, and barrel, in some people's minds is seen as a kind of sickness. Because what happens is you have a condition where enough is never reached. One never has enough. It's like we have to continue to suppress and oppress the opposition to make sure that we have more than enough because we're used to having less than enough. So it's, it, it creates sickness of material acquisition. It's like we're driven simply by material acquisition, material goods. We are not concerned really about spiritual things. And I think it's safe to say that that manifestation is quite apparent in the history of Europe, particularly when you contrast the Moorish period with what comes afterwards, with the rise of the enslavement trade, where people are now considered as objects and not humans. The Moors practiced slavery. Other African peoples practiced slavery. But it was not a slavery that had people think the person was no longer human. Their labor was owned but their bodies were still understood still to be human beings. The idea of having the West intellectually being able to create a whole different category that dehumanizes people has a lot to do, I think, with this sickness of greed growing out of a lack of resources. And it just, it, it, it spiraled out of, out of control. Um, and like I said, the result is the asiento, or the contracting for slaves. The result is the contention that Africans are not human. Um, you know, the result is the contention that African peoples um, don't need to be recognized as being people who have a culture, but simply as objects or property like you would consider cattle. That is unique. And the, the preparation for that grows out of um, this period of Europe's um, ascension under Moorish domination. And that's kind of what is, is kind of the, um, how do you say, the, the irony, that the Moors would actually play a role in improving the conditions of Europeans, Catholic Europe, and then that information, that knowledge would be used against the Africans themselves. That's what I want to talk about next in terms of this uh, impact that the Moors had uh, looking at it uh, educationally, looking at uh, what they brought in terms of structure, what did they bring um, educationally, um, and so forth, and how that ultimately uh, empowered the Europeans to then um, have enough power to overthrow the Moors and who and uh, you know the kind of movement that led to that. 
um, uh, period there. Uh, some of the walls who were the primary um, uh, strength behind those walls. Hmm. Well, I'm just jotting down here a few of the things that are coming to my, to my mind. Um, well, if you create a condition where European peoples can come into a madrasa or come to schools in Cordoba, Granada, Seville, I mentioned already the different, um, excuse me, some of the different famous European early scientists and thinkers who came in. I've talked about Michael Scottis, um, Roger Bacon, Adelaide at that. Roger Bacon, who produces a gunpowder using um, a saltpeter, and um, the chemical compound that he uses, he gets from the Moors and the Arabs. Um, the Latin sails that are introduced to the, sh to the sailing ships are brought in from Northwest Africa and from East Africa. Mm -hmm. So the, the design of the sails for the shipping is influenced by the by the uh, the Islamic world by the Moors. But what impact did that have? Well, it allowed Europeans then to extend their boundaries across water. Um, the European Catholic world emphasizes the development of military technology, and this is very very important because when people talk about, for example, the existence of firearms or guns or the arquebus. Africans and Chinese knew about gunpowder and they used it. Chinese used rockets centuries before. There's evidence that the Egyptians even had knowledge of gunpowder. But the use of gunpowder and fire sticks, as it's sometimes called, the guns, is something that existed in Africa. The Moors, the Berbers had guns. The difference is that they didn't mass produce them. The difference is that they didn't see the benefit of putting an emphasis technologically on the development of weaponry. And I think it stems from a different mindset, different worldview. The European world, again, has less resources. It's more xenophobic. They recognize that the way to improve the condition is to take somebody else's resources and to be able to do it and secure it. We were covering the areas of the, the uh, Moorish impact on Spain. Right. But I was, what actually, I, what I was, I had just finished talking about the European emphasis upon military technology. Yeah. So okay. if you would begin where you, you, you started that. Okay. What I was essentially pointing out is that the Moors contributed to Europe's own ascension, politically, economically, uh, socially, uh, certainly militarily. And it was because the Moors having introduced, in an organized fashion, schools which were teaching chemistry, schools which were teaching uh, architecture, schools which were teaching cartography and geography, schools which were teaching medical science, maritime and medical science. All these things were impacting upon Europe's own improvements. The health of Europe improved because people now understood better the need for things like bathing. People understood better what caused or contributed to, to disease and sickness, those who were paying attention. People then understood uh, better the structure of the world and the, the various routes, trade routes, that would allow for the increase of wealth. When you talk about the Venetian states and the, 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 the states of Genoa, the Genoese, um, you have these groups and Prince Henry, the navigator of Portugal, who are utilizing the cartographical and navigational information that is provided by the Muslims, by the Moors. It's not a surprise then when we see early Portuguese sailors, early Portuguese ships uh, being uh, Moors, as in Moorish sailors, or being uh, uh, led by uh, Moors who were navigators. 
the Moors are contributing to this. Some of them are contributing now as Catholics because they had converted, known as Moriscos. Um, it's no surprise that even on, the, on Christopher Columbus's ship, there are Moors who are, the, who are navigators. Um, there are Moors who are translators. Um, Rodrigo de Exieres uh, is one who was on Columbus's ship. Um, they're playing a role in helping to guide the Portuguese and the Spanish into different parts of Africa for trade acquiring wealth and bringing that wealth then back, of course, to the, to the home country, the metropole. Um, the emphasis upon military technology, the finest steel comes from Toledo. The steel making is a result of the metallurgical skill of the Moors, who as master metallurgists had introduced that science into Spain. And so the Spanish Catholics inherit that. So the steel that they use to make these swords is considered um, unmatched. And people, everybody wants to get, you know, the Toledo steel. The emphasis upon cannons that are then placed upon the ships are recognized as a means to do what? To extend your military power beyond your own borders. You not only want to go over to somebody else's place and to trade, you want to go over and force them to give up the goods at gunpoint, so to speak. And then you need to create a more sophisticated arsenal to defend the goods that you're bringing back from others who want your goods. Now, one of the fascinating aspects of this whole historical era is that the Spanish and the Portuguese are the first to emerge as the greatest powers of Europe. They're the first. That's why they're the first ones to conquer the Americas. Spain and Portugal dominate in the Americas. It's not an accident. It's the result of having acquired the most that the Moorish presence could give in navigation, in shipbuilding, in medicine, in the various technologies that are used to um, develop an army and to explore. What happens? After the Spanish and the Portuguese emerge as the greatest powers, they are now, as they say, the kings of the hill, and the other European powers want to knock them off the hill. So what, does, what do countries like England do? They create a uh, navy privateers, sanctioned by the rulers of England, to attack Spanish ships. So what they do is say, well, you bring the goodies, and then we'll take them from you. And so they then develop this focus upon going after the Spanish ships, the Spanish galleons, and stealing the wealth that the Spanish have now secured from the Americas and from Africa. Um, and this ultimately, of course, is seen as contributing to the ascension of Europe's own power. Uh, and ironically, it's the result of the tutelage, having been tutored, under the Moors. Uh, and it's one of the strange twists of fate that, you know, the areas of, of shipping and, and, you know, military technology uh, are directly related to what is acquired from the Moors, who had given them the ability to do these things. And they turned around and used it to then subdue the Moors themselves. Um, most of the Moors end up going back into, of course, Africa and settling in places like uh, Sali um, and Suta. Others, which is in modern-day Morocco, Others are invited to go into other European countries, believe it or not. Um, many go to, to France, um, end up part of the Huguenots, the Huguenot Protestant movement, which then finds people settling in South Carolina, French Huguenots, who are actually descendants of Moors and Frenchmen. 
um, it's fascinating. And that's why if you look at some of the early French um, settlers in the Carolinas, people always talk about how dark they were in complexion because they were descendants of these, these Moors. I went through the records in South Carolina, Charleston, and found people with names like Moreau Saracen, who were French Huguenots. Well, the name Moreau is Moor, and Saracen is a Saracen or a Moor. So the name is telling you. Um, court records, which have um, references to French Huguenots being thought to be Negro Negroes because they were dark, and they would insist that they were French and didn't want to be classified as Negroes because they knew what that meant if they were classified as Negroes. So I'm French, and they were French, but they were also avoiding the designation of, of Negro. But those Moors who uh, had assisted in this process of helping Catholic Europe to expand its territory, to secure and conquer more territory, uh, are often overlooked. The fact that you know we we need to recognize that we aided our own oppressors in this in this period, not consciously so much in most cases, but just a natural consequence of having shared knowledge. And it goes back to what I said before. People who are insidious, people who are calculating, more calculating in terms of, you know, I'll do whatever I need to, to maintain power, are the ones that will sparingly give knowledge. Because they know ultimately down the road this could be used against me. But it's the man or woman of God, so to speak, who says, this knowledge is meant to be shared. It's for the greater good of the, the ascension of the soul, the spirit. It's for the greater good of, of God. I'm going to share it. What you do with it is up to you. Sadly, many Europeans chose to do negative things with it, which was to then subdue, oppress brutally other peoples who they saw as inferior to themselves and tried to justify it with the development of a whole intellectual tradition of you know, justifying your your um, brutality against someone else. I wanted to go back to the period of, um, of the Moors um, um, bringing the high culture before uh, they were um, uh, defeated uh, in Spain and look at the movement that galvanized Europeans and who that movement was, what that period was, and how they uh, were able to uh, ultimately bring the force against the Moors at once? The collapse of Moorish control in Europe has everything to do with, again, this kind of naivete around the dissemination of knowledge. The fact, again, that the Moors were for the most part just sharing the knowledge, sharing the knowledge, while an oligarchy of Catholic rulers were increasingly limiting who would have access to the knowledge, and were increasingly eliminating their enemies, people who opposed them. Um, the first indication of the Catholic European uh, effort to stop the Moorish invasion into Europe is typically credited to Charles the Hammer, Martel, who defeats the Moors at Tours in France and prevents them and other Muslims from going further up into Europe and securing control. Now, what's called the Reconquista, the Reconquista. That's around 14. No, that's, the, that's actually in the 8th century. That's 1730s. I think it's 1732 or 1752. I have to excuse me, I don't remember the exact date. But it's the 8th century. When Charles Martel stops that Moorish invasion, that's often seen as a, as a high watermark in turning around the encroachment of the infidel into Catholic Europe. Although Joseph McCabe and several other historians would make the contention that Europe probably would have been more civilized if they had extended further into Western Europe than Tours, if, if Martel had been defeated. The idea of the Reconquista begins at the very beginning because the oligarchy, 
meaning the, the, the elite leadership, which are customarily uh, attached to the church, are trying to consolidate their power to push the Moors out from the very beginning. And the Reconquista then continues, and over the course of centuries, different Catholic rulers are trying to push the Moors further and further back towards the sea and back out of the country, back across the Straits of, of Gibraltar. And they are assisted in this process by the Moors themselves, who increasingly, as uh, uh, James um, Monroe, uh, excuse me, Joseph Callahan, historian said, they are essentially trading virtues for Spanish vices. What he was saying, and what others are saying, in fact, no, excuse me, it was Monroe. I was right the first time. Historian uh, Dr. Monroe from Berkeley made that contention about trading Moorish virtues for Spanish vices. The idea that over the course of time, the Moors become less concerned with maintaining a fervent um, uh, spiritual. spiritual, right, thank you, uh, spiritual and, and ethical um, society, and are more concerned now about living luxuriously, because now, you know, the saying is good to be the king, right? That attitude of now being in a position of power, and, and in fact, um, there are historians, Arabic and Muslim historians, who say that this is part of the process, this is part of the evolution, or maybe you should say the, the de-evolution, the devolution of humanity. There's a period where there's, you know, people are fervent in maintaining their ideals, and they go through that. Then customarily they kind of rest on their laurels, and they get lazy, and then they get into luxury, and then they have to be replaced by fresh blood, which goes back to the beginning and tries to rejuvenate. Well, this essentially is what happens and the period of what's called the typhus, or the party kings. Uh, I don't mean party as in party, you know, maybe a, a little bit too much of that was going on too. But the party kings, the, the, these little individual Moorish rulers throughout the country who are serving their own self-interest and are not looking at the big picture. You know, it's like a bunch of gangs fighting each other, not realizing that um, somebody outside has essentially decided to get control of the whole territory. So they've learned how to play one off the other so that they can destroy each other, and ultimately then they'll just step in when the smoke is cleared. That's what begins to, to happen. And as a result, the fragmentation within the Moorish political and social structure allows for the increase of Catholic Spanish power which increasingly consolidates itself and eventually pushes the Moors out of Cordoba, which was seen as the capital for Moorish Spain. And that was done in the, in the 13th century. And then that signals really um, both a, a, a symbolic defeat as well as a practical defeat of the Moorish presence. And it's not long after, you know, by the 15th century, that Granada, the last Moorish kingdom in Spain, falls. And Ferdinand and Isabella, who have just united the two kingdoms of Castile and Aragon against uh, the Moorish presence, against the, the Moors in their country, and then proceed to push the Moors out of the country altogether. Although millions remain, but they get rid of uh, quite a few. They force about, about a million and a half to leave. Now, in terms of um, Italy and uh, uh, areas that the Moors uh, occupy, uh, even to this day, have the imprint of the Moors. So if you would kind of talk about that and even some of the remnants of the structural castles and things, uh, um, uh, were there castles all over Europe before the Moors began to build? If you kind of talk about that Moorish impact. Well, there are, excuse me, there are 
castles all over Europe um, before. I mean, people have been building stone structures to defend their territory. A landlord or a knight or, um, uh, would have both had an interest in securing control of whatever parcel of land they had by setting up a castle, a fortification in which they could live and in which they could sustain um, themselves against siege for long periods of time. That is something which was going on um, before the Moors arrived. Now, you know, in terms of, again, each country would have a different situation. In the case of, you know, like you said, Italy or Spain or Portugal, the Moors had built various structures. The most prominent is the Alhambra, which is in Granada, which is a walled city, um, which uh, sets an example for other Catholic uh, authorities, other European authorities and rulers, as to how to set up um, a fortification that they can defend against attack and be able to um, protect resources again. Uh, many of the structures throughout Moorish Spain, of course, are built by Moors. Um, I use the reference of the Alhambra as one. Uh, in terms of what specific buildings throughout the country, there are many. I couldn't even uh, begin to say how many. Uh, but of course, since you have a population that is Moorish and European, uh, both are involved in the process of building it, building whatever structures, whatever castles or whatever um, uh, haciendas, whatever palaces, or palacios or whatever, which are throughout the country. Uh, they influence architecture tremendously. And it should be said that what we consider to be Spanish architecture uh, with the arches and so forth and building um, homes where you have a courtyard within the arches on both sides and the, the walkways underneath, that's classically Moorish uh, or Moresque. So anytime you see those, you're looking at um, an aspect of architecture that is directly related to the Moors. Also having geometric shapes and mosaics carved into the various buildings is classically Moorish as well. So that's just throughout the, 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 the countries, in whichever, whether it's Spain, Portugal, or in, in, as well in, in parts of, of Italy and Sicily. Now, in, in terms of the people and the imprint uh, of the Moors even to this day, if you talk about Sicily, would would there still be uh, that Moorish imprint? Uh, yes. Now, of course, it can be said that the Moors are, again, not the first Africans to come into Sicily. They're not the first Africans to go into southern Italy or Crete or um, Greece. Um, the reality is that Africans have been coming up into the southern parts of Europe for thousands of years. And consequently, the people in that part of the world tend to be darker in hue. Uh, it is true, however, that the last infusion of African blood uh, that was sustained for hundreds of years took place under the Moors or the Saracens. And that is something which results in, obviously, people being darker in hue, having curlier hair. I think of the Tortoro brothers. If you've ever seen any of the Spike Lee films, John Tortoro and his brother, who was on, uh, uh, what is it, New York? What was it, Blue? Uh, I forget what it's called. It's a detective show, NYPD Blue, I guess it is. Um, yeah, and uh, a few other people have made comments, Spike Lee has made comments in various films, as I say, about the darkness of the Italian people. Um, there's a movie, um, True Romance, 
with Christian Slater and uh, 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 I forget the guy's, the guy's name. Um, oh, goodness gracious. He was an easy rider. Uh, I've forgotten his name now. But he's in the film, European-American actor. And uh, he's being interrogated, and he's, his life has been threatened by elements of the mafia. And incidentally, mafia is an island, I mean, it's a city in East Africa, um, uh, southern part of East Africa, near um, Zimbabwe, Mozambique. Um, but anyway, there's a guy who's in the mafia who's interviewing, uh, in, in, interrogating him, and he says, uh, uh, the, the, oh, I can't believe I forgot his name. I can see him. But anyway, he says to the to the to the mafioso, he says, um, you know, uh, he knows he's Italian. He says, you know, I love history. I just want to ask you something. He says, you know what? I read that stuff all the time, and I understand that the Moors, you know, black people were in Sicily, and he knows a guy Sicilian. He says, and they slept with everything that that every woman they could find. This is what he says. He says, and I. As a result, you know, a lot of you, you know, um, uh, uh, guineas, uh, you know, are half black, essentially. Something to this effect. And the guy laughs, and he says, yeah, you're right. And then he pulls out a gun, and of course, and he shoots him. But that's a very significant <laughs> scene, because it has him basically giving this little historical commentary in the film, in this popular film, and a lot of people missed it. Uh, they probably didn't know what the heck he was talking about, or if they did, they just pushed it out of their minds. But uh, I had an experience just the other day where I went to the gym, and a young lady came in looking very Middle Eastern, and she started talking to me and asking me questions about the machines that I was using. And then we just started talking, and she asked me who, you know, who I was and what I did, and I introduced myself, and she introduced herself. And I said that I taught history. She said, oh, what kind? I said, uh, I teach history of the Moors and surveys in African and African-American history. She said, oh, the Moors. She said, I know about the Moors. She says, I'm Sicilian. And I said, ah. She said, yes. I said, uh, Calabres. She said, yes, which is part of the region of Sicily. And she was very friendly. And immediately I knew what she meant when she's talking about the Moors. And then I've had other situations in the past where people who were Sicilian have said they have family members who look essentially like any black man you would see, to use their words, on the street. So there's that recognition. The problem is that our society, U.S. society, and most Western environments, environments do not welcome such a discourse. And people don't generally want to discuss it. And I can understand on one level because if a lot of us as African peoples don't know who we are and don't conduct ourselves in a noble fashion, who would want to acknowledge being related to us? Nobody wants to be related to someone who is a bumbling amnesiac. <laughs> and most of us, sadly, kind of represent that. It's been prescribed by the, in the education. It's been prescribed by the socialization. I, I understand that. But the bottom line is people don't generally want to acknowledge you as being related to them if you don't act as if you have some sense and some value. So I've had a very different experience as had my uncle, because we would speak of being Moors and Moorish rather than being Negroes or blacks, and in the case of today, and in the case of Negro, which was the term of his day when he was, uh, as I say, growing up in the 40s and 50s and early 60s. But um, very unique uh, uh, perspective often emerges when you confront European peoples or address European peoples about the history of the Moors in places like uh, Italy uh, and Sicily and, and Greece and Crete. 
uh, and of course in Spain, because southern Spain's the same thing. You find large numbers of people who clearly, you can see, have African traits. And the, and the, the legacy, the, the foundations of that trait, or those traits, are again in the Moorish presence. Because more recently, like I said, that was the last great sustained infusion of African blood. But African blood has been coming up into southern Europe for thousands of years. Why are we on that? Perhaps you can uh, uh, talk about and lay out for our viewing audience. Um, I know you don't have the pictures, but we'll include them later. Uh, how Europe really uh, was so impressed with being associated with, um, with being black, very much like uh, a lot of uh, uh, blacks, African Americans, uh, want to uh, be white today. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the best books. I mean, I would tell people to take a look at, too, is J.A. E. Rogers' uh, Nature Knows No Color Line. Now, there are various coats of arms, and uh, I don't know if you can get that, but various coats of arms here. Now, he put Negroes, of course, in coats of arms because the term Negro was the term that people were using in the 1920s and 30s. Um, when he was writing, and when this book came out uh, in the 50s, the term Negro was still the term of the day. But the most revealing thing to figure out what a Moor was is the images of these so-called Negroes are clearly African, and the names have the same root word, Moor. Morin, Morien, Moricard, um, Morberg, Morimont, Morin, Morin, Mornaur, Morini, Moringer, Mormand, Morel, Morlan, Morlot, okay, Moretti, Moro, Moreshi. We see these words for these, actually these words, these, these family names, which are clearly telling us that this word, more, was by early Europeans understood to mean an African person. Now, again, Europeans have sought very often, not all, but several European so-called scholars have sought to negate the Africanity of the Moors by claiming, believe it or not, that Shakespeare is responsible for misrepresenting the Moors as being black. Shakespeare, who's writing at the end of the 16th century, when he writes um, Othello. And here's someone who's writing in the 16th century, and these images of what a Moor represented go back to the 10th century, <laughs> go back to the 11th century, before Shakespeare was even a thought in anybody's mind. So you have people now trying to engage in what I call intellectual somersaults to try to explain um, why Moors existed in the European iconography and European heraldry as clearly African or Africoid or so-called black people. Now these are major families of, right. of Europe? These are major families of Europe. These are French, Italian, Spanish, and Polish families, some of the names that I just read, who are known to be of, of European, I mean of Moorish ancestry. And one of the ironies is that many of the, the names that are attached to um, these families are not even in countries that one would consider to be influenced by the Moors. Spain and Portugal, we, we, just, I mean, we understand the Moors occupied, I, I didn't say this before, I should say it now, the Moors occupied Spain, what becomes Spain and Portugal, for over 800 years. 
it is no shock then if we were to find a whole bunch of evidence of, of an African or Moorish presence in the coats of arms of Spain. Ironically, because Spain becomes so fanatically Catholic, the Spanish don't put as much of an emphasis on being descendants of Moors as certain Protestant countries because they were trying to separate themselves from that Moorish past ethnically, you see, because they are now trying to create something new. They're trying to be Catholic. And to be Catholic means you have to get rid of that connection to those infidel Moors. So they don't emphasize it as much. And what's interesting is, like I said, you find Moors in a lot of European families in countries like England. Mm. Okay, that's where the word Moor and Morris, other words, I keep saying the word, the name, Moor and Morrison come from. Moor, as in Roger Moore. Morrison, as in Jim. <laughs> Morrison. These names, which are in indicating to us that this Moorish presence existed. Books of heraldry or heraldic texts were established mostly by the royal families of Europe. Harold's College in London, which is established in the 14th century, for the purpose of keeping a record of one's origins, your family history, and you find all these Moors in these coats of arms. So what Europe is telling us is we descend from these people. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Schwartz, now he's not in, in England, he's in Austria, but once again you have a name which indicates the African presence. Schwarzenegger, meaning the black African, or the dark African, or the dark or the black farmer, or plowman, as someone once told me that Neger, believe it or not, actually meant at one time one who was, an, who was a, a farmer or into agriculture. But the primary meaning is African. And Schwartz obviously is telling us that the focus there should be on the Africanity, the very dark African, the black African. Um, the person uh, the person, the idea of having a uh, heraldic tradition to place persons of Moorish ancestry in the coats of arms is telling us that here was a time that Europe reveled in its Africanity. Here is a time when Europe honored its African link. They were telling you, as I, as I often said, we see value in our Moorish past, and we know that the Moors were Africans. We do not put gorillas in our coats of arms and say that these are the people we descend from. Just for people who may not realize the importance of coats of arms, just, just insert that and continue, please. Coats of arms are the symbolic representations for your family name. Whatever your surname is, you customarily have a coat of arms, at least within the Western tradition, within the Western or European tradition. And the coat of arms that we'll have, it's just as I, what I just showed earlier, are coats of arms. So you have coats of arms with Moors holding uh, swords, coats of arms with Moors with royal headbands, or diadems as they're called, have coats of arms with Moors wearing crowns, which meant that they were of royalty, have coats of arms with moors uh, above uh, certain types of trees, uh, the tree being symbolic of some sort of uh, uh, region from which they came or something that involved their, uh, their vocation. Uh, coats of arms with moors holding uh, arrows or holding a crossbow or anything but, the, but customarily, you'll find them, again, wearing crowns or wearing the royal diadems, the headbands, uh, indicating their, their regal ancestry, regal links. They're telling us that this is who we descend from. That's what a coat of arm is doing. They're saying, this is our origin. This is the origin of my family 
is the origin of my family name. I am John Moore. You look at my coat of arms, I am of the Moors from Manchester, the Moors of, uh, if it's in Ireland, of County Cork, or the Moors of uh, whatever region, of Nottingham, whatever the case may be. And then you look at the coat of arms, that's why Harold's College was set up, to be able to monitor and a catalog where your ancestry begins. But keep in mind, this was what was emphasized for those who were considered the elites, the royalty. So what we're seeing also was that this royal connection to the Moors is also apparent. Now, some coats of arms contain Moors who are bound, tied up. It meant that these were people who were slave traders. Sir John Hawkins has in his coat of arms a Moor who's tied up. He got that coat of arms. He wasn't royalty. He became associated with the power. He becomes Sir John Hawkins. He's knighted because of his dutiful work for the queen in attacking Spanish slave ships and taking um, that stop, right? Well, I guess he was knighted for. Right. Sir John Hawkins has a coat of arms with a Moor who's bound, meaning he was a slave trader. Symbolism, the symbols of what the person, what the person was. So he's given during his lifetime that coat of arms. You see? So the coat of arms for the Hawkins family that descends from John Hawkins has the bound more. But people, of course, in the same period that he was living in the 16th and 17th century, would have also have had coats of arms that were 200 or more years old, who had mores in them, which told you that that was their ancestral beginning, but who then at that point looked like Queen Elizabeth. In other words, they were telling you where their, uh, excuse me, they were telling you where their namesake, their surname, originated. They were telling you what their great, 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 great granddaddy or grandmother looked like or was. And there's a debate that sometimes goes on, and there was an article not too long ago in the American Historical uh, Association newsletter, a debate about who is black, what is meant by black in the European mind, because many European historians and many Europeans are fully aware of their ancestral connection to African people, but they would never say they were black, and no one in the community would recognize them as black. They're French, they're English. They're German, they're Dutch, they're not black. Even though you say, well, yeah, but your great, 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 great grandmother was black. But fine, they were black. Or they were African. I am Dutch. So you deny you have African ancestry? No. I'm just denying that when you try to put me in the category of black in 1999, it doesn't apply because I'm a part of this nation called Holland, so I'm Dutch. I'm a part of this nation called France, so I'm French. The greater emphasis historically in the European world was on class. What was your class status? They would attack you for your class. They wouldn't attack you for being descendant of Africans. How could they? If people go to the coat of arms and find all these Africans in the coat of arms and the person now looks like um, you know, Peter O'Toole, and they're of royal ancestry, they're not going to attack somebody. They couldn't just they couldn't rationally attack somebody for being of African ancestry. They could attack you for your class. You're a low life. You're of low birth. Look at Alexander Dumas. 
Dumas who wrote um, Three Musketeers and The Man in the Iron Mask and The Count of Monte Cristo. Dumas is of African-Caribbean ancestry, but he was French. Um, Pushkin, Alexander Pushkin, who was also of African ancestry, he was Russian and African and chose to emphasize his Africanity. Dumas chose to emphasize his Frenchness. Now, a lot of people don't know who Pushkin was. Pushkin was, is considered Russia's greatest poet. One of the greatest poets. And he also is the father of Russian literature. Right. He's considered the father of, of you know, modern day or contemporary Russian literature. That's right. So Europe was more concerned about class than it was issues of race. Um, and in fact, uh, I, there's a section from the image of the black in Western art which is an excellent uh, book put out by me, Harvard University Press. Um, and, you know, to, to get a copy of this, I think, would be wise for anyone. They, they tend to be somewhat expensive, but, of course, that's usually how it goes with anything that has any value. But if we look, here's just examples of, of um, coats of arms with Moore's uh, in them, let me see if I can find a, a good manifestation, re a representation that's in color. But you have um, you have a more. Let's use this one. A more's in these. Coats of arms. Here, here, and here. And then you have also other representations here on this side as well. And these armorial, armorial as in armor, armorial bearings appear uh, as early as the 11th century in Western Europe among what are considered the great families. That's profound. Among the great families of Western, Europe. of Western Europe, they have these moors in them. Images often appearing in you know, a totemic, uh, and yet when I talked about places you wouldn't expect to find moors, Cologne, which is in Germany, according to the, the image of the black and Western art text, Cologne played, it says, an important part in mid the mid-14th century and in bringing about the acceptance of the fashion of putting the black moor in heraldry. Okay. It says, prior to this fashion, excuse me, prior to this, the fashion was rare, but it becomes common within a well-defined geographic area. And these are the areas. It says, the initial zone extended from Lower Saxony to Bavaria. They relate to Bavaria, Schwabia, Austria, I want to thank you all very much for coming out and giving me an opportunity to share what I hope is is relevant and useful information. I, of course, begin by saying in my initial tradition, Islam. I also say Imhotep. And in the Arabic language, Assalamu Alaikum. As I stood in the back listening to the brother talking about the situation that we face now and how the the affairs, not only of this country, but the affairs of the world seem to be changing. And we have to essentially become more aware of what exactly is happening and where we should be going. I came in from West Virginia, and this past Saturday in West Virginia, there was a cross burning, which had never taken place in Morgantown, West Virginia, as strange as it may sound, this little 
little town with coal mines and a university. It never taken place before. And this cross was burned on the lawn of an African-American couple who had never done anything to anybody in the quote-unquote white or European community. And all of a sudden, people were all upset, and they came together and said, you know, we need to do something about this. And then people found out that this family had been being harassed for years. The mayor of the town is African American. And she became mayor about three years ago, and the, the purpose behind it was essentially to try to heal these wounds which other people always knew about. But evidently, white supremacist groups have decided, and I'm using their term, white supremacist groups, have been infiltrating this area for years. And in fact, many of them are moving out of the Ku Klux Klan and into more violent organizations, smaller units. So as I took all this in and said, well, you know, here I am in Morgantown, I didn't expect, of course, to uh, you know, avoid racism. I'd be a jackass if I thought I could avoid racism living in the United States. But I did understand that it wasn't so bad, but that things were changing. Well, I then go back to the history department, and I hear someone talking about a graduate student in the history department, European-American fellow, who was teaching some of his students that to use his terms again, blacks, and this is interesting, Slavic peoples are inherently inferior because they are not homo sapiens. Now, I started to ask myself, now, who does this sound like? If, if you know a little bit about the history of Germany, the rise of the Nazi party and so forth. The Germans created this fallacious notion of, of racial supremacy, defining themselves as Aryans, when in fact the Aryans are Iranians, but they leave that, they left that out. They're really talking about Nordic peoples when they talk about the Germans. But they developed this to justify their going into the Slavic countries of Eastern Europe in order to take over. Now, I thought that was interesting because usually, you know, people just kind of beat up on uh, quote unquote black folks. But this young man said Slavic peoples too. So I'm saying this, this is really getting interesting out here in terms of how the structure is, is changing. But then I also started to think to myself, I wonder how much this idiot knows about his own history. Because for me, my rationale for deciding to study the Moorish legacy and Moorish history was because I always felt that the best way to silence most Europeans, so-called white folks, was to hit them in the bloodline. And what I mean by that is, if you begin to spend any time studying your own history, I'm speaking now to a European, spend, your, spend any time studying your own Irish history, your own Scottish history, your own English history, your own Spanish history, your own Italian history, Calabria, anything in Europe, any culture in Europe can be traced to peoples outside of Europe. And one of the greatest influences, not only in blood, but in culture, in the sciences. One of the greatest influences was coming from people known by Europeans as the Moors. What I'd like to do now, if I can, is to get the slides. I brought some slides up, and I'll start in on the formal presentation. some of my experiences, and even doing the research on the Moors. Coming down here, I was talking to the, the brother, I forget a brother's name, hopefully he'll forgive me, um, brother who waited for, well, actually, we were trying to look, find each other for about 45 minutes. 
but I was telling him that when you know essentially the legacy of the Moors, the legacy of African people as it relates to European uh, history, European culture, a lot of Europeans will back off. In fact, most Europeans who are educated will back off. They'll even concede essentially, you know, who, or say, say, like, like, you know, we often say, say, you the man, you know, I, I, I can't say nothing to you because you, you woke up, obviously. Because you, you essentially, you know, telling them things that, well, now you tell me more than I want to know. On the plane coming in, I sat next to this European fellow who was asking me what, you know, what I did and so forth, and I told him. But then I started to uh, continue to talk. And then I went on and on. He said, the Moors, I don't know too much about the, thank you, buddy, too, too much about the Moors. I, just that they were, uh, uh, well, they were Muslims, right? I said, well, yeah, well, you know, the vast majority of them were Muslims, but they were also people of other uh, faiths. And uh, he says, well, that's interesting. I said, but you know, the Moors are also in Ireland. And then he started to kind of move around <laughs> in the seat because he had also equated the Moors with Spain and Spain only. So I said, no, actually, the, the Moors went up into Ireland in County Cork, in fact. I said, and there were even uh, continued attacks on the coast by Moorish corsairs as late as the 16th century. And a lot of these people intermarried with those Irishmen living in Ireland. I said, and you know, when you look at names like Moor, which is pretty obvious, you see it. Or Scottish or Irish names that have the MC on the front, whether it's Mick or Mac, that's a reference to the Moors. So MacDougall and, and MacConnell and McMarion and McMurray, etc. There's a reference to an African progenitor there. So the first slide I have up here is uh, from Alfonso X also known as El Sabio, or the wise one. He was a Catholic monarch, 13th century, who after about 500 years of a Moorish presence, and let me just say who the Moors were. The Moors invaded the Iberian Peninsula, and let me be specific, the Islamic era Moors, because there were Moors before there was the religion called Islam but the Islamic era Moors invaded the Iberian Peninsula in 711 of the Common Era. And they proceeded to transform the very nature of the environment. The Moors brought with them a postal system. The Moors brought with them an educational structure, which essentially is what the, the contemporary university is modeled after the teaching of secular and what we would was what we called secular as well as uh, holy or religious knowledge. The Moors brought with them their skills in, in metalwork, their skills in medical surgery and pharmacology. The Moors brought with them their skills in, in horsemanship. All these things which would later become part of Spain. All these things which would prepare Spain for leading the European world, unfortunately, in taking over so much of the world, because they were using the resources that the Moors had, had given them. But the Moors invade from Northwest Africa, and Alfonso X is one of the Catholic monarchs who recognizes that if we as Catholics, I'm talking now as Alfonso X, if we as Catholics are going to be able to deal with this Moorish presence, we have to study their stuff. We got to understand their sciences because we're losing people. There were people complaining as early as the 10th century about these uh, uh, so-called good Catholics no longer being able to speak Latin or even know anything about you know, Catholic liturgy. They're all going over to the Moorish camp. And the reason is because the Moors are the ones, as the doctors, who are actually engaging in some knowledgeable techniques in surgery and medicine. So, you know, what's the choice? You know, somebody tells you, say, I'm sick. One person says, well, you know, let me see. Uh, it could be that you have a blockage in an artery or something. Where is it? What you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. Blockage in an artery. Somebody told me up there it was because they're evil spirits. 
I need to go and pray or say 12 Hail Marys, which of course doesn't hurt if you're a Catholic, but it also makes some sense to go and get some real medical knowledge, uh, medical skill, medical help. And this was the problem. So they started losing people. Alfonso X then commissioned the translation of several Moorish texts, medical texts, mathematical texts, philosophical texts, religious texts, had them translated from uh, Arabic into the developing Spanish vernacular, meaning the Spanish language, as well as Latin and French, and had these books then distributed throughout the Catholic world. He was trying to bring the Catholic world, the Christian world of Europe, up to snuff with what the African Muslims had achieved. This is one of the pages from the chess book. Now I note this. People customarily are confused about the Moors in terms of the ethnicity. Many European histories treat the Moors as if they were Arabs who came directly out of the Arabian Peninsula. And we know that that isn't true. While it may be true that there are Arabs who have Moorish ancestry or Moors who have Arab ancestry, an Arab and a Moor are not synonymous. This particular page from El Sabio's chess book shows people sitting playing chess. Those are Moors. Because someone wears a turban, which appears to look like it should be uh, Arab in origin, doesn't make them an Arab any more than me wearing a French suit makes me a Frenchman. So we need to understand that when you look at something, you need to look beyond just the, the physical image and ask yourself, well, what was the history behind that era in order to understand it? This is one of the emperors of Morocco. This is uh, Ishmael. 16, uh, 1670, one of the emperors of Morocco who was known to have owned several Europeans as slaves. Now, a lot of people who are part of the African community or the African American community are often made to feel somewhat inferior because people say, well, you know, all you all ever did was descend from some slaves. And of course, you can believe that me being in West Virginia I've had a lot of students, a lot of European American students, who come in the classes, you know, expecting to hear about the history of African American enslavement and the history of European Americans being the masters. And of course, I come from another direction. I begin at the beginning. And I deal with the issue of even where the word slave came from. Then we go back to that Slavic thing again, right? See, remember homeboy early talking about you know, uh, the Slavic peoples being less than homo sapien. Well, yeah, some of the Germanic peoples thought so, and they had pressed them into servitude so much that their name became synonymous with servitude, hence slave. So when we look at the situation in its entirety, we recognize that no one has a monopoly on being enslaved. The only thing is, in recent, more recent history, African peoples were the most recently enslaved in mass. But when you have a long memory, you can remember something different and eliminate that notion of never having made any significant contribution to anything, always being a slave. Because when one thinks that they descend from slaves and that's their focus, they continue to act like slaves. Well, this is uh, backwards, but what that says is more. And it says it's from a collection of the Lehigh County Historical Society. You have Moors in the coats of arms. OK, I'll just explain where, that, where it's from. Moors in the coats of arms of European families. And here's what's significant. When you consider that the European world today tries to hide as much as possible about their African links, their connection to African people. It is nothing short of profound when you go and look at heraldic texts, texts which show the coats of arms, the symbols of European families, and in it you find you. It's obvious that they're saying 
there was a time when we wanted to show you off as part of the family. We wanted to show you off so much that we put it in books which would be passed down for posterity. We have coats of arms hanging up in our homes showing you, African man and African woman, Asiatic. They're letting you know the way things used to be. They're not afraid to say it. Morrison, son of a Moor, Morris. In fact, I just say I, a dear friend of mine passed away yesterday morning. His name was Lewis John Morris, also known as Skyman. He was, Nick, he was given that name essentially because he was, was working, building bridges between African Americans and Native Americans, and the Lakota people gave him the name Skyman. He passed away yesterday. So I said that I would dedicate uh, this lecture to him. But to find this legacy within European family coats of arms tells us that they obviously felt differently about us at some point. Otherwise, they wouldn't talk about us in a positive way. They wouldn't have us in the coats of arms. Now, what's intriguing is this. When I first started doing the research on the Moors, and I was looking at the presence of the Moors in European coats of arms, I found that the Moors, the term Moor and Moors was always noted in the description of European books published in Europe. But when the books were reprinted in the United States, they changed the term to Negro. So you would look up, you know, the Morrison coat of arms, and instead of seeing, you know, a Moor's head, you know, reefed about the temples, you would see a Negro's head wreathed about the temples. Now, that may not seem like a whole lot unless you understand the meaning of the word Negro, and unless you understand why these people were actually doing that. They were trying to disconnect the Moors from European history. But again, the, the phonetic sound of Moor was still there. It keeps coming up. Morrison, Moreau, Moore, Mordaunt, Morley, Morgan, and then some other names like Stuart and Halliburton, and Gleam, and Brokus, Zamoras, all these names, even Zangermeister, or Singmaster, and I heard someone else say Douglas, which is Celtic for behold the Moor, or behold the black-skinned man. This is more, it's okay, you don't have to turn Turn that around. I, I, you know. Basically, this is another armorial bearing coming from the, an English family, Moore. And this is from Fox Davies, The Art of Heraldry. Oh, that one needs to be turned around. <laughs> that one's uh, upside down. Uh, nature knows no color line. And he helps us really to understand, too, how once these coats of arms made their way into the European-American community, the change in the term to Negro is given. Now, look at the names, if I read off the names. Maurice, Mormon, Mormon, Mormon. More Kant, more Mortison, Moreau, Morel, Morelli, right? All these Moors, just more, 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 right? But then when you look at the bottom and look at the top, Negroes in coats of arms of noble families, French, Dutch, and Belgian families with names of Negro. Now, it is possible, it is possible, Rogers did that when he put it in. But given, the, in order to explain the people in the 1950s, who the people were, to say, you know, because at that time they were calling themselves Negroes. So you were Negro, so this more, you respond to Negro, you won't respond to more. That's what people, you know, that's what most people were in the 1950s. So that's possible. 
But I'm here to tell you that it's also true that people would change the term. European-American publishers would change the term. These are additional coats of arms from coats of arms showing Moors. There's one more there coming up out of a crown. Stuart, another Moorish sister wearing a crown. Uh, Brokus, a sister with bat wings coming out of her head. So which seems to suggest, I spoke to a, a colleague about that in terms of medieval symbol, seems to suggest that this was someone involved in some type of alchemy. You have someone on the, on the bottom here, uh, Stuart in the middle, Mason, the middle one with three, three faces. In fact, for the family name Mason, it says three Moors heads conjoined on one neck. And if one is wondering about the connection between Mason and Moor, you should continue to wonder because there is a connection. Halliburton on the end, who was the Moor with the helmet. This is Johannes Morris, who was one of the rulers of Sicily. Johannes Morris, one of the rulers of Sicily, 12th century. 12th century. The Moors were in Sicily until 957 and in Crete until about 1026. So when people start you know, recognizing, you see you know, some people who are Italian walking around and unless they open their mouth and told you they were Italian, you would say, well, you look just like you know, my uncle or my, my brother, you know, because of the Moorish presence. And not even just the Islamic era Moors, but even before that time. This is the Zangemeisters I was talking about. Zangemeister, a Singmaster. Good German family. Good German family whose ancestry is linked to a Moorish teacher of music who came to Berlin at the end of the 16th century and taught music. And he married a German woman. And the family then became known as the Zangermeisters or the Singmasters. And what, again, is interesting is, when I got this information, I went to the Lehigh County Historical Society to find any information of family histories and so forth. These were things that good German Americans were collecting and had you know, in their own family. So again, these are people who say, I recognize who y'all are, even if you don't recognize who you are. See, and we need, to rec we need to realize that, again, a lot of us, unfortunately, won't move until the European says move. That's why I say I like to hit them in the bloodline, because the point I'm making is, when we illustrate that the European academics and Europeans who are informed know your legacy, then some of us really start, to, you know what, I think maybe he's right. Because I heard him say it. I heard, that, heard this European American makes it. So I just lay it out, you know? This is Edouard Charlemagne, famous painting. He was an Austrian painter, went to Morocco in the 1870s and painted a Moorish chief standing in his abode, in his home. This is in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. It's a very uh, noble picture, very uh, captivating, in fact, when you go in and see it in the gallery. Again, the point of this is, and now I'll say a little bit about this issue of obfuscating the legacy of the Moors. If you go to most dictionaries and look up the word Moor, or if you go to someone who was a 
uh, historian, not necessarily the Moors, but a historian knows a little something about that, that uh, imaginary continent called the Middle East. It doesn't exist. There's a continent called Africa and Asia. There is no Middle East. Egypt is not in the Middle East. Egypt is in Africa. And the same is true for Morocco, Algiers, Libya, Tunis. So when we recognize again, you know, how the game is played, this played the semantic game, we're going to create illusory terms that have no meaning. But if we get you to buy them, then hey, it worked. But when you go to the dictionary and you look up the term more, usually it says somebody who was Berber or Arab. Or it may say uh, the Berber Arab peoples who once occupied Spain. So they limit the, the folks to Spain and they, they call them the Berber or Arab. Well, when you look up the term Berber, it refers to a language group, not an ethnic group. And as a close friend of mine, Aziz Latfi, who was a Moroccan, uh, who was here at, in school, I say here in the States, the temple, and a linguist. He said, brother, you know, no people in Morocco call themselves Berbers if they are speaking the language of their own people. And even the ones that have gotten Western education tend to back off of Berber because they know that it's a reference to a language group. They identify themselves by their ethnic designations. So whether you're talking about somebody saying that they are uh, Sanheja, or maybe even Haratin, or Azenega. They're pointing out, you know, this is the, the or Kashal, these are the groups that I'm a part of. I'm a Berber, I don't know what you're talking about. But to use that term is designed to create the illusion that Berbers don't have a connection to other African peoples. Because as, as Diop pointed out in his, in his text, like the African origin of civilization, Europeans introduced terms like Kafir. This group over here is Kafir, and that group is Hamitic, and that group is Semitic, and this group is Negroid, and that group is, is Hottentot, all kinds of terms to separate, to divide and conquer. And essentially, Berber, as it's used, has become used to refer to someone who is a light-complexioned African, who is probably more European in origin because that was one of the contentions that anthropologists tried to make in order to claim the Moorish Empire. These were light, these are uh, uh, basically, you know, swarthy-skinned Europeans. They weren't Africans. And of course, they also had to then make Ill illusory or imaginary distinctions between such people. So even though somebody was part of the same family, everybody in this village, all of us here are Sanheja. That's what we call ourselves. European anthropologist comes in and says, well, I see among you there are some Negroes. So now you, I, I don't see no Negroes. I see uh, Mahmoud and I see Fatima and I, I don't see, what are you talking about? But the idea was to start separating people up on the basis of complexion in order to give the illusion of their own uh, false superiority in numbers. Okay? This is, you know, this is deep. If you think about it, what's the benefit of having a particular uh, group go around the world, dividing everybody up into all little components and compartments, when just a couple of, of years ago or centuries ago, so you're all niggas, I, what are you talking about? Whether you're from India or whether you're from the Polynesian Islands or Africa, you're all the same people. But you only do that when you're in a position of military superiority, when you can hold on to that. But then later on, when you start to realize, you know, things are changing, we, gotta, we have to make this game a little bit more complex. So they start creating these illusions called races. And these illusions of so-called races of African peoples. On the left is someone who is Moorish by virtue of his name, 
his origin, but he is a Christian Moor. And he is a Christian Moor by the name of St. Maurice, or St. Moritz in German. St. Moritz was the patron saint of the Holy Roman Empire. So for all of us who came through any type of Catholic uh, background, and no, no one's talking about St. Moritz or St. Benedict the Moor. Or you know, if they talked about it, mentioned them, but they don't go into any details. Oh, yeah, the name of this church is, you know, St. Benedict the Moor. Okay. I'm trying, sister, I'm trying. <laughs> so St. Maurice, and this is interesting, his origins, his origins are actually in Egypt. Now, this is where we get into understanding this, this link. And I don't know if I get a chance to go over it all uh, tonight. This link, basically, between East Africa and West Africa that Diop essentially laid out, and laid out so well, when he says, you know, don't, don't forget, because folks are in West Africa, this doesn't mean that they have no connection to people in East Africa. When I would get into debates or discussions with Egyptologists, European Egyptologists, who would tell me, you know, I'm sick of hearing black Americans, I'm using their terms again, I'm sick of hearing black Americans talking about their links to the Egyptians. They came from West Africa. There's no connection. And then I said, well, what do you know about the history of, of you know, migration from East Africa to West Africa? Well, uh, I just know. I said, well, you, you, what do you know? And then usually they don't know anything. They're just, they're, oh, well, see, that's how you, people say you checkmate them. Because they don't expect you to come with a question that compels them typically to think, well, wait a minute now, I, this nigga knows more than I thought. And that's literally the expression. You're like, oh, my God. Well, uh, I'm Austrian, and there's uh, no connection to the Germans. Uh, we um, invented strudel, and they didn't. You know, you think I'm kidding, but that's, that's what somebody said to me. That was where they went. They were just, just flustered. Uh, well, you, the Austrians uh, uh, lost the respect that they should have gotten to the Germans. And I'm going, no, oh, wait a minute. Are the Germans and the Austrians both Europeans? Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, what I'm saying is, you are trying to argue that there's no correlation. I said, I'm not even going to get into the... To the, to the uh, the fact of the migration from east to west. Let me just look at it this way. East Africa contains African people. Egypt, which was much bigger at one time, which encompassed what we would call the Sudan and areas of Chad in the, in the eastern part of Africa. Egypt is right next to, and always been right next to, Ethiopia. Which, and Nubia, which you keep saying, there's this distinction between Nubia and Ethiopia, I mean, I mean in Egypt, and everybody knows the Nubians and the Egyptians were fighting each other. I said, well, because they fought each other didn't mean they were related, I mean that they weren't related. See, you're trying to, you're trying to take this issue of conflict and make it racial. We can disagree, I can disagree with my brother, but it doesn't mean my brother's no longer related to me. So when we consider that, I, just, I had to say a little bit about, about that issue with Egypt because, again, there is this, this attempt, like I say, to obfuscate the legacy, to confuse the, the legacy of African people. Saint Maurice was an Egyptian soldier who was part of the Roman legion around the second century of the Common Era. And what he did was that when he was... Uh, part of this legion and went into uh, what's now Switzerland and areas of Germany. He came across Germanic and Swiss peoples who had evidently come into contact with the Black Madonna, as it's called. And when he saw this and he was instructed to basically, you know, move these people who were, who were known as the Swabians, 
the Swabians or the Suevi, he said, I, I can't do that because these people are worshiping something. That's my stuff over there. And the Roman general told him, no, look, this is how it's done. You either eliminate this group or I eliminate you. And he refused. And so he was martyred. He was killed. And every 10th man in his unit was killed. So he was martyred, essentially, for refusing to kill Germans, this Germanic tribe. As a consequence, of course, they canonized him. They made him a saint. They made him a saint. Now, again, you know, these are things that don't tend to make it into the classroom in this country. And of course, it's by design. Knowledge is power. And as, as Dr. Karanga would say, we know ourselves by what we have done and do. If we are thinking that we've done nothing, we are nothing. And only humans make history. So if you have no history, you are not human. And essentially, the system operates from that position, and we know why. Let me just also say this, and I'll come back to this. We live in a republic, right? And you know, in a republic, if you look at the Roman Republic, there were three levels in the, in the system. There were citizens, slaves, and aliens. The question is, which are you within that structure? And that's determined by how much you know. That's determined by how much you know about yourself and how about how much you know about the system. That's just another representation of Saint Maurice, the Saint Maurice. This is another indication of a Moorish or African presence, if you will, within England. Part of the Norman, when you talk about the Normans invading England, among the Normans in the 11th century were African peoples, African knights. So much of the Western world's history is directly linked to African people. And of course, you know, if we think about this, given the fact that much of the history has been written by Europeans and from their perspective, many times we're given the terms Negro, Black, or maybe even color, but certainly Negro and black. If we are trying to do research, we go to a history text and we're looking, let me go to the index and look up Negro and black and find out what we did. And in the, in the pursuit of the knowledge of your past, you're going past Carthaginian, Moor, Egyptian, Phoenician, because of, hold on, Negroes? I'm looking for Negroes. Where are the Negroes in this book? because we've been conditioned to think that that's what we are. So as a result, we very often can't even find a knowledge of ourselves because we're using the wrong term to pursue it. That's why this is so important. This is from a German Bible of the 13th century, and that's the Queen of Sheba. We need, again, I say, to make, make sure we understand, like I say, the European historical record was clear on indicating the legacy of African, if you will, and Moorish people within its own cultural development. And when you go back and look at some of these, these early texts, you see evidence of that. But of course, the rise of the enslavement system required the need to hide the history or as I say, to alter or obfuscate it. You may have seen Charlotte Sophia von Mecklenburg. Well, Charlotte Sophia von Mecklenburg was the consort or the queen of England, the wife of King George II. And she was directly descendant of a Moorish woman who was of royal ancestry because Europeans were intermarrying, it shouldn't be surprising, Europeans were intermarrying with Moors and Africans, other African peoples. And we need to also understand that England, as early as the 16th century, 
established a relationship with the Moorish Empire through something called the Barbary Company, which was a trading company. And this trading company was providing England primarily with agricultural products that it needed, foodstuffs. And that relationship would go on for centuries. And sometimes it would be good, and sometimes it would be bad, depending on what was happening politically. That's Alexandro de Medici. The Medicis, somebody say it looks like Arthur Ashe. <laughs> Alexandro de Medici was the son of a pope. Seems to be a contradiction, right? I know popes were supposed to have sons. This is something about celibacy, I heard. But it was an, an immaculate conception. But Alexandro de Medici was the son of a pope and a Moorish or quote unquote Negro servant. And the Medicis were the ones responsible for the classical Greek renaissance that takes place in Europe. They're the patrons of learning. They're the ones that provide uh, so much you know, financial and uh, political support. Here is a Moroccan sisters from a postcard. She's got her baby on her back. This is a Moroccan sister also who was referred to as a Berber. Okay, now let me go back to what I was talking about before. She's a Berber. Okay? She's customarily what Western historians, when they talk about the Moorish legacy and influence, want you to focus in on. All the Moors descended from people who look like her. That's the illusion that people are trying to present. All more, the Moors were lighter in hue. I just showed you all these other coats of arms, all this information showing the Moors were of all complexions, but originally they were certainly quite dark in hue. So we're talking about shifting that paradigm, that image, to a lighter complexioned person just to feel comfortable again with themselves. Because you know we're a little bit closely related to her than we are to these Africans who are darker in complexion, these Moors who are darker in complexion, makes me feel more comfortable, like maybe there's more of us. Well, at the same time, now she's a Berber, okay, from this Moroccan tour book that I got this from, this sister is also referred to as a Berber. They're both Berbers. They're both Berbers. Right? This is also a group of Berbers. Look at the range. Now again, as Leo Africanus, also known as Azayati, said in the 16th century to the European world when he wrote his, his book about the, the history of Africa, he said, you know, the people in this part of the world are properly called Moors. That's what they res respond to when they come into the Western world. Now keep in mind, because of the contacts going on back and forth between the Northwest portion, the Western part of Africa, and Europe, if a Moorish person, or someone coming from within those boundaries, goes into the European world as a, world as a, tr as a trader, trading, or as a business person, or, or uh, maybe even in war as a, as a part of an of a, uh, army, if they learn the language, they're going to use language that the people in that area will respond to. And they're going to use a term which they know that the people in that area are going to recognize. If you saw someone who looked Japanese walking up the street and you said, well, are you Japanese? And I said, no, I'm uh, Shiyoti. So what? Uh, sh uh, oh, Shioki. Shioki. What? What is That's the name of the clan that I'm from. Well, where's the clan? It's in a village just outside of uh, uh, Toyotora. Well, where's Toyotora? Well, that's, it's, it's, it's in Japan. Oh, it's in Nippon. Well, Nippon, Nippon, where's Nippon? I don't, it's, it's, it's what, what are, and they play, oh, Japan, oh, I know what you're talking about. In other words, the Moors, the term Moor, was recognized as a general reference for anyone within 
the countries of North and West Africa as far south as about the Niger River. And then in the area below the Niger River, that was not seen as being a part and parcel of the Moorish Empire, at least under uh, Al-Mansur in the 16th century and other rulers who came afterwards. So when people from that region went into the Western world and if they were speaking English, they would say, I'm Moorish. If they were speaking Spanish, say, I'm Moros. If they were in France, they might say, I'm Mure. So what we need to understand is that the term was a general reference from anyone within that region. Just like we used to talk about Britain, right? Great Britain. Britain is made up of Scotsmen, Irishmen, Welshmen, and Englishmen. Someone, if they want, can reject being under British domination and say, I'm Irish and I want to have nothing to do with no London or the British. They can do that. But of course, the central government would say otherwise. No, whether you like it or not, you're under our authority. That's essentially what begins to happen also within the Moorish Empire. The fragmentation, the internecine conflicts that ensue. But it was understood by Europeans that people from that entire region could properly identify themselves as Moors in general, and then be more specific if they wanted. Could somebody be Wolof and Moorish at the same time? Yes. Could somebody be, um, as I mentioned before, Sanheja and Moorish at the same time? Yeah. It's a brother sitting in front of a shop. This is also from Morocco. This is a copy of a 14th, no, excuse me, 15th century text on medical surgery and the type of instruments that were to be used. Now, as I mentioned already, the Moorish presence within Europe results in the change of the whole structure, the establishment of universities at places like Toledo and Salamanca and Cordova and Granada and outside of Spain, I mentioned places like the University of Naples, whose curriculum and whose very founding was for the purpose of teaching Moorish medical knowledge. That was its function. That's why the, the school was founded. Oxford University in the 13th century had a teacher by the name of Adam de Marisco, who taught mathematics and astronomy. Now, if you see his name you know, on the faculty registry for Oxford, and you don't know what de Marisco means, oh, there's an Englishman teaching at the Oxford, oh, that is a strange name. But his name means Adam of the Moors. And it would not be unusual, of course, to find him teaching mathematics or astronomy in the 13th century. As I mentioned earlier, I think it was on the radio today, I talked about Al-Adrisi, a Moor from Suta, coastal city in, in Northwest Africa, who in 1154 produced a silver globe and a companion text showing the important zones of the world for trade. The purpose of this was so that merchants in places like Venice and Genoa could use it to go out and establish trading partners. Now, Aladrisi, a Moor, was commissioned by Roger II, who was at the time the ruler of Sicily, to produce this globe and this companion text. Now, for this sphere, this globe to be produced in 1154, proves what? that the world was round, right? That obviously the Moors knew the world was a sphere, but of course we're led to believe, you know, typically, you know, the, right, Christopher Columbus, you know, and he said, I'm going to prove that the world is not flat. 
you know, all you had to do was go and talk to some, some one of the Moors who was still living outside of Granada. He would have told you the world wasn't, wasn't flat. And I also submit Columbus knew where he was going. I don't think Columbus was lost, okay? That's something else I'll try to get into in a moment. But this surgical text, not only did it show you the, how to conduct a procedure, but it showed you what instruments to use and even how to make the instruments. So the Moors are producing medical texts which show you point by point how to make the instruments to conduct the surgery. And then these texts would be translated by people like Alfonso X and others, but he was the one who really turned it into an industry. I'm bringing all these Catholics here, I'm bringing all these Moors who are willing to teach here to Toledo to translate these texts and to write them out in hand in different vernaculars and send them throughout the kingdom. So you're talking about some serious instruction. Okay? And it's only after the Moorish presence that the medieval universities of the Western world begin to establish themselves. That's no accident. That's no accident. It's not coincidence. This is just a, and I just want to give an example, of course, I'm sure most of you have seen examples of, of Moresque architecture. Some people say Arabesque. This is from a palace in Morocco, uh, Tetuan. I'm going to change gears on you a minute. Most of us think that the legacy of African people in the Americas begins with slave ships arriving on these shores and bringing African people. That's what most people in the United States think. While it is true that there is evidence showing that many Africans were indeed captured off the coast of West Africa, places like uh, Gore Island, and brought to the West Indies, and brought to the Americas, it is also true that many Africoid peoples were already here. Now, we've had people like Ivan Van Sertima who've talked about this, and they came before Columbus, and then in his edited work, um, The African Presence in Early America. But before him, before Brother Van Sertima, there were Europeans who were saying the same thing, like Leo Weiner, or Weiner, and people like John McIntosh, who was, was writing in the middle of the 19th century, the Indians of North America, and basically pointed out, these people are related to Africans. These people are related to Ethiopians. Now, Alexander von Wuthenau, who was the German art historian, who wrote the book Unexpected Faces in Ancient America. It's basically a pictorial history and a revelation about the African presence in pre-Columbian America. And it's no accident that this information, although it was part of American folklore at one time, is increasingly denied and an emphasis is placed upon the idea of African peoples all being brought here on slave ships. Now, this particular artifact or statuette referred to as an old man with hat, and this is from Alexander von Wuthenau's book, is from the classic period which is between 300 and 900 of the Common Era. This is from Veracruz in Mexico. Now, I don't know about what you see, but that looks like a brother wearing a fez. 
It looks like Sunday morning. Now, I don't know. I'm just saying, you know, Von Wolfenau makes the same contention that when he looks at some of these, these uh, statuettes, these artifacts, he says they speak for themselves. And he talks about how a man who was at the Smithsonian named Dr. Alex Herdlika, who was in charge of the ethnography department, did everything he could to hide those statuettes, those artifacts, which showed African features, or Africoid features, and how he ensured that you would not get a job as an ethnographer, not only at the Smithsonian Institute, but at any legitimate, quote unquote, uh, ethnographical institution, anthropological institution in the country, if you challenge that. This is what von Wolfenau talks about. So there was obviously an attempt to hide this information from folks. This second one, all right now. <laughs> Brother said, it looks like Joe Frazier. This kneeling figure, now why he's kneeling, I mean, we don't know. Was he working? Was he praying? Was he meditating? Of course, I, you know, I can't get into the mind of the sculptor, the person who put that together, but it sure is interesting when you consider that with all the other information. So you've got to tie everything in together. And this kneeling figure is from the Olmec and it's from Guatemala. So we're not talking again about people tend to just you know, focus perhaps on Mexico with the old neck heads at Tres Zapotes a la Venta. But this is from Guatemala. And it actually is from 600 BCE. This early Negroid, as Van Wuthenau put it, and I, you know, I will forgive him on this because he's, he's produced so much information, assistance, but this early Negroid representation from Morelos, Mexico. Again, this is from the Archaic era. And Archaic, when they just dated as Archaic, is it some time between 2000 BCE and 100 BCE, we don't know, but it's old. And this is from, as I already said, it's from Mexico. This vessel, this vessel is from the post-classic period, which is between 900 and 1500 of the Common Era, and this is from Costa Rica. And again, we see this evidence of African peoples and the Africoid features throughout Central and South America. This is also from the Olmec era, from uh, Tres Zapotes. as is this. And this is also, this, this is from, uh, well, you can see it actually in Ivan Van Sertum as they came before Columbus, as well as in um, Von Wuthenau's text. And I like what he did in comparing the chief, the Nuba chief, with the features of this, this Olmec monument. And those things stand between seven and nine feet tall. Some, in fact, are actually larger. It's another. These are all right here in the Americas and all predate Columbus. This is in, a, in Arapaho 
Indian brother. And this, again, is something that should cause us to pause. When you read references uh, like Hernan Lopez de Castaneda, who wrote a book in the 15th century in which he referred to the peoples living in Panama as part of an Ethiopian tribe, which means that they must have looked like African people. And this was essentially what Europeans met when they arrived. When you see references to the Arawak and the Carib Indians, who are thought to be, as the Europeans used to say, Mohammedans, because of their attire and their customs. And when Columbus's own son refers to these things, it should compel you to pause and, and ask, were we already here before the Europeans arrived? When you consider the fact that when Columbus himself met what he called the king of Cuba, he began to speak or his translators began to speak immediately with these people. Now, on board the ship were people that spoke Arabic, Chaldean, and Hebrew. Now, for them to start conversing right away seems kind of peculiar, unless the languages were either one of those three or were at least Semitic as we would say. Kins who had uh, fled, right, from slavery and fought together, intermarried, etc. But I submit, when you consider the evidence, maybe those people who fled had already been there If you consider the term Indian now, and let me just, this is something again to, to help you perhaps understand how to reinterpret the term Indian when you go and do some research on your own, which I hope you'll, you'll do. At one time, the Europeans used the term Indian or Indias to refer to African people. Now, a lot of folks didn't even know that. It's like, really? Oh, yes. Absolutely. And when people in the early 19th century were reading a book called a, a Sketch of an African Indian, 1822 by Salop Wellington, and you look at the images, they even give you, you know, uh, uh, pictures. A Sketch of an African Indian. They're talking about people from Gambia. The book is about a Gambian but he's called an African Indian. Given that, what does that make us think when you go back and imagine when Europeans talked about Indians in the 16th and 17th and 18th century, how did those people look? We assume that they would have looked like the dime store, or the cigar store, or dime store Indian. You know, you have to be reddish brown in complexion with straight, black hair, aquiline nose, right? Well, that is, is a legitimate phenotype of an Indian. But when you go back and you read court cases of Indians like the Narragansetts, who lived up in, in Rhode Island, and you hear people testifying to Narragansetts, as, as long as we knew, were always very curly in uh, hair and dark complexions. You can hardly tell them from the so-called Negroes. So when people reveal something like that, they're saying, wait a minute, you might want to reconsider how, you know, what this term Indian was talking about. Right? Hmm. Okay. I'll leave that up there. And let me say a little bit about 
the significance of this information as it pertains to the organization known as the Moorish Science Temple. In 1913, a man by the name of Timothy Drew Ali, also known as Noble Drew Ali, began teaching in Newark, New Jersey, that African Americans, who were then calling themselves Negro, Black, and Colored, should more properly see themselves as Moorish Americans, should more properly consider themselves as already having been in the Americas, as well as linked to the African continent. His contention, of course, met with a lot of opposition. His people were saying, well, how can you prove? What do you mean Moors? You know, 1913, how can you prove? What do you know about any Moorish links? Well, two things that we can, can surmise from this. One is, as I tried to make clear already, this term Moorish was recognized as being a reference to, if you will, a phenotypically, meaning of physical features, a phenotypically Africoid people who primarily were known to occupy the regions of North and Northwest Africa. But the truth of the matter is, when you consider this issue of phenotype, you find people in West Africa who look like people in Central Africa and South Africa and East Africa. So we know that there's obviously a, a mixture of peoples. But why would he then say, well, you can actually identify yourself as Moorish? Well, one reason is because, as I pointed out before, evidence suggests, whether it's Abu Bakari II of Mali, an African Muslim who leads an expedition into the Americas, and at that time in the 14th century, the European world would have recognized that particular kingdom as being within the larger Moorish Empire. And if we find evidence, as people like Van Sertum and others have found, of this African Muslim presence, and if you find people like Robert Beverly II, who was one of the early historians of Virginia, writing in the early 1700s, like 1720, 1715, and this man is talking about the Indians of Virginia reminding him of the peoples of Ethiopia, Morocco, and Libya. He likens their food to being similar. William Penn likens the people that he saw in, in uh, Pennsylvania, what becomes Pennsylvania as looking like the Jewish people of London. And most of those Jewish people just happen to be Sephardic Jews. Most of those people had left and had been expelled from, guess where? More Spain. So for him to be making these connections, obviously indicates that these people must have had, I mean, phenotypically, and even talks about their culture, their mannerisms, describes their children. And like, these, these folk remind me of, of uh, the Jews back in London who basically are Moorish, Sephardim, or if you will, African Jews. So all these things are suggesting this, this presence. So for Noble Drew Ali to make that statement in 1913, it was pretty profound considering that most people didn't know about Van Sertima because he wasn't born yet. Most people didn't know about uh, Leo Wiener, even because Leo Wiener didn't write his book until the 1920s. And this was part of you know, his oral tradition. Drew Ali was telling people that this was the, the case. He referred to the Americas as Northwest Africa and Southwest Africa, at least in the official literature. Which means that while Africa is home, so is America. This, right. So when so next time somebody says, 
why don't you go back where you came from? Say, I'm, I'm where I was. Certainly more so than you, who just got here. In, in more ways than one. The second thing that's significant as to why Drew Ali was emphasizing the idea of nationality or saying that people were Moorish is because he obviously recognized that the legal history of the United States revealed that one had to be a recognized national to be seen as a person and not as a condition. And the Constitution was designed to protect persons, not conditions. So if one was calling themselves black 200 years ago, it was recognized, like the term Negro, that those terms referred to someone's condition and not to their nationality, because we know there is no Negro land or a black land. If we go back also to the 18th century and consider what did some of the more progressive institutions in the United States refer to themselves as? You had the free African society. You had the free African schools. You had the African Methodist Episcopal Church. You even had the African Baptist, first African Baptist Church. People recognized in the 18th century that it's important to identify myself as an African because African is a rec at least, it may not be specific in terms of identifying a nation, but at least is recognizing my personhood because an African is a person. A black is a condition. In fact, the laws of the time, you can go back and read court cases where um, judges said, you know, a black is not the same thing as a person of color. Now, what did they mean by that? They said a black is not the same thing as a person of color. Well, for one thing, it's the letter of the law. Think like lawyers, and I know Brother Maddox would appreciate this. Europeans are sticklers for the letter of the law. Lynn Dumanile, who was a historian who wrote a book, Harvard University Press, about the history of, of Freemasonry, talks about this Freemasonic tradition among Europeans, which emphasizes the letter of the law. You got to do it just right. You got to follow the law. There's a system, there's a pattern, it's logical. You got to, you know, nothing is by accident. And when you consider the idea of, you know, free and accepted, right? Free and accepted, when you see that, you know, was it AF? Uh, a and M. Are you free? Well, how do you know? I'm free. There's no slavery, right? Well, I don't know. That's debatable, I think, it's whether it's slavery or not. But what designates a person legally? Because keep in mind, this whole country had a tradition of denying the personhood of people, as peculiar as that sounds. But they were saying, you know, a, if you are a black, you're not a person. And why would, for example, after Europeans who were leading the, the uh, was led by Andrew Jackson, after they defeated the Seminole and African peoples, they thought it was necessary. Now listen now. They thought it was necessary to legally redefine the people as Negroes. Why? Just enslave them. What you got? Well, now we are officially known as Negroes, and I'm putting it in the register as Negro. Who cares? You're oppressing us anyway. But what's the function of legal? I got illegally now. Boom. This is what you are. Why would the Catholic Church, during the days of the Inquisition, say, you Moors who are now under our jurisdiction, you ain't Moors anymore. You're now, we'll start out small. Your moriscos, your little moors. 
And, well, let me go one better. We're breaking you in. We're making you fit within the framework of this new Catholic kingdom known as Spain. You're now mudejars, which means the broken or tamed ones. And this is official. So when you know, I put it in the register. Like I said, I got, I'm just, just calling you that. Put it in the registry. So-and-so is a morisco, mudejar. Then we go one better. You're neither of those things. Now you are negros. You are black things. You are parcel. You are parcel. Why is there a tradition in parts of the Spanish-speaking world, like in Cuba, where people historically would answer to the term of moreno and morena, which is a reference to Moors? The term Moor is in it. Your personhood, your brown. A brown sister, Morena. Brown brother, Moreno. Historically, if somebody called you a negro, they were trying to piss you off. Because it was understood that you were, they were essentially calling you a slave. And when you look at the record, why would Native American peoples fight so hard to avoid from being defined as Negroes? You know, I'm not, I'm Cherokee, I'm Choctaw. Don't link me to that name because I know that this government create has a system that's his system that says, once you label me as that, I'm a non-person. And I don't have the same rights as other folks. There's a community in South Carolina known as the Turks, also known and were first known as the Moors. The Ben and Holly family. This family, which is in Sumter County, which now, I mean, if you look at the, uh, the, uh, the, most of the Ben and Halleys, you know, these are poor folks. You know, these are people who are struggling to survive. But historically, they were once recognized, A, as being of African ancestry, being Moors, and B, being white and being citizens. That seems like a contradiction. How can you be African and white at the same time? what well, you could be 200 plus years ago. And you could even shortly after that time. Because white was understood to refer to your caste, your class. And whites were only people who were recognized nationals, right? Think about it. A white was a recognized national. Irish, English, German, Spanish, Italian. If you had a nation and you carried the accoutrements of that nation, whether it be your name, your custom, your language, that's who you were. So it was understood that these folks are white because they're linked to a nation. But black was used to refer to someone whose condition was that of servitude. So what was the brother trying to say? He was trying to say that if one identifies with these terms, they're giving Europeans a legal excuse to treat folks as outcasts, or as aliens, or as slaves in a republic which has citizens, slaves, and aliens. Now you may say, well, what difference does that make? You know, the European do what he wants to do anyway. You might be correct on that. But again, I submit if we accept the premise that there are some Europeans who are in positions of authority who are actually afraid of universal and spiritual law, because they know if they don't do something right, it's going to kick them in the, in the, the, the ass. Excuse me. Ooh, I'm sorry. I said it anyway. Right? It's going to kick them in the tuchus. We recognize, right, that if there are some who do, they got to be careful how they oppress you. All right? The Knights Templar. One of the divisions within, within the Freemasonic tradition. The Knights Templar, historically, were a group of Catholic priest knights who were responsible for having extensive contacts and making treaties with the Moors in the medieval period. That's the origin of the Knights Templar. And eventually, because their theology began to, to look more and more like Islam, Okay, they were started to look, well, you know, Jesus is a divine 
you know, agent of God. I'm not really sure because of these constant debates going on between whenever they go over to the Moors, because they were the ones that would try to make treaties. They, you know, so you had to have some type of, uh, what do they call it, a truce in the process, you know, transition going on. And secondly, because of that, they became a threat to the Catholic Church, who saw to say these people might actually take over. Okay? So what did they do? They killed the Knights Templar. They, they outlawed them. They went after them. But yet it's now recognized as a division or, or an element within the Freemasonic tradition. What I'm essentially saying is that Europeans have had cons quite a bit of contact with the African Muslim world, the Moorish world, Moorish culture. And they did adhere to many of the principles. But because, and I won't get into the, the reasons, because you've heard several, I'm sure, from you know, Cress Welsing, Dr. Cress Welsing, to just issues of, envir you know, issues of environmental uh, conditioning, they couldn't really stay right. So they looked for the loopholes. So I, wanna, I still want to oppress, but I got to do it carefully, because I know that if I don't, something may come back on me. So again, this issue of having to declare oneself properly within the, within the government, within the nation, evidently was seen by uh, Brother Prophet Noble Drew Ali as something significant, something that would be a benefit, that he evidently thought that it would help and certainly wouldn't hurt people known as colored black and Negro. Now, if we look at another issue of that era, and then I'll, I think maybe I'll stop because I, I don't want to hold people here too long. If we consider how many African nationals, including at my own institution, West Virginia University did not allow so-called Negro Americans to attend the institution, but it did allow Africans who had nationalities, who at the time were under colonialism in the 30s, but were still identifying themselves as Yoruba, Africans, from what would later become Nigeria. And so they were covered as nationals under the, under the British, right? Because the British said, you're a British what? Subject. And a subject is a person. Letter of the law. Why would Booker T. Washington, writing in Up From Slavery in the early uh, 1900s, talk about his trip to Washington, D.C., in which he saw a man who was evidently being yelled at by someone in a hotel telling me, we don't allow Negroes in here. Get out. Get out. This is not a colored hotel. And the man said, I'm, I'm Moroccan. I'm Moroccan. And he said, oh, I'm, we're sorry. Come on in. Right, regardless of what he looked like. 1786 treaty with the United States, between US and Morocco, specifically identifies Moors, specifically, and it says that those persons who are Moors are essentially to be recognized as citizens. Why? Why then, right, would you have a petition January 20th, 1790, it's in the South Carolina House of Representatives. Why would you have a peti petition in which, as it says, a group of free and sundry Moors desires to be recognized as subjects of an emperor in alliance with this government and not to be classified under the Negro Act? Now, is this an example of people running, you know, trying to deny, you're trying to deny who you are? Oh no, on the contrary, they were establishing who they were. And essentially what you have occurring is people in that situation trying to constantly reinforce the fact that they are Moors and that this treaty was established in 1786 and it'll be, it would, would be, um, renewed after 50 years, then it'd be renewed after another 50 years, and then it later became perpetual, and it's still in effect today. Now, why would they do that? They were obviously trying to eliminate any excuse for the European government, well, for this government, 
to treat them as either outcasts, alien slaves, and give them certain rights under a granted privilege, but not in accordance with the law of the land, which is the US Constitution. So the rationale, clearly for what Drew Ali was doing, was to deny the government an excuse to treat people like outcasts. And there is historical evidence indicating that it was valid, that he had a valid point. So what I'll do, I think now, is I'll stop. Uh, if I missed anything, you, I mean, excuse me, I am extremely tired anyway. And uh, both, it's been a long night, but that's right. So I'll stop. Let's give Dr. Pimento Bay a warm round of applause. <laughs> Dr. Bay, I know the hour is moving on, but I want us also to give a warm round of applause to Minister Conrad Muhammad and ask him, come up, Minister Conrad Muhammad. Let's give a warm round of applause to Minister Conrad Muhammad. I, uh, I am uh, very pleased uh, and thankful, Minister Conrad, that you exercise your wisdom and stopped by to see us this evening. I don't think that I don't think your presence was necessary in order to uh, convince anybody here uh, that what they may read or hear is not true. But I think it is very important for those who are not here and can certainly get an accurate report of what occurred, because at many times people want to exercise or use uh, their own agendas, and therefore they have no respect for either truth or facts. And uh, it is in that vein uh, that certainly uh, your presence is extremely warranted. Let me just say this on a personal note. Uh, before I turn the microphone over to you, um, Minister Conrad Muhammad and I certainly go back to his days in Philadelphia. Uh, 